the engine to the engine. Whatever you do, whether it's minimally invasive or totally invasive or something, you add injury to the injury. But again, when they teach you, you have to do span, scan, and fix, and all production and internal fixation, and this is evidence-based medicine. And I swear to you that this is non-evidence-based medicine. I'm going to speak about the methods we've been using in about more than 1,000 cases over about 11 years. What we've been using is the law of tension stress. I'm talking about the biology. One stage procedure. All the cases are one stage. We don't do stages. Why? The patients are coming from other countries. They cannot stay for such a long time. Very important. In almost all the cases, we believe in close reduction, even in neglected cases, even if they have soft tissue interposition. Because we believe that in these cases you have severe stripping of the soft tissue, and you do if you do open reduction again, you do another injury to the injury. Now we're talking about the closed reduction techniques. If you are doing XFX, this is something because I've seen many cases of XFX. They put XFX exactly like they put a cast. It's not a cast; it's something else. What's, what do you mean by closed reduction techniques? You can do closed reduction techniques during the operation, immediately after the operation, or three months after the operation, without anesthesia or analgesia. While you are sitting in the outpatient clinic, we teach the patient how to move the fragments one millimeter per day till you get anatomic reduction, not accepted reduction. And I will show you the example. And this is an example. This patient referred to us five weeks after the injury, coming with this external fixation. You see displacement, total displacement. We used the closed reduction techniques. During the operation, we used the closed reduction techniques to have intraarticular reduction. And this is the picture immediate postoperative, total displacement. Don't say this is a lousy surgeon because I'm the surgeon. Don't say anything. Okay, then I will show you how to solve the problem. We know because it's five weeks that you have soft tissue interposition and no way to get reduction without all production in the operating theater. So what are we going to do? We are going to manage this displacement. This is lateral X-ray or sagittal plane deformity. You see this fragment is posterior. This is immediately after. Then we change the frame, we push this fragment one millimeter per day anteriorly. Then we do over distraction. Why over distraction? To get rid of the soft tissue interposition. Look to the over distraction. We pushed it anteriorly. Then again, we get it back and compression, anatomic reduction. Look to the coronal plane, displacement, we change it, and we have anatomic reduction. Three weeks after the operation. So within two months, we had anatomic reduction. You see anatomic reduction and complete union in position. So this is how to do post-operative gradual reduction. This is 17 years old boy with this picture, intraarticular, extraarticular, comminuted fragments, absent bone, I don't know which classification of AO. Perhaps this is the worst one, I don't. I have a short memory. I cannot remember all these classifications. Each one has its own classification. But I do not remember which classification is this. But you've got everything that you see. And this is the soft tissue problem. Again, it's one stage treatment started with corticotomy. We isolated this infected part and we start with the application of the frame and corticotomy first. Then we go back to the soft tissue problem. This is the soft tissue problem. Gastrocnemius flap was done by the plastic surgeon at the same stage. You see, he rotated it and covered it. Then this is the post-operative X-ray. Again, severe displacement. I'm the surgeon, don't say anything. It's not referred to me. So this is immediate post-operative X-ray. Can you imagine this displacement? Why we have this displacement? 
because we wanted to make it easier for the plastic surgeon. So we intentionally displaced the fragment in such a way. So we shorten the distance and we make it easier for him to rotate the flap. And the patient came out from the operating theater with this funny picture, total displacement. Then we did gradual distraction and gradual correction of the deformity and the new deformity. You see the picture from total displacement, gradual reduction, anatomic reduction within five weeks. The picture of precious one vessel limb, which I've shown you before, one vessel limb, infection, many previous operations, adherent scar, and we have baloney amputation on the other side. One vessel, soft tissue problems. And this guy was ready for amputation in some place. Again, they did all what's needed. Plastic surgeon, vascular surgeon, orthopedic surgeon, and decision was amputation. And they came to me, we did fibular osteotomy, we resected the bone because we don't need lengthening. He has amputation on the other side, so you don't have to lengthen the patient. And we did the bridement of this part and we closed it and we corrected the deformity. See the picture, see the soft tissues. the way the patient walk. At first he was, he refused to have a prothesis on the other side before the operations, but after the operation he started to have the prosthesis. Again, union and complete union. You see the picture, complete union. After treatment. I'm not going to show you his walking quite normal. Look the age of the patient, 20 or 21 something. Again, this is grade three, open fracture, whatever, and soft tissue injury, arterial injury, common peroneal nerve injury, and according to the scores or something, this is the patient is for amputation, and we have bone and soft tissue gap. We did bifocal lengthening to overcome the gap. And this is the usual picture. If you have a long distance, and they always tell me for the plastic surgery, we have many solutions, but we have better one. Just you bandage and raise it up till you end of the transport and we'll solve a problem. You don't have to do anything because you've tried everything before. Just you raise it mechanically by putting a bandage or something. And this is the end picture. But we still have equinocavus and he was not happy. They are young. So we did osteotomy of the foot and we corrected. 13 two years old man, you know, precious limb, ununited fracture femur, knee stiffness. We did, the, we did close reduction technique. This is the immediate postoperative, total displacement as usual. Then we did the closed reduction techniques and the arthrodiastasis of the knee to get some movement and you have complete union. Blast injury, 38 year old male, you see the blast injury and he had many previous operations. The last one was external fixator or Lazarov. And they sent it to me because they said he has to do an amputation because the patient did not, uh, the, 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 the body did not accept the frame and he has severe, severe infection. So he's not suitable for frames. And we removed everything and we put the half pins that way. If you have a problem, look to the picture and corticotomy. Then gradual distraction in the upper part and lengthening from the lower part, and bifocal distraction. And this is distraction of the non-union site, of the infected non-union site. You see the distraction and lengthening. 
and side-to-side -side compression of this part gradual in the outpatient clinic and distraction of the corticotomy site. Look to the skin. The infection disappeared completely. We didn't do any debridement or something. See? And look to the compression over there. Limb length inequality is okay. And in picture, lengthening. But the patient was not satisfied because he had stiff knee. They are young and they are not satisfied in spite of this. He still needs more. This is his right. They are young people. So we thought we did quadricepsoplasty. And we had this range of motion. But he left afterwards, but I don't know if he's still satisfied or not. Nobody knows. Okay. Perhaps this is the last case, 15 years old boy, 10 months since injury. He had 10 operations, severe, look to the, had many osteoplastic operations, look to the picture, and they decided to do an amputation for him. Again, big soft tissue defect, one vessel limb, again. And they decided to do an amputation, which is right, because he had got no other options. And look to the soft tissue, failure of many osteoplastic ovation, failure of flaps, skin grafts, and severe pain track infection. So what I thought, we have a little callus, which is not important at all. We put many wires behind the callus, and we raised this fragment one millimeter per day, Look to this screw traction devices below this part. And we raised the soft tissue, one millimeter per day, transverse bone transport. And up, the, up we did longitudinal bone transport, corticotomy first technique, both at the same time. And you see this is a transverse, just lifting the soft tissues with the soft callus upwards. And these are the points. You have to push the wires yourself. You don't use drills or something because it's dangerous. You are behind, you are posteriorly. So we did distraction, gradual. Look to the soft tissue. To the soft tissue immediately after one and a half month, three months, and five months. No, no plastic surgery. We see the bone formation. Then after removal, if we have a small, soft, uh, small piece of bone down there, we usually do this technique. During removal, we put multiple wires. We, put it, we do that in congenital pseudosis tibia and Charcot ankle also. And we put a cast this way. We have an empty hole so we can remove it. We don't want the patient to go to the operating theater again. And we let the, the patient walk. Then we remove it. And this is the end picture, cast removal. You see the skin, look to the soft tissue. It's before and after. Look to the soft tissue before and after. I'm just to remind you of our international uh, Cairo deformity conference, four to six August in intercontinental city stars. If you want to learn these techniques, all techniques, please come. In conclusion, we have limited evidence. But do you have a better one? How can I have a strong evidence? I don't know. The patients, they left. They go home. They sent me x-ray pictures, and you can see nothing. So I don't have better evidence. If you have better evidence, please tell me. Think differently. Nothing is different until you think differently. Remember, the current paradigms of limb reconstruction are coming from the English literature. If you look to the papers, many publications, many classifications, small number of patients treated over longer time, maybe 10 cases treated in five centers over 30 years. So each, each surgeon has done one case every 10 years, but they have to report the results because this is evidence-based medicine. <laughs> the funny thing, the animation-based classifications and animation-based experience, it's not real experience, it's based on animation. Again, we have repeated conclusions. If you read any paper, they are coming from sham frame surgery and animation. What's some frame surgery? You just put a frame. So they do remove something and put a frame, and they call it external fixator. 
So they talk about proper choice of the patient, but uh, I didn't choose any patient. Psychiatric evaluation. There was no psychiatric evaluation. Teamwork. It's a single-handed work. Good vascularity. No good vascularity. Most of them have one vessel or not even one vessel. Regular follow-up. There was no regular follow-up at all. Hospital stay, one day surgery, advanced expensive frames and lengthening nails. We've been using used frames, used 100 times till they die. So there was nothing fancy in these cases. As I've told you, none of the guidelines written in the papers were followed. So in conclusion, we believe in one stage treatment even if it is bilateral, like this patient, bilateral bone transport, they're young with limited resources and they wanna go back. So even this patient, we did bilateral bone transport in the same patient. The real merit of the use of circal fixator as a definitive treatment is close treatment of fractures, whether operative, post-operative, during follow-up, without anesthesia or analgesia. Don't panic when you see the picture, immediate post-operative picture. Limb reconstruction in severe wall injuries, you need a paradigm shift. Think about it. Perhaps my experience, which I never had, which I wish I never had was in severe or complex problems, perhaps simple solutions will do. Thank you. One, two, one, two, one, two. Thanks very much, Gamal, for that uh, great talk and amazing cases, and I'm sure very impressive cases, and the outcomes are, are, are truly amazing. So uh, next we have, unfortunately, Professor Reggie Hamdi from Montreal, uh, who was with us, has become unwell and had to leave, uh, but we are fortunate to have um, his fellow, Yosef Manwa from Montreal, who's going to deliver his talk, so I'm really looking forward to hearing that. Thank you, Mama. Good morning, everybody. Um, unfortunately, Professor Hamdi is not able to attend today. He's unwell, as uh, previously mentioned. Um, so I'm his fellow. I'll be presenting his talk. I'll share some. I'm not the expert here, but I'll share some of his experience uh, and some of what I learned from him during the, uh, the past year. Uh, we want to thank also Dr. My co, my, my co fellow Khaled Abu Dalu. He's sitting in the back here. Dr. Mitchell Bernstein, my other uh, fellowship uh, uh, mentor and there is nothing to disclose here. So objectives, Dr. Hamdi wanted to touch base on uh, uh, some principles and advances in uh, rickets, fibrous dysplasia, and OI, uh, uh, focusing on techniques and implants. So uh, to summarize, just basically, metabolic bone disease can affect different parts of the bone. It could be the minerals, like the case of rickets, it could be the cells, that, uh, like the case of uh, fibrous dysplasia, or it could be the uh, collagen like OI. Um, most long uh, bone deformities, they have share, uh, shared features. Uh, they are systemic disorders. They, they, might, they, they may involve multiple bone segments or all bone segments sometimes. 
uh, the structure of the bone is abnormal, the bone are, is, is uh, brittle or uh, pliable, so brittle basically means they, they can break very uh, easily with low energy trauma, and pliable basically they can deform easily. The deformities in such cases, are, they are not the simple deformities we, we deal with. They're usually complex, multiplanar, multi-apical, multi-segmental, progressive, and, uh, and has a very high recurrence rate. Um, so the principles of management of these uh, problems is, bas is basically medical and surgical. These problems you cannot treat alone. Uh, you, you need uh, a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary team, including uh, uh, people from uh, uh, metabolic uh, uh, disorders, uh, uh, specialists, specialists in uh, genetics, uh, in, in medicine and pediatrics, uh, and, uh, and uh, other surgical specialists as well. The goals of treatments in such problems is to maintain, um, to correct the deformities, protect the bone, optimize function, and to improve the quality of life. So again, we're gonna touch base on uh, the three uh, uh, diseases here. Uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna start with rickets. Rickets has a very good uh, medical treatment, depends on the, on the cause. There are different types of rickets. We're not gonna go through, uh, through them today, but uh, treat, medical treatment usually works well and can, can correct deformities without surgeries. Uh, uh, surgical options depends on many factors, depends on the deformities we have, the patient age, the, uh, the uh, uh, bone itself, the diameter of the bone, the length, and many other factors. And skeletally immature, you can use uh, 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 growth modulation, can work here. Acute correction or, uh, uh, or gradual correction, you can use, usually we, we wanna protect the whole bone, so you can uh, use uh, uh, like something like intramedullary nails, which works very well. Skeletally mature patients, you can use uh, gradual correction with frames, you can use nails and other forms of treatment. So this is an example of a case, an 18 month old uh, uh, kid uh, coming uh, with bowed, le bowed leg, uh, was diagnosed with rickets, hypophosphatemic rickets, and with follow up with medical treatment without any surgical intervention, you can see the deformity is improving. Another example for a genovalgum case that was treated with a skeletally immature patient that was treated with growth modulation and uh, had uh, overcorrection and then rebound. Uh, in small kids, you can do acute correction with, uh, uh, with stabilization with cast and uh, uh, simple tools like uh, K-wires. This is an adult patient, 20-year-old uh, female with hypophosphatemic rickets Without even looking at the x-rays, I, th I think uh, you can, people who attended the course in the past few days, they can basically understand that this is a multifocal, probably multi-apical deformity uh, uh, complex that you have involving more, more than one segment. Uh, this is just a demonstration of uh, the software planning and the simulated uh, correction of the deformities. Uh, and this is one side, that's, that, that's the right leg. Uh, that was corrected with deformity correction on the femur with osteotomies and uh, nail. Small, you have to understand preoperative planning is very critical here. So this is a small diameter nail from orthopediatrics, for example. Um, and the uh, tibia deformity was corrected gradually with, uh, with a frame and uh, you see the correction and uh, this is basically the clinical picture is when the patient was brought back for, this, for the other side. You can see the leg uh, got straight and gained, gained length even. So take home message for rickets, medical treatment is important and surgical correction, you need very careful planning and understanding of the patient and your, and your implants and, and the surgical options. Virus dysplasia, Dr. Hamdi wanted to touch base on two principles, bone grafts and correction of proximal femur uh, Shifford's uh, crook deformity. So bone grafts, no, don't use them in fibrous dysplasia, that's the message you need to, to learn. Whatever kind of bone graft you use, autograft, allograft, cortical or cancellous, they will not work. They will resort with time. Uh, this is an example of a case that was treated uh, with a nail, fibrous dysplasia of the femoral shaft. And you can see that the, uh, basically the, the lesion still persists basically. Um, the, 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 uh, uh, the proximal femur deformity uh, technique that Dr. Uh, Hamdi wanted to uh, uh, basically uh, highlight is uh, is basically when you have a severe deformity with a neck shaft angle more less than 90 degrees, you can usually it's not feasible to treat in a single stage. 
with a nail. So usually you stage them. First stage, you, you correct the coxa vara, you plate, then you come back later on and uh, protect the whole bone with a nail. Uh, and just to remind you that this, this kind of conditions can be very complex and very hard to treat. This is an example of a syndromic uh, fibrous dysplasia and McCune Albright syndrome. And again, we can uh, basically, if you want to know more about the surgical management of such disease, there are good series with uh, long term uh, uh, experience. One of them is uh, basically from uh, uh, Sheffield, uh, from uh, uh, Mr. Fernandez group here. Uh, so take home message for fibrous dysplasia, stabilize the fractures and deformities with the intramedullary nail, protect the whole bone, avoid plates because of weak purchase, sorry, uh, bleeding, you should always in metabolic bone disease, bleeding is an issue, delayed healing, you should be patient with your, uh, your follow-ups, avoid bone grafts, and uh, don't forget that the, the lesions persist, and uh, eventually you need you, can, you cannot rely on bone grafts and you need metals to replace the mechanics of the bone. And in, th in this case, in fibrous dysplasia, usually medical treatment is only for symptomatic uh, control. OI, oxygenous imperfecta, we're gonna, we're gonna go through uh, some basics of uh, uh, deformity analysis and surgical implants. Uh, we have a good experience at the Shriners uh, Hospital in Canada. They, 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 are, they are actually uh, a very high referral center of uh, OI and they have a good uh, multidisciplinary team over there. So two main problems with, this, uh, pr uh, with, with these patients. There are very, very complex and severe deformities, and they are difficult to analyze. And just an example like here uh, in this case. Um, and the bone can be very thin, and sometimes you, you don't have even a canal like this. This clinical picture is basically a tibia intraoperatively, and you can't see any intramedullary canal. And these patients, you, you don't wanna, you don't wanna put a plate on them, they're gonna break. You don't wanna put an external fixator or a frame, they're gonna break uh, through the pins. So it has to be something intram intramedullary. <coughs> complex, again, reminding you of the complex deformities, multiplanar and multi-apical. Uh, so nowadays we use uh, 3D uh, imaging and 3D printing also. This helps a lot in, in understanding the, the deformity and the planning your osteotomies. So surgical treatment, again, protect the whole bone, do not plate. I'll show you an example of what you should not do. This is a patient with OI who presented with a femur fracture, was treated with a spine surgeon on call with, with uh, elastic nails and a plate, and got some healing, then broke at the tip of the plate, then was revised with a telescopic rod, uh, uh, fascia dover rod, FD rod. Again, uh, many surgical options. You, you need to understand your uh, patient. You understand your uh, implants. You should, if you want to treat these patients, you should be comfortable uh, uh, working with different implants and different uh, uh, surgical tools. Uh, understand when to use each uh, patient features like skeletally mature, skeletally immature, diameter of the bone, length of the bone. All of these are important factors you should consider when you choose your implant. <coughs> Uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna just show you some examples of the implants we usually use in OI. The FD rod uh, it comes in different sizes and different, uh, <coughs> different uh, lengths. Uh, so basically this is an example of uh, OI treated uh, with fascia dover rod and the femur and the tibia with osteotomies, deformity correction and telescopic rod. And you can see the same patient, for example, if you look at the femur, you see the, how the the components of the nail, there are two, two parts, male and female components. You can see them telescoping over each other and you can see on the left femur here, it's basically losing the, the, the part of the distally, the, the nail is losing its uh, purchase in the femur and this is a common complication you can see. And, uh, and uh, when, with follow up you can see it's basically the, the kid is overgrowing the nail of the rod and it's not telescoping and you have to revise. Another implant which is not well uh, uh, described in the literature, we're working on a publication very soon, a slim, uh, the slim nail. It's an implant that has a proximal purchase, a solid rod with a proximal purchase and there is locking option also. Comes into many, many sizes from like diameter of 2.0 until uh, 6.4 um, and many length also. So this is an example of an OI kid again with very narrow bone and the tibia. So the femur was fixed with the FD rods and the tibias were fixed with the, with the, with the slim nail, 2.0. It's like putting a toothpick basically in the bone. 
Uh, another one, uh, another OI case, non-ambulatory, was all segments were rotted with a, with a slim nail. And that's another one. They can last for five years if the patient is non-ambulatory, but if the patient is still skeletally immature and growing, these will be revised very quickly, like within a year or two maximum, because the patient will overgrow the, the, the rod and the, the will probably uh, break at the distal tip. This is another example of a patient treated with retrograde femur slim nail with some plate augmentation temporarily for uh, more rota rotatory uh, control. So to add more like biomechanical stability here for rotation. And this usually we remove them later on. Uh, another example, humerus nonunion treated with retrograde slim nail and plate augmentation for uh, rotation. And once osteotomy or fracture is healed, we remove the plate. Uh, different examples also of slim rod, uh, with, if you see that from, the, uh, from uh, the left side, it's on the tibia with, with proximal interlock. The, uh, the second picture is basically with a plate augmentation. The third picture is subtrochanteric fracture with the plate augmentation. Uh, fourth picture is basically a, a fibula, uh, painful non-union that was treated with a slim rod. And uh, then uh, the last picture is an ulna, which was treated with also a slim uh, nail. Then there is another new implant, which is the, sorry, the gap nail. This is uh, like a solid uh, nail usually used for older children. Uh, this is an example of a case with um, uh, a fracture over an FD rod uh, that was treated with a gap nail. And just take home messages for OI. Medical treatment is very critical. Bisphosphonate, you need the, your multidisciplinary team also. Preoperative pre planning is very important. Uh, in the OR, you need your ribs to be available also to, to help your nurses and your team. Avoid external fixation and plates again, they will break. Telescopic rods is very important for skeletally immature and more rigid rods for skeletally mature. Uh, and uh, you need to preserve the bone as much as possible. You don't want to ream and put a big implant or the bone will be resolved. Thank you. Excellent talk. Um, really enjoyed it, and um, we wish uh, Professor Hamdi uh, a speedy recovery. So much of what we do in limb reconstruction all started way back with uh, Ilizarov and destruction osteogenesis. Um, and in any course, however advanced we get with our techniques uh, and knowledge, we should never forget principles. Uh, and so I think to give us an update on distraction osteogenesis, we welcome Professor Alex Jakashin from Dallas, who's also a regular member of our course here and whose um, valued information and teaching we always appreciate. Alex. Thanks. Okay, so today talking about update on destruction of stogenesis. This is the basis of gradual deformity correction and lengthening. So last year, we celebrated 100 years anniversary of Professor Elizarov. And he's the one who postulated all the principles and defined the destruction of stogenesis as a biological process of newborn formation between the surfaces of two segments that are separated by incremental traction. Now, destruction of stogenesis can work as physical destruction, there is technique of destruction of epistolysis, chondrodiastasis, or as calotasis. The calotasis, this is mostly used technique. It's a gradual stretching after the osteotomy. And this is majority of techniques. But there is also destruction of epithelysis. It, it's not that popular because it's not quite predictable. Here you gradually stretch it through the growth plate. But it produces fracture through growth plate initially, and then you continue lengthening. We actually done some experimental techniques of epithelysis in the spine on the animals, and you can produce nice regenerate here. We done few of those, but in majority of cases, those actually accidental technique of destruction of epithelysis. This is example of the patient with radial club hand. This is x-rays of the deformity, quite a severe deformity, very shortened uh, radius. We done the osteotomy, applied the Hexaplot fixator, 
have to fix the wrist too, and do the destruction. And you can probably notice here that there is some difference. There is two levels of the destruction. You see the level where we previously done the astotomy, and then there is callus formation, which is accidentally happened in our case when premature consolidation appeared at the level of the astotomy, and majority of the destruction was done through the cow passes. So it's, it happens. It can help in some cases, especially with very short fragments. Unfortunately, it's less predictable. So majority of the lengthening and deformity correction technique are done through calotasis. And this technique is based on the evolutionary developed mechanism of fracture healing. When we break out the bone, we have inflammatory phase, reparative phase, and remodeling phase. Now, we can actually take reparative phase and divide it in two smaller stages. Stage of the soft callus. This is where the connective tissue forms between the two fragments. And then they remodel into the hard callus. So the idea of destruction of stogenesis, if you take the soft callus and start gradually stretching it. So applying tension at the biologically developed process of the fracture healing creates destruction of stogenesis. So key point here is a tension stress. This is the idea and this is term was introduced by Elizarov. This is gradual fraction of ligand tissues, creates stress that stimulates and maintain regeneration and active growth of those tissues. It's actually not necessarily true only to the bone. He demonstrated it can happen to some other tissues. But we'll talk about destruction of stogenesis for regenerating the bone. So this tension stress has growth stimulating effect and shape forming effect. So growth stimulating effect starts with increased <coughs> proliferation of the fibroblast. This is the first tissue which coming into the <coughs> fracture gap or osteotomy gap uh, when you start separating them. And there's also prolongation of stogenesis. So what's happened with tissues, the connective tissues, as you continue the stretching, the fibroblasts in the gap, they reorient along the axis of destruction. And you can see this on the experimental slices of the destruction region. You can see that all the connective tissue lined up in the vector of destruction. And then what happened after that, along those fibroblasts, the osteoblasts start forming, and they lie the osteoid and form the bone. So when you continue the destruction of stogenesis in the regenerative, you actually can see the three distinct areas. This is your fibrous interzone. This is your longitudinally oriented uh, uh, connective tissue and two zones of mineralization. There is a few different ways the bone get formed there. One of them, and this is what it is of course preferred way of forming the bone, so-called intramembranous ossification when those fibroblasts, and majority of them actually end up being the uh, polypotential cells, they start converting into osteoblast and form the bone directly. But when you look in the portions of the regenerate, you can see in some portions the chondroid tissues are forming. And you can see the chondroblasts there. That you that believed to be the, as a result of less vascularization, less excitation of the tissues, so it goes through the cartilaginous stage and then it forms into the bone. There was also transchondroid, interesting ossification, where actually chondrocyte turns, actually chondroblast turns into the osteoblast and form the bone. Again, we're not entirely sure about all the genetics going in this stage. But this is three phenomena when you can see here. As for us, for clinicians, what's interesting, in during the destruction regenerate, you can see all three stages there. Two parts of reparative stage, soft and callus, hard callus, and remodeling. So you can see five uh, different zones of regenerate. In the middle, this fibrous entry zone, then it mineralizes into the bone, and then it remodels into the tubular bone or whatever bone you're actually trying to form. So in the fibrous interzone, finally the bone trabecula start merging, 
that you can see here, and form continuous bony regenerate. Again, it's initially it's a woven bone, and then it remodels into the initial bone. The majority of cases when they're doing the long bones, it remodels into the tubular bone that we use for the bone lowering. What's interesting thing, and that was one of further Elizarov discoveries, that bone forms in the vector of destruction. So you can do lengthening or you can do transverse destruction. And his experiments, this is the experiments on the dock, you can see when you cut off fragment of the bone and you can pull the bone transversely, the regenerate follows and it forms the bone. Lizaro actually used it to manipulate the shape of the bone. So in majority of cases, when you do a lot of length of congenital deformities, you still can restore the length, but the shape of the bone, the muscle mass will never restore again. This bone is designed different to be different. This leg is designed to be different. The shape is different. So you can apply ten fraction to form the bone. It's not nice and soft, you know, tissue and muscular bone, but it can serve its cosmetic purposes. You can actually do it through different tissues. This is one of the example of a sacralogenesis for the patient. That was our idea on the video, how we can actually do the osteotomy and gradually separate two parts of the pelvis to form the bone, to widen the space of the pelvis, in particular, the, this patient, just to make your life easier. And this is what happened. You can see the very nicely transformed bone. There is no sacrum there, but two iliac wings are connected with newly formed regenerate. Uh, what's more interesting, what Elizarov noticed, when you do the lengthening, when you do any time of destruction osteogenesis, there is increased blood supply to the extremity. And first notice, and actually you can see on your patients, the leg, usually one of the legs where you do the lengthening, become much, much more hairy. There is more hair growth. That's one of the examples of increased blood supply. And Elizarov actually developed the technique of transverse destruction to increase in blood supply. And there was an entire department there dealing with uh, arterial problems for diabetic patients or any other result, any other conditions which result in a decreased blood supply. It become a, actually a very interesting topic, which you're gonna hear today, unfortunately in the recorded presentation, about using the transfer of destruction to increase blood supply. So overall, destruction of the unique biological process of newborn formation under influence of tension stress. And until it's interrupted by traction forces, it's the same biological process of fracture healing and incremental force makes a soft callus continue growing and producing uh, destruction regenerate. There are some conditions which need to be met to allow this process to go. First of all, you have to be very careful and preserve osteogenic tissues. So not to skeletonize the bone too much, not to pull the periosteum out. You need to have so stable, but this is important, not rigid fragment fixation. So biomechanics is important. And you need dynamic loading or dynamization. And that will be my next part to share you what's new development here. If you look at the original Lizarra frame, there is no half pins. There are a few reasons of it. There is no good you know, metal in there, and Lizarra did believe in very rigid fixation. He loved the wires, thin tension wires. And these tension wires, they don't produce cantilever bending, they arch bending, which is dynamic load in there. If you look at contemporary friends, uh, frames, and this is actually our frames, which we Love wires. I'm from Elizarov school. I have to have at least one wire in the frame, otherwise I'm not happy. But in those frames, you don't see no wires. So there is no much of dynamization as the elastic fixation. So what we have to do now, we need to do something to dynamize this frame. And this is why, you know, the buzzword now, the uh, axial dynamization is going around the world of external fixation. It's a not new idea. Actually, the first dynamized external fixation framework done by Di Bastiani, he used special elastic ring, which he put on the bar to optimize the healing because he discovered that pins are too rigid. And when the frame is too rigid, there is no need for bone to form because it's stable. So 
There is different dynamization technique actually were developed. You can do partial frame removal of pins and wires. Yeah, it's dynamizing the frame, but it requires either trip to R or some unpleasant procedures of the patient. You can partially remove or connecting rods, or you can untighten the nuts. You can do some different over lengthening technique when you lengthen a little bit more and then you compress back or do the accordion maneuvers going back and forth. They're all one way or another producing better regenerates and you can see the publication there. But we love to use specify special devices and there's a couple of new dynamization device. This is one, this is a demonstration on the specimen in the cadaver lab, how the dynamization works. So this device, this is spring loaded dynamizer, it's available commercially. So you can put it in between straight rods to dynamize the frame. So when patient walk, they produce the little dampering effect and do axial, axial dynamization. This is one of the examples of our patient. This is uh, adolescent uh, blouse patient. I will not go on the technique, very typical technique. Majority of you done those uh, saw bones workshop. So we done the osteotomy, applied uh, exaplot fixator, done the correction. And then you can see the regenerate is not forming normally. So what we did, we switched from six rods to four rods with dynamizers. And this is patient in this frame with four rods with dynamization. Very important, patient has to walk. If there is no loading, there is no dynamization. We're actually working on some new interesting ideas, how you can dynamize not working patient, but it's not topic for today, and you're not ready to present you this technique yet. But it's very important when patient walk, and when you walk, you can see very good improvement on the healing. And this is again, the restoration of the patient's alignment, like you can see now, they're both straight legs. You can do it on any external fixation frame. This is actually the hip fusion, and this is one of our ladies, and unfortunately we have to uh, go to the hip fusion. That's not a nice procedure, but in some situation there is no solution, and you can see you can use dynamization there. Unfortunately, that spring-loaded dynamizers, they're a little bit too hard. They require quite a bit of loading. No, our typical Texas size patients, they're okay. They produce enough load, but the smaller, you know, children, they require something less rigid. And this is why we developed, this is again, this is still experimental. Those flex disc dynamization models, they should be available soon, uh, but we just print them on the 3D printer. It should be available, it's commercially available sometime this year. And this is what we've done on this uh, girl with rickets. And you can see bilateral deformities. We do one leg at a time, so we finish the correction with hexaplot frame, and then we switch to dynamizers, and you can see the two level of deformity correction. Obviously, it's multi apical gain deformity. And we switch here to dynamizers. You can see that actually radial regeneration was produced very, very fast and nice. This increases the bone production tremendously. And this is here actually on the second leg. You see the first one is already corrected. And she is comfortable because we were a little bit kind of worried. So you dynamizing the frame means you destabilizing the frame action. All of those dynamizers and the idea of dynamization, you not allow any rotational or flexion deformity. It should be only axial loading. This is how the thin wire is working. So that was the idea. So, and we were kind of worried so patient will not be really willing to put the weight when you decrease some stability in the frame. But we were surprised. They actually love it. So now axial dynamization it's our method of choice for all patients. We used to wait until we see something better and then, oh, let's dynamize it. No. After we finish the correction, finish the destruction, we have the straight leg for all of our patients. Three, four, five weeks after that, we put dynamizers there. It's become default method. We have much shorter rehabilitation times right now. This is another example. This was the fibular transport into the uh, a huge defect on the tibia. Unfortunately, it was premature loading and the transported fibula broke. It's actually about 50% of complication rate of broken fibula when you transport it here. So we put the patient back in frame, done the uh, flexible rod along this long fibula. But we immediately actually, in this case, immediately put the dynamizers and you can see the frame is dynamizers right there. So the dynamization device connected with 
strut rapid adjustment. They allow to connect maybe not entirely non-parallel rings. And this is the patient with full weight bearing. Again, we were surprised, but patients feel more comfortable actually well when you put the dynamizers. And here's a little example of what's going. Can you imagine if you just put two pins, not using the wires, and load the frame, load the bone? So what's gonna happen? The fragment not gonna go vertically. It's actually start bending, right? This is what you're gonna do. You're gonna have bending, but when bending occurs, because there's two pins, there's some effect on trying the fragment slide on the pin. And this is what causes troubles for the patient. This is not nice. This is definitely not the desired technique. So when you put dynamizer, again, it doesn't happen exactly as I showed you here, it's just little uh, animation, but dynamization dampers the frame. And now when you load it, it actually avoids some or most of the pin bending. And if you look at now a typical fixation, let's say for the proximal tibia with two half pins and maybe one wire or only pins, what happens? That's exactly what happened. And this deformity of the half pins, it leads to deformity or deformed forces on the fragment. We actually done some testing. We put this out, typical configuration, two half pins in the wire in the MTS machine, and we load the frame. And this is what happened. When we put five, 50 kilogram of the load, it's about weight on our average, not typical exercise patient, but average pediatric patient. You see, at the end of fragment, we have five millimeters of anterior bending. That's a bit disturbing. When we replace those rods with rods with dynamizers, we still have this bending, but it reduces to 1.7 millimeters. So it's tremendous decrease. So those dynamizers not only stimulate loading, they actually remove the bending of the pins which you don't like. And we've done some tests with different frames. So this is the graph on horizontal part, there is a force. So the more kilograms you do, the more displacement it goes. This is when you load in the frame. And then when you unload in, you can see the curve is a little bit different because this is a sum of uh, remaining uh, deformity in the pins that goes slower. And we've done it on different frames. We actually published this results. Uh, you can read it in uh, Journal of Flame Length and Reconstruction. And this is the cycling machine. You can see how the fragment, even with the dynamizers, getting a little bit of displacement. And interesting, if you take the old wire frame, it's a beautiful axial loading. So not only you do you use the transverse, but you see that it's almost, you know, 45 degrees graph, which is more load, more bending, and when you remove the load, it's coming back again. When you take all pin, all, sorry, pin and wire constructs, when you add pins, your grid, it's uh, less displacement with more loading. You see, you don't have that nice of axial loading. When you put the dynamizers, metal dynamizers, look what happened. Initial curve is actually much more vertical, even more vertical than wires. So it means you have more displacement. And then when dynamizers goes out of all of the planks, it, this curve become parallel to the wire curve. So you continue same dynamization. It's only not dynamization, it's just destabilization of the frame. And of course, the plastic dynamizers do the same. They only, they're much easier to displace initially. So this is our idea. Again, this is the article. They, uh, so we believe in the dynamization. But there's another question right now. When do you want to dynamize? Right now, we dynamize all of our patients in frame. This is the default technique because we believe they actually heal better. But there's also new interesting concept of reverse dynamization. Remember, if we will talk about biological process of fracture healing, initially, there is no surgeons to fix the leg. So when the leg is broken, the, actually, the biology forms the callus. The callus is there to immobilize the fracture sites so the blood vessels can grow and osteoblasts can fix the fracture. So why cannot we try to reproduce the pro process? So this is called reverse dynamization. We actually done this on the goats. We created the fracture. We put static fixator for eight weeks. We put dynamic fixator, dyna dynamizers immediately for the eight weeks. And one of them, three weeks, we put actually dynamizers here. And then for five weeks, we make a rigid frame. 
And all animals were working. They were all comfortable. Even with dynamizers, they were using there. So see how goats were happy there, of course, until we killed them. So at eight weeks, we euthanized the animals. And this is the static callus. This is what Elizarov called a very nice and good one. Yeah, it's a good callus. But unfortunately, it's not that big. And we know some of the complication of fractures of regenerate. This is completely dynamic frame, gives you kind of a little bit bigger callus. But this is reverse dynamization. It's not only big, it's much better and faster remodeled. So here you can see amount of the bone forming. And obviously, reverse dynamization gives you the biggest callus. But what's most, most important when you try to break it, so you need more forces for the reverse dynamization balls. So this is all of updates I have for you. There is much more interesting things coming, and we're still working right now on the idea when and how you can do apply reverse dynamization for the destruction regenerate. But I want to finish with my favorite words from Elizaro. A doctor must learn from the nature in order to correct your mistakes. Thank you very much. And I don't think anything will, be, will do there. Actually, whenever you do next time any workshop with the external fixator, just take the saw bone and external fixator and load it, and you'll be surprised. This is why you never heard the word micro motion in my talk, because there is no micro motion. Even with the frame there, very rigid frame with the pins, you have at least three, four millimeters of loading if you load it all the way. So the only what you need to do, we damper in this with dynamization. So too much dynamization would be when you have a gap and you compress it. So for us, dynamization, one, at least dynamization, one, what two, we call straight one. dynamization, that should start when you see the callus. One. So you're not shortening, you're applying the lengthening. And I think you shouldn't do more than three, four millimeters of the excursion. So that was I was limited. The dynamizers, the metal one dynamizers, they have excursion up to three and a half, five millimeters. And the plastic ones, what we used, I don't know how will be the ones, the final product, it's uh, fixed in three millimeters. I don't believe you need to use less than two, three millimeters because this is what frame does. So as long as your dynamization technique doesn't involve any bending or rotation forces to regenerate, as long as you see some callus which you dynamize it, and as long as not more than three, four millimeters, I think it should work. Just to add on to that, that uh, if you see the, there's a lot of animal studies and some fantastic work from Dallas, from, from Veda Glatt uh, over the years. And the only clinical paper published was some years ago, which was withdrawn because, as I understand, authors didn't pay the uh, open access fee. So the paper, but it was published. And the data suggests in, the, in those study, that study that the fixator time was actually half. Uh, if you do uh, f uh, flexible or the dynamized frame early and then remove the frame, and they had a small group, it's a pilot study, and they put it in a study, so about, uh, I think, 11 or 12 weeks for the, for the dynamized group and uh, t t 22 weeks for, this, for the normal group, how we treat them. So evidence is there to do that. We have just set up a study we are undergoing uh, for the reverse dynamization, so we are randomizing between the stat standard uh, frames and the reverse dynamization. So, so this is a, is a very, very interesting concept, and the thing is, I think there is a lot of evidence, if you look at the Ken Wright's work and the, the work further from Perrin and from the AO group from Davos, there is a lot of work going on in terms of the early dynamization and to follow the fracture, how it heals, rather than how we think it heals. So I think there is a new concept coming in mechanobiology, uh, which is uh, we all are so slowly shifting towards that. So there's one question on YouTube. Yeah, question for Mawa in terms of osteogenesis imperfecta, Mawa. 
So the question on, on chat was, how young can you start operating on OI patients? How young can you start operating on OI patients? Usually for OI, you want to you wanna make sure they uh, ambulate as soon as possible. So usually if, if they're less than one year old, you try to cast them, wait until they're closer to walking age. Then you try to uh, rod them and uh, help them bracing and uh, start ambulating. Thank you. Any other questions from the floor in the meantime? So the next um, session, two, two speakers we have are going to be remote. Um, you've heard from Dr. Franz Burkholz from South Africa, who's given us some great talks so far during this meeting. And he's going to give us another uh, talk that he's recorded. Um, looking at the evolutions going on in terms of lunar construction, particularly with regard to 3D printing. And then following that, we'll have Professor Zhang from Beijing, who's going to actually look at the clinical application that they've been doing in terms of transverse tibial bone transport and the stimulation of the blood supply, uh, as um, Professor Jakash had mentioned um, very eloquently in his talk. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. If all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. These are two quotes that stand on opposing ends when it comes to new technology uh, that comes uh, into play in orthopedics, in life in general. Um, I've often heard colleagues say, uh, why would I use a new technology um, because the old thing isn't broke, we, we don't need to change it. Um, on the other hand, you also have a criticism that as soon as somebody explores a new technology, they use it for every single case. And that's sort of at the other extreme of the coin. When we're talking about 3D printing, the um, same thing applies. And as we start deploying 3D printing in limb reconstruction, um, the same is true. We could have, on the one hand, um, this concept of Maslow's hammer, where everything looks like a nail, and on the other hand, have this concept of why would I even entertain this? Because what I'm doing currently is working so well. My name is Franz Berkholz. I'm an orthopedic limb reconstruction surgeon based at the Institute of Orthopedics and Rheumatology in Stellenbosch, South Africa. And it is my great pleasure to share the next 20 minutes or so with you on my interpretation of 3D printing in limb reconstruction. We know that our limb reconstruction field has always been one with technology, with the advances of technology, but also soundly based in science and in uh, bone regeneration, biology, distraction osteogenesis, biomechanics. All of these things stand at the core of what we do as limb reconstruction surgeons. So it is important when we start looking at new technologies that come into play that they must fit that mold, they must actually fit into our biologically, biomechanically sound way of thinking about reconstructing limbs. So looking at these quotes again, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And then Colin Powell said, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, is the slogan of the complacent, the arrogant, or the scared. It's an excuse for inaction, a call to non-arms. And maybe at the end of this talk, uh, we will understand a bit more of whether this specific um, technology is something that's fixing something that ain't broke, or whether it is actually a technology that we can explore and embrace. When I prepared for this talk, I found this specific article very useful. This is from the Journal of the American Academy Global Research and Reviews, and it's a relatively recent um, review article 
on 3D printing in orthopedic surgery. So if you want to read something about this topic, this is a good place to start. Now, let's take one step back. What is 3D printing? Now, essentially, if we look at manufacturing things, there are two big ways of creating or manufacturing objects. Um, on the one hand, you can add stuff until you've created your object that is additive manufacturing. The other one is you take away stuff until you're left with your object and that is subtractive manufacturing. Now, 3D printing is an example of the first. It's an additive manufacturing concept. Maybe uh, it would be interesting to look at sculpting as an example where you could take clay and you can add clay to create a, an object or sculpture. Um, so that would be additive manufacturing. On the other hand, you could take a block of marble and you can start chiseling away at it and you are left with, uh, well, in my instance, probably another block of marble. But if you're a good sculptor, you can be left with a horse or a whatever. So in a way or in, 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 in a practical sense, those are the two ways of manufacturing things. So 3D printing, additive manufacturing, uh, the beauty of that is that it doesn't waste as much material. It is relatively rapid. It is also something that can um, be done in a very bespoke, very planned way, but we'll get into that. Types of 3D printing, essentially, again, two big groups. On the one hand, you have the uh, extrusion method where you have a something like a nozzle, like a almost like a toothpaste tube that would then extrude things in layers or substrate in layers and that would harden and that would eventually create your object. So typically that would be molten uh, plastic that would be extruded with a hot nozzle uh, layer by layer by layer, eventually adding up to creating this object. The other way would be where a substrate like a powder or a fluid is subjected to a specific form of energy. It can be light, it can be laser, it can be electron beams um, that would then center or melt or fuse those um, substrate molecules together to also create a object that would rise essentially from the substrate. So um, two very interesting ways of using 3D printing or two different ways of 3D printing objects. But in principle, the underlying uh, principle is the same. It's a layered approach of creating an object using additive manufacturing. And that can be done in different materials. It can be plastic, it can be nylon, it can be titanium, uh, a variety of materials that, that can come into play. So the process to go from concept to print uh, is actually stepwise. And the first one or the first step is actually to create a digital, digital image. And that digital image is essentially created um, either by creating something in a design program, like a CAD program, where I design something and I create a digital image of this, or I could take a patient's CT scan or MRI scan, and I could create a digital image, a three-dimensional image of the anatomy. The next step then is to refine that digital image. So in our terms, in medical terms, we would then take the CT scan data and we would take away everything that is not of interest to us. So everything that's not bone, that's not going to be printed, we need to remove from the image. And that's what refining means in this context. Then we create what is called an STL file, which is essentially a, um, a file format for 3D printing. Um, and that then goes, it's standard triangle language or something of, of that nature. And then go, that gets translated into a code that the printer can read. Uh, so basically a little recipe for the printer as to how to go about printing this object. That gets pushed to the printer and hey presto, you've got your new object, whether it be a titanium implant or whether it is a plastic model of a patient's foot. Right, benefits, we've touched on this. Some of the main benefits of 3D printing is that it is custom. You can really make what you specifically want for this instance very accurately, very specifically on a once-off basis um, with this technology. 
The second thing is the detail. You can actually create something that you would not necessarily be able to create in a standard manufacturing process. So, for example, if I've got very intricate internal um, detail that I want to create, it is sometimes extremely difficult to do that with uh, well, it's almost impossible to do that with milling, for example, because your your bits, your your milling machine, can actually not get inside the object to actually cut out little bits and pieces. So you would have to create your object in pieces and then assemble it at the end. With three D printing, you could actually print a whole gearbox uh, inside to, and it would actually work because the resolution is of such a nature that you can do that. So, so that is sort of the, the second benefit of 3D printing. And one of the third benefit th fits or the third benefit is, is really cost. And, um, you know, that cost is quantified in terms of dollars, money, or in terms of time. And um, it is actually quite a lot cheaper to create a custom implant on a once-off basis using 3D printing technology than it is to create molds or a, or, or a milling machine to actually make it. Uh, so in, in, in that sense, you're saving, saving money, but also time. Now, time is relative, as we all know, and Einstein has told us, um, in the sense that it takes quite long to actually physically print the model. It can take 14 hours or 16 hours to, to physically print the model. But where you save time is actually in the creation of the whole process, where from start to finish, your time spent to create a new custom print is not as much as it would have been if you had to build molds or if you had to program a CNC machine, for example. So that is where the cost benefit comes in. If we take a step back and we look at potential applications for 3D printing technology in orthopedics in general, um, they are divided into a number of things. The first one, which I find very interesting, is anatomic models. And these are basically where we create a 3D printed anatomic model of a patient's specific anatomy uh, for a specific purpose. And generally, there are two reasons why we do this. The first one is for education purposes or for information purposes, where we create a model that basically represents the patient's anatomy so that we can understand it better. Um, and the second one is for surgical rehearsal, where we basically create a model so that we can operate on that model, plan a surgery in detail, and execute that plan in a safe environment. In other words, there's a low-risk environment. Once we've demonstrated that we can do that surgery in this way accurately and safely, we can then go to the next step and do it on the patient themselves. So anatomic models created for two reasons, educational purposes or information purposes, something that's also called haptic maps, where we use our fingers and our touch to understand the anatomy better. And then secondly, surgical rehearsal, where we deploy that intraoperatively. Prosthetics and orthotics, really a field that's exploding in 3D printing, where 3D printed fingers and upper limb um, prosthetics are really uh, becoming very commonplace and people are building their own little um, prostheses for different um, reasons. Um, difficult to control, difficult to regulate, but that's definitely exploding. On the other hand, orthotics, um, splints, 3D printed splints, custom casts that you can swim with, things like this, but also uh, custom um, insoles, so uh, 3D printed custom uh, insoles for, for foot and ankle purposes are really becoming the almost the gold standard in terms of orthotics. If we look at orthopedic implants, we've got the non-custom implants, so these are implants that are created um, for our inventory, so think of acetabular cups as an example, and you might use 3D printing to create a very specific surface texture that you cannot create in another way uh, for the purpose of bony ingrowth. But it's not an implant that is made custom per patient. It is an implant that's made as part of a uh, uh, inventory and the um, 3D printing technology is just used to manufacture a very accurate scaffold, if you will, or a very accurate structure on your implant. So uh, some of the golf clubs use this technology um, to, to, to manufacture them more accurately. 
Right, the patient specific instrumentation, really, I think the one that's being pushed down our throat the most is this one, where from a marketing perspective, the companies are really pushing this very hard and where we are creating 3D printed, um, well, 3D planning and then 3D printed cutting blocks and um, jigs and guides to actually execute a surgery very accurately. Now, interestingly, although this is the one that's the pushed hardest from a market perspective, it is the one that doesn't seem to have the, the most um, um, proof in, 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 in data, in, in science, in papers. So it doesn't look like actually from our research data that this actually translates into a patient benefit. Now, it might just be that the studies are underpowered, but um, probably something to just bear in mind that this is not necessarily advantageous over the classic way of doing this. Now, of course, once we get into very complex three-dimensional deformities in the limb reconstruction sphere, it might become interesting to actually create specific cutting blocks, specific jigs to actually correct these. I'm thinking Blount's deformities, I'm thinking proximal femoral derotation, osteotomies, and so forth. So that could be a very interesting application for this technology. I think a place where we can definitely see a massive explosion is patient-specific custom implants, where we're using patient-specific anatomy to create an implant for that specific patient in that specific context. And that really is a powerful technique, and I'll show you some examples of that. Bioprinting is where we are using 3D printing technology to print cells, scaffolds, tissues, and eventually replacing organs or pieces of organs with bioprinted um, spare parts, if you will. Um, interesting in our field will be if we can start printing bone and cartilage. And there's definitely a lot of research in those avenues. Um, one of the challenges is how to keep the cells alive while we're printing with all the shear forces that get exerted during the printing process, for example. Uh, but a lot of problems that need to be solved before this can be um, implemented, but really an interesting space to watch. Uh, 4D printing, interesting concept where you 3D print your structure and then you change the environmental um, um, parameters like temperature, and that means that the structure becomes soft. You can put it into a space and then in that local temperature and surroundings, it actually reforms back into the 3D printed scaffold or 3D printed shape. So a very interesting concept of how to create something and then deform it to implant it, and then it sort of goes back to its original, original shape. And that's what's known as 4D printing. All right, enough of the theory. Let's get into some practical examples. Um, to use cases where I think uh, 3D printing currently in 2022 are really valuable in limb reconstruction surgery. The one is the creation of anatomic models, especially haptic maps and surgical rehearsal. And the other one is custom implants. And the ones that I use are custom um, created tailor body implant and titanium truss cages. And I'll show you some examples. A haptic map is really simply just a three-dimensional anatomical model that represents the patient's anatomy so that I can understand that anatomy better by touching it, by walking around it, by really getting to grips with what I'm looking at. Of course, an experienced surgeon can do that off x-rays. They can do that off a, a 3D virtual image like this one you see in front of you. But for some of us mere mortals, we actually need something a little bit more tangible. And this is what my desk looked like today, incidentally. Um, this is an example of a haptic map of an adult patient with a clubfoot deformity. And you can see as we start zooming in, um, you can start appreciating certain aspects of the anatomy. Look at that severely plantar flexed first ray. Look at the relationship between the tailor head and the navicular. Look at the position of the calcaneus and the cuboid. Look at the subtalar joint. And once we come around the other side, you will see 
the ankle joint end on. And suddenly you can start understanding the three-dimensional shape of the specific deformity. And you can maybe start thinking of how you would want to address this. Um, incidentally, the other material you see on the print is just support material that's used uh, when you laying down your layers. Of course, you can't do a layer in the air because it will just drop down onto the onto the bed of the printer. So you have to have a support structure underneath. And in this instance, we printed that in a water soluble um, plastic so that I could apply a frame as it is now, and then I can dip it in water and the soluble plastic part would disappear. Surgical rehearsal, here's an example of a severe cavus foot in a young individual, which I wanted to do a mitre frame for. I'm not very good at planning them so that they don't abut. So I then did a 3D print. And before I took the patient into the OR, I actually operated his foot, his anatomy, with a mitre frame, making sure to do. And then I went and deployed that plan intraoperatively um, to try and solve this patient's problem. So we can see in this case, the osteotomy, we can see the frame that's applied and then the process of gradual correction of the deformity and eventually leading to a um, tailor navicular fusion and a plantar grade foot. It's not a great foot, still has a high calcaneal pitch. Um, Mary's angle is sort of restored. Ankle is not very happy. Um, I don't think we've changed the outcome of this case with 3D printing, but we've certainly changed the process. And we certainly changed the experience in the operating room by knowing what we're getting ourselves in for. And I think that's the benefit of, of, of surgical rehearsal. Think of it in terms of pilots doing uh, simulator training prior to being uh, in the real cockpit. So you wanna take your risks in a, in a sort of a low risk environment rather than doing it where there's real consequences on real patients. Right, the other application of 3D printing is by creation of custom implants. Here's a classic example of an avascular necrosis of the talus that was then um, causing pain. We went ahead and scanned the patient's opposite talus, flipped the image around, modified it slightly by dropping the vertical height by 5% so that it could fit in, and then 3D printed a talus that was in titanium with an oxide coating. And we could then implant that through an anterior approach after removal of the existing talus. And if that doesn't excite you, I don't know what will. Um, as an orthopedic surgeon, that should be extremely exciting to you. Um, that's an, the approach we use so that we can always come back and revise that uh, if we needed to. But talus pops in nicely. It sits there snugly into its little bed. That hole is for a, a little joystick that we screw into the talus just to help lever it into place. And that's it after implantation. From there, salvage options would be to pop a replacement at the top or to add pegs and trabecular metal to the bottom so that you can do a subtalar fusion. But at this stage, patient is happy, pain-free, moving, foot and ankle scores have improved greatly. A second example of custom implants is the creation of titanium truss cages, which are used to reconstruct large bone defects or complex bone defects. And really what we're creating is a, a titanium Eiffel Tower, for lack of a better term, that can withstand the forces quite accurately. It's roughened so that it adds the ability for bone to grow onto and into that structure. The structure will get filled with bone graft prior to implantation. Um, but there's the example. So uh, really bad periarticular bone loss, uh, modeling that defect, 3D printing that specific truss cage for the specific patient that gets filled with bone graft from a rear reaming and then gets implanted into the defect and secured in place using in this instance a hind foot nail from the bottom in a very elegant way to eliminate a very large bone defect which would otherwise need prolonged segmental bone transport procedures this is one of the follow-up visits, of course, not, not um, consolidating yet, but we're waiting with bated breath to see consolidation in this instance. Of course, the truss cage is extremely strong. 
can withstand up to two tons of force. So the question is, if it doesn't consolidate or in, incorporate, whether that would be such a bad thing. Um, and, you know, the data is being collected at the moment, so we'll know these answers soon enough. Here's another example that's currently in hospital, currently um, occupying my mind. It's a previous gunshot injury. Uh, multiple operations ended with that horrible piece of little fluffy bone there in the middle, uh, a regenerate that didn't really form, um, and that was grafted with all kinds of artificial bone substitutes. So really soft and iffy, cloudy, rubbishy little piece of bone there, which we opted to excise and then convert this whole construct into a lengthening nail. So we have the titanium cage in there that is fixed to the bone with little extension plates on either side to hold it together so that we can distract through that area through the osteotomy at the top because of course our lengthening nail is attached there and there and if our cage was not secured it would actually just dislocate. So this case I will hopefully be able to show you the outcome of um, next year at the whole meeting, but an interesting concept of employing different limb reconstruction techniques to try and solve a very complex, complex problem. So, is this the solution to limb reconstruction surgery? We will need to find out where this technology fits into our armamentarium as limb reconstruction surgeons, whether it's just a gimmick or whether it's actually a, a real-time solution that will change our patients' lives is yet to be seen and it's up to us to actually do that and explore that and see where this technology fits into our uh, field of orthopedics. With that, I thank you. While we setting up the next talk from Professor Zhang in Beijing, any questions? So the next talk is going to be on transverse tibial distraction. Uh, very impressive um, talk he gives, and impressive cases that he uh, uses. Good morning. Dear Professor Sharma, dear Professor Kuwait, thank you for your invitation. But I couldn't come to here to meet each other in person, so convey my best, my great apologies and convey my best wishes for you and all the friends. Thank you for giving me the topic for the uh, diabetic foot. So as you know, we have some new method for treatment of uh, uh, so difficult case. The name is tibia transverse bone transport. So I'm Dr. Zhang from Beijing, China, and I worked with Professor Qin, Sihe Qin. He is the president of Asami China. As you know, we have a lot of uh, collaborations with a lot of countries in the world. So we have the road and bite uh, international meeting and uh, some other religion and the global meeting also uh, in, we very enjoy the, a lot of uh, our friends globally. So for the trend uh, in liberal reconstruction in China, we just uh, published uh, a new paper uh, in the International Orthopedics. The name is the Journal of Technology in China and combine the work and uh, the book the lower limb uh, deformities published uh, with the Springer. So called a lot of uh, trends for the uh, limb reconstruction. So as you know, some uh, complex deformities, we usually uh, can see uh, in China, we, we're using the Elidanov uh, technique and the combined the, some other method, we can have uh, good alignment and good ability for walking and other severe deformities of uh, foot and uh, ankle I can so we also have some uh, innovative devices and apparatus for deformity correction and the labor lengthening is easily and some uh, hybrid and uh, uh, simple devices so 
for the foot and ankle uh, deformity with ulcers may be difficult for treatment, we can uh, have good result using the one-stage treatment. That means deformity correction simultaneously uh, for the uh, ulcer region. So this published in the GOT. And today, maybe we would like to uh, see the ischemic disease, so especially for the diabetic foot. Yes, very severe one. Yeah, see, here is my outline. Outline uh, including some introduction of diabetic foot with our method TTT, was TTT, possible mechanism, and some indication, complication, and some update. So as you know, diabetic foot, uh, the including uh, very, uh, very common things, DM is the leading cause of chronic disease affecting millions of people globally. Uh, diabetic food also with an annual uh, worldwide incidence of 6.3%. Uh, so foot uh, infections are 10 times more likely to be hospitalized than non-diabetic individuals. So diabetic patients take account 60% among non-traumatic lower limb amputations. So what's the pathology? So anybody can know that it's neuropathy and some uh, atherosclerosis lead to the ischemia of the feet. So the metabolism and the biomechanics so is well known. So as you know, some uh, clinical uh, characteristic is very easy to diagnose. So what's the treatment guideline as uh, the announced uh, in the, the Lancet, we have a lot of methods for treatment, so including the antibiotic, wood dressing, and total contact, contact and some uh, hyperbiotic oxygen, and some negative prior wood therapy, a lot of methods. So, and uh, finally, maybe some patients suffering the amputation is terrible, like a ghost. So, how about us? What's the method today we discussed? So, that means the TTT. What's the TTT later? I think you can know. So, firstly, I would like to show some case. So, you can see here is a 46 years male. He file history of DM. So, you can see here very severe exterior uh, the foot, on the foot and the combined uh, severe pain. So we're using the, yeah, this mindset. Police, second day post-operation. And you can see here, two weeks later. Here is better and better. Finally, not finally, it's just uh, two months uh, post-operatively. The wood healed, wood healed and no pain. So it's good result. How about others? So you can see here, that's a small oscillation here is a five, eight years male with the eight years history of DM. So you can see here, it's count huge, very well with other method. With here, all TTT method is better and finally huge. So here is some case. Then I would like to introduce what's the TTT. Here we must see Many thanks to Professor Ili Jalof. He gave me, gave us some uh, in very intelligent. So as you know, we can uh, got a lot of blood inflow flow uh, with the longitude distraction, also with the transverse distraction. Here you can see here. It's a very uh, beautiful image from the Ili Jalof Center. Here in China, in 2001, uh, Professor Qilong uh, published his first paper for the DO uh, in the peripheral vascular disease using the transverse bone transport from tibia bone yeah, to enhance the blood supply for the lower limb. So 
good result. Here you can see this first paper in China. And uh, 2009, Professor Qin held another case. I was also uh, suffered from the vascular injury here. Here is a small bone part uh, distraction. With the distraction, we can see the huge uh, of the, from the tors is blood supply actively. So good result also. Mm. We can go to the deformity correction and the salvage of the limb. So it's good result. What's the method? Here is the uh, simple uh, map. Maybe show what's the technique. So here, topic uh, cortical of the tibia medial side. So you can see here, cortical bone, yeah, outside, outside of the bone, and then distraction, distraction gradually, and bike, bikeward to the original place. Here is like a, a coding technique. So here also we call the bone transport. The techniques is simple, uh, not uh, complex. So we can perform in the surgery uh, on the medial side of the tibia. So it's original work. So you can see the X3, this uh, bone, cortex bone, yeah, uh, was uh, uh, distracted out. And then we can put to down, put down to the original site. We just uh, talked what's the TTT and what's the possible mechanism why it can uh, lead to some good result for the so is ischemic so severe disease. We must uh, to look. Uh, so as you know, we can got a lot of uh, blood supply occurred uh, during the longitude distraction, even the transverse distraction here, very uh, huge. So from this uh, uh, cases from uh, Hua Professor Hua. In Guangxi province, you can see here, it's a pre, uh, pre and uh, post uh, compile. You can see here the blood supply. So here, pre and post. And uh, yeah, this, uh, so the patient is uh, uh, after debridement, you can see here, very severe, how to do. Amputation, before the amputation, we can uh, select this method. Here, using the TTT, three months later. It's huge. Good result. So suddenly we also use a grill free. So you can see here the blood supply occurred. Here is pre and here is post operation three months. So very huge. Uh, and uh, how about the bilateral side uh, diabetic food? We performing the surgery bilateral side? No. Here is severe, more severe. We just uh, performed the surgery, the right side, right side. So suddenly we found, yeah, the left side also can be seen the recovery. Yeah, what's happened? Yeah, from the mechanism of the DO and the DH, we found some factors, some uh, uh, BMPs occurred during the distraction uh, processing. Yes, here is the mechanical effect of uh, uh, technique of application in diabetic food. Similarly, based on some experimental research, the escaping condition of the affected feet was improved effectively. The healing ability of the wood is improved obviously by the systematic regulation function. Also, uh, some uh, very important things to discuss in the future, maybe. So for the indication and the application and the some uh, updates, because in uh, 2019, uh, in the May, uh, in Beijing, we uh, established the society, Chinese society, for the diabetic food and Ilijalov. So here is the members of the uh, these uh, societies. Here is Professor Qin, Professor Zhang, Professor Hua, and Professor Qilong. Here, here is me. So we have a group 
we can performing a lot of uh, surgeries for the many many patients, and we also can have the collaboration for the research. So here we found some uh, severe cases of diabetic food also have some good results. So you can see here is very acute inflammation here on foot. Three years of follow-up is good result. Here another another case, very severe foot. So you must see amputation please. Amputation is better. No need to treat. But in China, in some patients don't want to amputate. So maybe we can we can perform some uh, salvage for the limb. So you can see here, we're performing the uh, surgery, TTT. So good result. So for other severe cases uh, published in the paper, you can uh, find in the journal of uh, Chinese Journal and some uh, other journal in the CORR and, uh, and so on. So some aged people is okay for the uh, treatment. Yeah, here here is the people twenty. Uh, sorry, is eighty years with uh, uh, cardiac cardiac failure, very uh, serious one. How to do amputation? Yeah, for the life, we we should to do the, some uh, uh, some work. And here with the technique of TTT. The foot situation is better. It's good result in 12 weeks later. So how to do? Yeah, you must see what's the complications. So we, we also found some, uh, uh, some very few uh, complications, fractures like this here. Yeah, fractures here and some uh, skin necrosis here. Yeah, so this uh, improved for us to do modification. Here also we found few cases must be amputated. Yeah, absolutely. How about the update? Yes, it's multi-center analysis. We found the amputations rate is three, one, 3.3. .3. Here is uh, 6.2. Here is 0. Its effective rate is maybe more than 95. Yeah, mo 90, 90s. More than 90%, I think. Here is 100%. Here is uh, uh, some uh, new classification for the diabetic food because the uh, application of TTT, we uh, think the traditional classification of Wagner and others may be not good for the uh, tap. There's so many experience for the patient management. The technique for TTT improved uh, day and day. So you can see here, big Big insertion can change to the mini invasive, yeah, small insertion. Here and a small insertion. Here, Professor Gang Li also modified the uh, procedure with some uh, uh, guide. Very easy to performing this surgery. So also some uh, instrument improvement. So here is a uh, uh, distal distal of tibia also have small window at proximal tibia, also can achieve good result. For the indications, you must to ask me. Firstly, the doctor and the no popliteal obliteration, even the condition is severe, also you can do that, no problem. CTA is a method, but not the gold standard. No relationship with Wagner classification. Blue top syndrome is contraindication. Advanced age, dry gingage, and zero pain is contraindication. Uremia combined, don't worry, is 
contraindication. And blood sugar, you must ask, how can we control the blood sugar level? Less than eight millimole before meal is not the contraindication. So this uh, guideline uh, by the society published in the Journal of Orthopedic Translation, 2020 and 20. So overview, we just see many cases of diabetic food managed with the TTT. We just showed what's the TTT, what's the mechanism, what's the indication, complication, and what's the update. So conclusion, Yidijalov technique, transfers transport technique, substantially facilitating healing and live salvage and decreased the recurrency of the severe diabetic food ulcers. This surgical method is simple and many invasive. The complication is few and minor. The rate of amputation of DM can be reduced significantly. So by the way, I would like to deliver another invitation letter for you, for all the friends. Because the pandemic of COVID-19, the sixth SME and ILAS BR meeting initially uh, will be held in Beijing 2023. We postponed to 2024. What a joy is to uh, have a friend coming afar. Welcome all the friends coming to China, come to Beijing. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Any, any questions regarding that technique? I think it's very interesting. I think classification is very interesting. Results are amazing. And I think it's certainly something we're going to see increasingly creeping into diabetic foot practice management for those of you who, who do that. So now we have um, uh, 20 minutes for you to get a quick bit of refreshment, cup of tea, cup of coffee. Please be back here for 10.30 to start the next session.
Shall I put it in there? Yeah, um, let me tell you. It's your tie, if that's all right. That's no, okay. Okay. Is it working now? Yeah. Yep. Uh, lights, is it going to dim or? Yeah. Uh, there's your clicker. And the laser pointer is. Yeah, and probably I hate that. I always yeah, go forwards two, three times. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Can the lights go down a little bit? Uh, you can. Oh, yeah. I can start. No. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. I'm on TV. Becoming famous on YouTube. <laughs> so we're going to recommence the next session, um, and to start the next session, we have. Um, James Fernandez from Sheffield, who has very large experience not only himself, but in Sheffield itself with limerick construction over many years, starting way back with Mike Sarley. Um, and James is going to talk to us about a topic that still, that still um, vexes us, and that we still need this particular technique, complex technique, of using the pelvic support osteotomy. Okay. Thank you, Gavin. <clears throat> For all of you who do pediatrics, I'm sure in some of you in your adult practice will see hips which, uh, which cannot be salvaged quite well. So the younger they are, probably you may have to give them a choice of different options. And I'm going to talk on my own practice and sort of when we started it 20, 21 years ago, and then a little bit of its evolution. So my indication is mainly, this is a clinical classification for painless unstable hip with LLD, a painful unstable hip with LLD, or a painful or painless stiff hip with LLD, poor posture and gait. So I'll show you quickly some examples. They all varied at all etiologies. For those who come from lemic countries, this is uh, infection when you are an infant where the whole femoral head disappears and it is named as Tom Smith arthritis of infancy. So this one usually is a painless, unstable hypermobile hip and a good one for actually a pelvic support osteotomy. This is uh, a multiply operated DDH, which has failed, and the hip is migrated very high, and is uh, unstable, also painful. We get sometimes in the teenage uh, age group, atypical avian, I don't like to call it as Perthes disease because they don't follow any of the stages, and they have severe condolysis and stiffness. And this is another one where, usually after intervention, post-Sufi avian, condolysis and pseudoarthrosis. In this example, it's a painful stiff hip with pseudomobility at the non-union site at the physis and poor gait. So the problems, therefore, are pain, unstable Trendelenburg gait, uncanely stiff hip gait, all depends on what the uh, hip is. True and apparent LLD, difficulty in doing certain activities, aesthetic or cosmetic concerns, and long-term sequelae because of this problem. If you go through literature, there are a variety of uh, reconstructive procedures from uh, uh, arthrodesis, which I rarely do now, and I think uh, Alex had mentioned that earlier. Uh, there are so many other arthroplasties, as you can see, and finally, totally arthroplasty. And I've put the three together, pelvic support osteotomy, which then was modified to the Elizar of hip reconstruction, and we published a further paper about the pelvic support hip reconstruction with internal devices. There's good literature to say if you do a hip arthrodesis by age 35, 60% of them have disabling back and ipsilateral knee pain. Colonna arthroplasty, possibly unpredictable, but more recently, Gans has done some work on it. He's modified on it. He doesn't have a long-term uh, results as yet. Uh, as per Choi from Korea, trochanic arthroplasties are generally not successful. I've seen them done elsewhere, very poorly, sort of poor result. Hip replacement arthroplasty, as you all know, has have its own problems. 
It's very interesting to look at the history of this technique. As long as 1917, uh, Lawrence subsequently won Bayer, and probably Chance is the one who possibly uh, uh, chose the correct site. Ostratium at the Ischium and Milch in 1947 popularized the concept. And even he said at that time, Valgus with caution. And Haas 1951 outlined the history and recommended this distal osteotomy. The classic Milch bachelor procedure, most of you may have done in the Limic countries, is where you resect the femoral head and do an angulation osteotomies. It's a very good procedure also in poliomyelitis. I was trained with polio back home uh, many years ago. So what did Ilizarov do? He modified it. He added a second distal osteotomy for varization and lengthening. He added extension to valgus for the simple reason when you walk in stance, the leg has to lock or the hip has to lock. Otherwise, you buckle. So if you don't give that extension, your gait will again look ungainly. So it also addressed length axis and reduced the fixed pelvic obliquity and knee valgus. Like everything else in uh, orthopedics, you have to establish the cause, you have to establish where the pain comes. Is it from fatigue from the biomechanical point of view or is it arthritic, intraarticular? The physical signs, of course, Trendelenburg, uh, if there is free AD duction, you have to reveal contractures and so on, block test. We have done a few uh, gait analysis, could not publish it. Uh, it does reduce stance time, asymmetry, and decrease GRF. So the biomechanical principles is to produce a proximal valgus which lateralizes and distalizes the trochanter, thereby improving the lever arm and biomechanics. It tenses the slack abductus, creates a new medial fulcrum, and medializes, medialization reduces the abductor forces needed to balance the weight in single leg stance. Extension locks the pelvis in stance and therefore again maintains the abductor mechanics. And the length equalization prevents further pelvic drop because many of them when you have LLD will have a combination of Trendlenburg and a short limb gait. Planning is based on a variety of things apart from your clinical examination. You do standing mechanical axis blocks with including pelvis. But the most important, if there is free adduction, we always do a single leg stance x-ray as you can see and you can calculate the adduction angle there and then see how much of it has to be corrected and add the valgus. The osteotomy level is spread from the maximum adduction view at the site of the ischium. The extension osteotomy, generally where they are hypermobile, I add about 20 degrees, but if they have an FFD, I would have released everything or re resected the head and then you decide. At all times when you do this, you have to keep the limb more in internal rotation because irrespective, they tend to externally rotate. Over the years, surgical technique has changed. Initially, pure Ilizarov construct. Subsequently, the deck support came. It became a bit easier. So proximal Ilizarov distal hex support. You can do single or two stage. I moved from single stage to two stage. That is resection, ang uh, angulation first, followed by lengthening subsequently, especially when we started the internal fixation devices. And of course, the hardware quite a bit changed, cannulated, non-cannulated pins, HA coated, uh, accurately placing the pin insertion sites. And generally, even after you do this, you, you may need two lengthenings. For those of you who want to read more on the accurate indications and preoperative planning, uh, Durai Nayagam has published this nicely, very pictorial, in Strategies uh, in 2008. Just to show you an uh, example in theater where you assess the contractures. This was a child with, uh, you can see there, severe uh, avascular necrosis of the femoral head, almost stiff, uh, came from elsewhere. We resected the femoral head. And then you uh, originally I should do both stages together. I'll tell you why later we stage them a little bit. So you can see the first uh, pin in maximum adduction. And if you draw a line, uh, right angles to the long axis, and you add a little bit of valgus. So original description by Draw Paley, he said 15 degrees. But I've moved away from that. I'll tell you why subsequently. And then we use the Russian uh, Ilizar arches or the Italian arches. And then once you have done the first pin, you, you mount the other pins to your first arch, you straighten the leg, and then your next pins are going to be orthogonal to your, uh, to your femur. So you can see this here. Uh, as you can see, this is the drill bit. The osteotomy is at the level of the ischium. 
In maximum adduction there we have done the proximal construct and the middle construct and then you gradually, in theatre sort of, slowly you acutely uh, do the osteotomy, valgarize, and then you connect all of it as you have seen here uh, with rods and if you have to put hinges here and there possibly you may have to use that. And then we do the distal construct. So as you can see this is a hexapod here with a distal construct, this is for the distal osteotomy. I don't do the distal osteotomy anymore, distal, because in future if they want a total knee replacement then it becomes difficult for that surgeon, so I try to do a mid diaphyseal osteotomy. And as you can see, this is how it looked like, and the most important picture you can see is the extension which you can see in this lateral view. They need a lot of rehab, as this girl put in a lot of effort, she did uh, quite well, I think she's something like a, uh, works in a swimming pool as one of those swimming uh, instructors or guards. And there she is. Yeah, another few examples for you. I make them walk straight away, full weight bearing. So treatment protocol is painful, stiff hip with LLD, the classic milch bachelor procedure where you resect the femoral head with a modified PSO, a proximal valgus extension osteotomy akin to the original shans or has with femoral lengthening. When it is painful and mobile, the same plus or minus femoral head resection and the painless unstable hip with LLD is the modified pelvic support. This is an example of a boy who actually had Tom Smith arthritis of infancy. His gait was so severe that I had to do, is the first one why I did him a little bit younger with fully consenting that we may have to revise him later on. As you can see, a strongly positive Trendlenburg. You can see the single leg stance. You draw your lines, you can calculate that angle. And then you do, this was the original construct uh, with classic Elizabeth. He also had infection and shortening of the opposite leg. So I was young that time, so I put, uh, I could do more, more, more time spending putting frames on. I don't do that anymore. But anyway, so he went on to have uh, that same standing finally uh, and lying down. And uh, I had to revise him later on. At the other side, we have to derotate him because of his uh, infective abnormalities. That was his final axis view. And then at follow-up, you can see the pre-op Trendlenburg and the pelvis at post-op. And interestingly, one day he came and said, I have pain in my hip. I said, what were you doing? He said he was doing long jump at school. So you don't necessarily have to have a, a femoral head, I would think. And more recently, he's come and shown me his first child. Okay, so this is another example, multiply operator DDH. He is some assistant manager with a football team doing quite well. He invited me for his wedding as well. And so variety of examples, I'm not going to go through all of them. This one, as you can see, if you distill varization, if you distill one of my original ones, you will reveal a Trendlenburg again. So distal varization, you have to be careful how much you're going to do it because it will reveal or take away your AB duction and give back AD duction. That's the same patient with condolysis. So this one, finally, they, if you do, when you do it younger, they remodel. So you will have to revise, and usually revise with plates. One of the complications I had was heterotopic ossification, referred actually from Wrightington, multiply operated elsewhere, and they decided not to do a total hip. Uh, I did this and later realized uh, developed HO. Since then, I actually started to do sec two stages, do the first part, give them indomethacin for two weeks, and then later on at six weeks, do the second part of the operation. So it's evolution, uh, as you see complications. I routinely used to cast sprays after removal of the frames. So some practical tips, two-stage procedure for resection angulation. Be, be beware of the distal varization, reveals adduction, and therefore produces a pelvic drop. I usually ask the patient to jut the end of distraction rather than looking at the mechanical axis view. Patients need to be very well prepared. I always send them for a second opinion before I do a pelvic support osteotomy to an adult arthroplasty surgeon. So, and I document that letter inside. And younger children, of course, need revision. Lots of literature, I'm not going to go through all of it. Uh, Mehmet Kokoglu from uh, Turkey. All these series were neglected DDH, whereas CHOI, which is the best group, a uh, big cohort, post-infective etiology, and he said that the IHR was better than trochanteric arthroplasty. And there are many more. Inan from Istanbul also published uh, with using a monolateral. He still had five out of 11 at positive Tendlenburg sign. 
And of course, Rosebrook with Dropilly published the first eight patients with post-infective sequelae. Actually, if you see Professor Hosni had published uh, uh, originally in, in the Egyptian Journal of Orthopedics, more recently is published in the Elizabeth Journal, 136 cases, reasonably successful results, 21 year follow up with no conversion to arthroplasty uh, until then. Though I think later is another published a case report where I think he had converted one, I think, if I'm not mistaken. So with the Sheffield SV grades, we have roughly similar results and some of them will have uh, persistent Tendenberg gait. The level of osteotomy best done at ischial level and distal osteotomy mid diaphyseal for obvious reasons which I mentioned. And according to me, it's not the deformity lines that are important, it's what the patient feels right. And therefore, slight abduction, not as described originally at 15 degrees at, uh, at the hip, and this was also mentioned by Haas many, many years ago. No doubt, the traditional is our hip reconstruction. It choose everything what we want. Stability, it negates Tendlenburg gait, which is ungainly, improves hip biomechanics, and achieves range of motion and length. However, Compliance is a problem when you have pins and wires, especially going through muscles and acceptance. Pain, infections, joint stiffness, aesthetic issues, psychological issues, because most of these are teenagers. So what's changed my practice? We moved to a new building, so I thought we need to have a new technique. So we published this paper in Strategies, uh, where I thought maybe we should move on and combine the two and use all the uh, internal devices, because by then the precise nail had arrived. So we published that with my initial eight cases, and we staged them. The, the proximal part is done as one single procedure with two incisions if you have to resect. And I use the recon, 3.5 Establa recon plates because you can bend them in two planes. The first plate on the lateral side is a C plate because that can fit nicely for the extension, and then you can give valgus. But because it's a weak plate, I then put an anterior symphysis pubis plate or another plate to neutralize it because they can easily fracture. Remember, these are not supposed to be used in fractures anymore uh, with the recent MHRA regulation. And be between two to six weeks later, then you use a distal retrograde lengthening nail for LLD. <coughs> so these were the eight patients. I'm not gonna go through all the results. You can see that in the paper. And the same, you can see the radiological uh, pictures again to show extension and valgus. And then we do the time unless you go distal. So this is one good example there, a latency anywhere between five to 10 days depending on the pathology and age of the child. This is the original precise, that was my first girl whom I had done. And then you can see in more recent times since the precise nail has been withdrawn, I've been using the fit bone nail, as you can see. Of course, this was, I didn't have the one with the example for it, so I didn't put the hip here. So just to show you, uh, the, we have done about 14 fit bones now, uh, not just for PSOs, for others as well. And we usually remove the implants after one year, provided all the cortices are well formed. In the final clinical assessment, we didn't have any poor results. Uh, we had two fair, where still there were two where had positive Trendlenburg and valgus. The complications, as you can see, one had an implant failure with no detriment at the osteotomy site, as you can see, and one which went into a bit more valgus. So we got some more uh, sort of ideas for how to avoid this, and since reverse planning came, we have moved on to reverse planning after that, and so thereby you can translate and preempt your deformity. This is just to show all the publications and just to show all the complications from the literature review. Uh, of course, these are early days for the internal fixation devices, as you can see, and uh, you can compare this about knee stiffness, uh, especially with the internal devices. We didn't have any, whereas we did have with the external fixators. You can see that frame time almost on an average of all of us between uh, five to you know uh, six months, six or seven months. Um, and the length gain, you can see the difference in all of them. So technique and evolution, uh, reverse planning uh, is something now we use more and more for, so that the axis is still nice and straight, better aesthetic results with low complications rates. The early results, and we have published two or three publications now, and encourage, is encouraging and cost effective. This was published uh, recently in International Orthopedics, Quality of Life of Children During 
osteogenesis, comparing intramedullary lengthening nails and external fixators, which were possibly the patients preferred more than the fixators. Just a quick example of a long series. To, this is a patient underwent PSO in 2005 for a Sufi with severe AV, avascular necrosis. Uh, she, she was overweight even then. She became an adult, discharged her. She went to another center. She fractured a petal at some point. Though she didn't have pain, she was not happy with the gait. So one of the colleagues in Leeds uh, went ahead and did the uh, uh, re-osteotomize and did a hip replacement. Uh, originally, the, there was a paper published by Shilton Wolf. You can convert these later, but of course, probably by uh, trained revision hip surgeons. And she went on to heal quite well. So she's still doing well, but she's 110 kilograms. Just to finish, this girl uh, is almost now, I think, 13 to 14 years of follow-up. Uh, she was working on a cruise ship almost for 11 years. She came to see me, and uh, she's doing quite well. But at the moment, she's also asking for a total hit, just to let you know it's possible. OK, thank you very much. Thank you so much, James. That was her up. She had an amputation and a pain all time working. So you did that internal technique. So I, I can vouch for that, at least for one case. <laughs> Thank you. So, so moving on, we have uh, uh, another stalwart, Mr. Uh, Dr. Mikhail Shamchikov, who actually also worked with Elizarovin initially and uh, works at Dallas at the minute at the Scottish Rite Children's Hospital and he's going to talk about constrained and unconstrained hinges. So just before we go, there was a question from the YouTube, from Ahmed, from Cairo, from Benna University, and he asked for five and 10 year follow-up. So about Dr. Zhang's uh, transfers distraction. So at the minute, I don't think we have information, but I will email him and, and see if he has that information and pass it on to Ahmed uh, in time. So. Yeah, it's a very interesting time to talk about hinges because everyone switching to GEC supports and uh, very often we faculty uh, facing situation when uh, participants saying, why we need to even know about hinges? GEC support can correct all deformities and all that. But it's a misconception because sooner or later everyone will be involved in correction of the deformities and uh, other orthopedic situation with external fixation when hinges have become the main source of movement of one uh, part of the frame about another part of the frame. So we believe that knowledge about hinges is still important and uh, uh, to eliminate your confusion uh, because you will see a lot of um, titles like constrained, unconstrained, what's the difference between them? So I think it will be important to uh, cover that and, and discuss uh, principles about that. So just to be on the same kind of level, we need to define what hinges are and uh, especially what is the mechanical nature of the hinges. So mechanical, uh, it's a mechanical bearing device that connects two solid objects allowing them to rotate relative to each other about a fixed axis of rotation. So two parts connect together, common axis of rotation, so one part rotates around another part in, around this axis of rotation. More importantly, that all other translations or rotations being prevented, and thus a hinge typically has only one degree of freedom. So you can direct your movement uh, eliminating any undesirable movements or translations at the same time. Uh, actually, hinges has a very long, have a very long history, and you will find the first uh, notice about hinges more than 5,000 years ago when they were used in the big cities in, in the gates to rotate the part of the gate and the door and at the gates to open them. You can see reproduction of some of them in the left. It's for light doors when you can just take one beam and take a piece of rock, make hole there, and that will be the hinge. It is out of hinges we learned a long time ago in Russia, so I think everyone already know 
how Elizarov looks. This is the guy on the left. The guy on the right, it's me 40 years ago. There's a lot of hair. But uh, if you look at each, it's the same thing. It's practically two parts, two solid objects which connect it together with the bolt and uh, a nut, which uh, practically uh, create the single axis of rotation, avoiding that. So it's the same definition as for the door hinges. It's a mechanical bearing device that connects two solid bodies um, and allowing them to rotate relative to each other around this bolt and nuts. And we were using hinges a lot. We are still using them a lot because we believe that GEC support is a fantastic device, but very often it's overkill. If you know hinges, you can simplify patient lives and your lives, but challenge not by choosing which one is better for this particular situation. And this is the um, foot, and you can see a lot of hinges there. So it's a multiple hinges, but functionally they're all attached there for different purpose. Like hinge in the center, that hinge there to correct cavus deformity. The hinges on the bottom, they just to pull two parts of the foot apart from each other. The other hinges are not even related to the movements. They are just to connect frame in the static condition. So this is why we need to know what those hinges are and, and, and to be comfortable when we are attaching them for one or another purpose. So clinical requirements for hinges are very simple. They're supposed to allow limb segment movement in the desired direction, practically one segment of the limb relative to another segment of the limb. They should maintain gap between joint or stereotomy uh, surfaces uh, contacting to each other. And finally, they should prevent undesirable angulation, translation while allowing weight bearing for the patient. So those two uh, clinical requirements are very important and uh, it's uh, very easy to utilize them for angular deformity correction. It's very clear and I think everybody in the room after spending these four days here can very easily manipulate with those hinges for angular deformity correction. We can correct deformities doing opening wage uh, hinge, or we can correct deformity doing closing wage, we can move it away and we can make lengthening at the same time, we can move it up and down of the, um, the uh, uh, line, and you can just create translation at the same time. So we can manipulate them with very easy. The problem start when we are using hinges to correct position of the uh, foot or position of any segment using joint as a uh, place for rotation. So here, for example, example of the ankle joint. And the problem comes because most of the hinges what we are using are unilateral hinges. They are designed to provide movement in one plane. While most of our joints are three-dimensional structures which are very complicated axis of rotation. And you can find a lot of papers today uh, uh, to kind of uh, discuss in all details about that. But what is very interesting that ankle, for example, the joint axis is not parallel to the floor. It's oblique. It's also obliquely oriented in the horizontal plane. In addition, it's not static axis. Its axis will fluctuate, change the position from plantar flexion to dorsal flexion. So our question now is now hinges to correct our contractures and the joints. And uh, it's very important because uh, when we are correct, we want to not create damage. We want to correct contracture, preserving articulated surfaces of the joint, which we call protective joint motion. Good news that we have several options, and we have several options with those hinges, and the only we need to know which one to use and what indications. So for example, we can take a hinge and we can overlap this hinge this projection of the axis of rotation of the joint. Then we can interconnect those hinges with proximal and distal external supports. And then we can make another hinges on the back to push one frame member relative to another frame member together with attached segments, foot and tibia. So now we can push it and we can rotate correcting this deformity. And that's hinge what 
called constraint hinge. This is the first what we want everyone to know what the constraint hinges are. So those are hinges that provide predetermined or static axis of joint rotation. So it's practically the foot or any other segment what we are moving will go around that axis of rotation. Not the anatomical axis of rotation of the joint, but axis of that hinge. And we are lucky with when we are able to overlap them so precisely that movement occurred through the natural anatomical axis, but it's still the leading axis will be the axis of the hinge. This is constrained hinges. So how we can eliminate our problems, what we discussed before, because it's still three-dimensional structure and the axis of the joint is fluctuating and it's oblique. And remember, we were doing this yesterday uh, for equinus deformity correction. We were distracting the joint. And this is the key to kind of overlap these two problems, monolateral nature of the hinges and multiplanar nature of the axis of rotation of the joint. So when we distract, our gap between the contacting articulating surfaces, exactly the amount of space required for this axis of rotation to fluctuate. So practically, if you will distract the ankle joint seven, from seven to 12 millimeters, we are creating enough gap to avoid any uh, compression between articulating surfaces during this uh, correction of the contraction. And the same, same for the knee joint. We are distracting knee joints also to correct flexion contracture of the knee. So when we are building our constrained system, constrained frame with constrained hinges, we always need to think about distraction, and we always need to add distraction to, uh, to the structure. Like in this case, we always need to keep enough straight rod on those hinges to allow it to distract the joint. And importantly, you need to distract proximal rod, not distal one, because the axis of rotation, won't, if you want to distract the contact, uh, create the gap between contacted surfaces, you want to move the foot down together with the axis of rotation. So you cannot distract distally, only proximally, to keep the axis of rotation in the same place. And then we can correct that. In addition to that, we can do other stuff with, with this joint because we can just distract and we can distract the connecting threaded rods or we can take the, the hinge and move it a little bit anteriorly. And if you move the hinge anteriorly, it's similar to the opening which trapezoidal kind of regenerate. We can correct deformity, we can correct contracture, and same time we can distract the joint. Moreover, if you have subluxation of the joint or subluxation of the foot, for example, talus in this case, relative to the tibia, then we can move the hinge down and now we can correct, we can distract, and we can translate same time, just manipulating with this hinge. Don't forget about anatomical requirements because they are still important. We need relatively preserved shape of the talus, we need congruent articulating surfaces, absence of any anatomical bone obstructions, and potentially smooth uh, uniplanar movement of around the single axis of rotation. It's very difficult to do this uh, uh, scientifically. It's more like feelings which you're getting through the experience. You look in the x-ray, you touch the foot and said, yeah, that's more likely will go smoothly, okay? And some of them, you look and that said, no, there is no way to use constrained hinges here because uh, the, the, this foot will not rotate. So let me show you an example of using constrained hinge. Uh, this is a 15 years old girl with lineal scleroderma, four centimeters of tibial shortening, rigid equinus deformity with uh, practically no ankle motion, and all other symptoms associated with scleroderma. This is her weight-bearing surfaces, and you can see how she walks just using her forefoot as weight-bearing surface during the gait. So treatment strategy, what we use was uh, exactly what I just described, to use constrained hinge, distract the joint, uh, and uh, if you look on the radiographs on the left, that's all 
practical anatomical requirements are here. So we have good contacting and grating surfaces. They're smooth, no obstructions. So we believe that we will be able to move this foot. Also, the contracture is very severe. You can see um, this on the radiograph. So the foot was stabilized with the foot uh, plate. This is our typical stabilization pattern with two long ol uh, olive wires through the entire foot, and then to, to uh, one or two metatarsal forefoot wires, and sometimes another wire through the midfoot. And then we are building our hinge, constrained hinge, overlapping this hinge with projection, what we believe, of the axis of rotation of the foot. So then, as you can see here, uh, this is the radiographs and clinical picture of the, on the beginning of uh, cor correction. This is in the end of the correction. So by destruction of the threaded rod, you can see this on the uh, right radiograph. It's, a, it's sticking out specifically for destruction, and you can destruct the joint same time while you're correcting this contracture. So for that goal, we perform additional four centimeter lengthening, and this is your outcome with significant improve of the weight-bearing surfaces of the foot during um, the gait, and this is how she walks now. <coughs> so this is not only one option to accommodate for this uh, uh, oblique nature of uh, the, the, the ankle joint. Uh, we can design hinges which will allow us to, to create oblique axis of rotation of the hinge and then try to overlap this oblique axis of the hinge with the uh, oblique axis of the joint. So this is one of the examples of that. So you can use uh, multiplanar hinges oblique, uh, with oblique axis and place them uh, not parallel to, uh, to each other, not on the same level, but put them in the different <laughs> levels so they can create this oblique axis of rotation which allowed us to correct deformity and uh, correct uh, contracture without distracting the joint or distracting with minimum amount. <laughs> this is the hinge what we are using at Scottish Rite Hospital. We designed it specifically for that purpose. As you can see here, there is a ball inside the hinge and this ball can rotate to accommodate for oblique axis of rotation. And you can see this is how it's placed on the patient, uh, creating oblique orientation of this axis, which much easier to overlap with the anatomical axis of rotation. We call this hinge phantom hinge because it's completely radiolucent. And moreover, you can put wire through the axis of rotation and then build your hinges around this wire to be very precise. Also, GEC support systems, we don't see hinges there. We only see, only, only see six struts, but hinges there. We just call this virtual hinge. It's not hardware hinge, but it's there. And uh, let me show this in the clinical example of this 15 years old girl with rigid post-traumatic equinovarus contracture with minimum ankle range of motion. She underwent four quadrant fasciotomy due to compartment syndrome with anterior tibial arterial insufficiency uh, um, after displaced, um, displaced proximal tibial fracture secondary to fall on concrete steps. So this is her weight-bearing surfaces. Again, she's working practically using only four foot for that. And uh, this is her gait before the treatment. But if you look in her uh, radiographs, again, we can see all necessary anatomical requirements, what we discuss, good uh, congru congruent contacting surfaces, no obstructions, uh, preserve gap, and feelings when you try that it will go. But then we are using software to preassemble the frame, to pre-build the frame for the surgery. And if you look in this radiograph, this is the software we didn't have time to use during this course, but this is called Hexray. It's a part of the Trula Hex uh, uh, system. It's uh, practically you're taking radiograph and embedding radiograph into the software, and you do all your uh, calculations and analysis of deformity inside the software, and then software will tell you what frame you need to build to correct this deformity. But if you look in the cross section between them, there is a point. I think. Oops. Right here, 
And this is the cross section between anatomical axis of the tibia and vertical axis of the foot. So if you look here, this is our hinge. And this hinge also constrained hinge because we, we are telling the system where to rotate around what axis. We just cannot see it uh, by eyes. And then we can build a frame, attach this frame for the patient. And you can see radiographs in the beginning of correction and the end of the correction with overcorrection. Specifically, we are doing more uh, 5, 10 degrees of overcorrection in those situations. And the, the joint is distract because we put distraction in, in the software, so there is no difference. And then after correction is done, we are switching to turn our phantom hinges to restore the range of motion in this patient. And this is your outcome radiographically. This is her range of motion. And this is how she walked now. So as I mentioned, it's constraint hinges work very well when you have those anatomical requirements preserved. You need congruent articulating surfaces, then you can move. But very often we don't have this, we're not that lucky. We have incongruent articulating surfaces, we have some anatomical structures, we have something which not allow this smooth movement uh, using constraint hinges. In those situations, we are using different approach. We are using what we call unconstrained hinges. And practically, if you look here, instead of trying to overlap anything with the, anatomy, uh, with the axis of rotation, we are creating the system with hinges which can push posterior portion of the foot down and same time pull anterior portion of the foot up here. What that means, that we developing unconstrained hinge with practically using the anatomical axis of rotation of the joint. And now hinge system are not really hinges for rotation. This hinges just to pull and push. And this is very interesting because it's allowed you to correct deformities through the anatomical axis, but also they're very good when you have different amount of contracture for the forefoot and the hind foot. For example, combination of the equinus and chaos you can push in one amount posterior and you can pull in another amount anteriorly. And that can eliminate that. Interestingly enough, that's the first system what Elizarov was using long, long time ago. So if you look on this um, uh, document on the right, this is his uh, little book, what he wrote, and I will translate this for you. It's practically treatment of flesh and contraction of knee and ankle joints, and it's published in 1971. And that was the first place when he was talking about unconstrained systems to correct contractures, and you cannot see hinges there. Practically, he was using only one wire uh, proximally, one wire distally, interconnect them with the frame, and you can correct deformity. This is more modern interpretation of the same. You can see hinges, but those hinges are not for rotation. Those hinges just to pull and push part of the foot. Let me show a few clinical examples, and I'm done. So this example of the adult patient with severe rigid equinus deformity associated with varus cavus deformity secondary to a stroke, status put hypoadductor release, hamstring release, and failed TAL. That's the treatment strategy using unconstrained hinges. So we are pushing hind foot down and we are pulling forefoot up. And again, there is other requirements because uh, he, he has complex deformity of the talus, preventing these constrained hinges to use. Uh, he has both hind foot and forefoot involved on the different amount of the contracture, and he is going to have ankle arthrodesis after correction of deformity done. It's perfect case for these unconstrained hinges to use. And this is the system built on the NOR, uh, beginning and end of deformity correction, and final result after arthrodesis. Pediatric surgeons, you not see in adults, but you will see that, that approach in the uh, club foot correction. Because when we are correcting club foot in the small children using external fixator, there is no room to put gexapod there. But there is enough room to build hinges and use those hinges in an uh, constrained manner because we are going to, to stretch soft tissues to correct this deformity. 
And we, you can see a lot of hinges in these diagrams, but if you look, there are hinges for correct varus and equinus, to correct supination, pronation of the food, uh, to correct adduction of the food, you know, to correct anything, but none of them are hinge, what we meant usually when talking about hinges. They're not for rotation, they just to pull and push part of the food in, in the different direction. This is last example. You can see four year old girl with water syndrome, type four left tibial hemimelia with club foot deformity and limb length discrepancy. She already underwent amputation on the right leg. And this is her uh, club foot uh, deformity. Radiograph and the treatment strategy to stabilize midfoot, sorry, forefoot, hindfoot, and tibia, and then push and pull those uh, segments of the foot in different direction to correct deformity. And you can see we can correct varus, we can correct supination pronation, we can correct equinus, we can correct adduction, anything. But none of those hinges are hinges to move. They're all unconstrained hinges. This is her one year follow up radiographically. And this is her 13 years follow up. So the foot remained in the position. So in summary, there are two major types of external fixation hinges and they're available for us to restore joint of motion and move uh, part of the segments. Uh, they are constrained and unconstrained. Both type of those hinges permit joint movement around the desired axis of rotation while maintaining joint destruction, preventing undesirable angulation and translation and allowing weight bearing. Constraint hinges provide predetermined static axis of rotation for joint movement while unconstrained hinges utilize anatomical dynamic axis of joint rotation uh, for, for correction of deformities. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was great. Thank you so much for the lovely talk. Any questions? Great. So now we move on to the part two of the day, uh, which is a symposium. And uh, this is the format uh, we're starting in. Hopefully, um, uh, if, if it's successful, we can continue with the similar format with the current concepts. and. This afternoon we have Dorai Naigam who really needs no introduction in terms of his work or uh, 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 and, uh, um, and the presentations and how he's one of the uh, best presenters I've seen. Uh, he'll be with us this afternoon. So we're running through this, this symposium on the fixator assisted deformity correction and internal fixation. The idea is that we covered the, 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 this topic extensively and cover all aspects of it uh, and um, so that uh, it would be easier for anybody who wants to do it, get full information, evidence, uh, technique, support, everything. Uh, Mr. Na Dura has done a, a, a massive amount of this work in, the, in his years uh, at Liverpool and uh, uh, and and the, uh, the uh, most talks are uh, <clears throat> actually face to face, and I think two are virtual from France, from South Africa, and uh, David Goodyear's uh, talk uh, would be would be virtual. So in the first instance, Gavin Dikivit, who you know is uh, uh, one of the partners who we run this course, and he's an uh, excellent foot uh, pediatric surgeon actually, and does all kinds of things very well. So and he, he'll start off the symposium today. Doing um, for this next section is um, employing many of the principles and concepts that we've been teaching you over the last few days of this course, including some of the techniques you saw in the work bone workshop yesterday in terms of fixator-assisted uh, acute correction followed by internal fix fixation. Um, so the talks will come this afternoon. So this is in preparation for those talks to go through how you approach this particular topic, things you need to think about and consider in order to use this particular technique. So we're looking at the principles and planning of external fixator assisted internal fixation. So the key concept really here is that you want it to be accurate. So we're going to have external fixation use in order to make it as accurate as possible, but then get an acute correction with internal fixation. So we're using the versatility and accuracy of external fixation. This is combined with the comfort and stability of internal fixation. And the topics we're going to cover are the principles, some talk about planning, soft tissue considerations, the bone considerations, 
fixator of choice, what, how, what you might use and how you would use it, uh, and the implant of choice. So the principles really um, are, as we've been going through this course, patient selection, as with any surgery, um, the right operation for the right patient at the right time, uh, whatever technique you're using. You are going to require accurate planning, and we've been practicing that. For an appropriate deformity, not all deformities are amenable to this particular technique. The soft tissues have to be compatible. You have to be able to execute your preoperative plan intraoperatively, and then you're going to use nails or plates or whatever device you want for definitive fixation, and rehabilitation, again, is important. So the two te main techniques we're talking about are fixator-assisted nailing and fixator-assisted locking plates. The advantages are accurate correction using the fixator. The patient doesn't have a long-term fixator in place, and this is patient comfort, no pin site problems, tethering of muscles and or joints, um, and you can still do it with limited soft tissue exposure. In other words, respect the biology. Disadvantages, well, it does need accurate planning. Uh, in order to plan this out in advance, we do stress this. Good patient selection on selected deformities, um, but you are, to some degree, constrained by the implants that you will use to stabilize your correction once you have performed it. This has been mentioned a number of times uh, during the course. It doesn't preclude you from using this particular technique or indeed from using external fixation in patients. So all these different factors we mentioned here, age, smoking, diabetes, immunosuppression, radiotherapy, malnutrition, previous surgery and infection, vascular disease and mental health. These are problems that the patient will have, but these are things that you may have to deal with in advance of you actually going ahead and doing surgery. So they don't stop you from performing the surgery, but you have to be aware of them and deal with them in, ad in advance. Planning is important, and we're going to be looking at um, selecting the deformed bone, in other words, which is the, the problem, where's the problem in this limb, the alignment, where's the apex of that deformity, what is the magnitude. We'll talk about the osteotomy level and the type, and you've heard these concepts. What osteotomy rule, therefore, are you employing, and what is the appropriate fixation? And these are the different resources you have, the new book that's coming out, Fundamentals of Lower Limb Deformity Analysis, and these other excellent books that are already out there to help you plan this type of surgery. So planning, managing expectations of patients, I think, is important. Um, Sean Standard talks about this, and so does Janet Conway, and this is something we do employ in our clinic, is agreeing patient expectations. What does the patient really want from this? What do you want from this particular surgery? And agreeing that in advance of setting out on sometimes these complex um, surgeries. It's worthwhile doing a problem list, and then also analyzing how you're going to deal with those problems. You know, does a patient need to go see a psychiatrist in advance, or do you have to get diabetic control prior for the patient being scheduled for surgery? So list your solutions and action points you may need to do, and in doing that, you'll then come up with what we call a surgical tactic. So this is what Dr. Standard uses on notability in his clinic to write a few notes down. On the left-hand side there, you see clinic notes is what I might do in the clinic, and I've got the problem list, I've got patient goals, surgeon goals, a few details of what I might need to be doing in advance to prep the patient for surgery, and a rough little diagram sketch, and that comes from um, Bone Ninja, as to what we might be achieving, and you can show the patient this is the type of thing we might be doing. So in clinic, you have a good discussion with the patient in advance. In other words, this is all leading up towards informed consent, for example, of what the plan is, to have a program to work towards in order to achieve what they want to uh, following surgery and what you want to following surgery. And then there's a definitive surgical plan, which is much more detailed, where you are using various apps and including um, various um, CAD CAM programs, um, and that you will use that in surgery in order to reproduce in surgery the plan that you've accurately done prior to the patient coming for surgery. So we have modern planning methods, these CAD CAM programs, which you've seen and heard about, um, whereby you can plan in advance, this can be an operating theater, and then you just have to go live in surgery and reproduce that particular plan so your intraoperative plan matches your preoperative plan. You do have to consider the soft tissues, and for example, the skin, it may be that this patient may have to have plastic surgery with flaps or grafts in order to create uh, good soft tissues around the particular area to improve the biology and antibiotic delivery prior to considering acute fixation, acute uh, correction rather than gradual correction. You need to think about the nerves, the blood vessels, and also the compartments. And depending on the magnitude of direction, um, magnitude, the direction, and also the rotation of your correction will determine what effect that has on the various soft tissues. So, for example, nerves may be affected uh, by being stretched, 
Um, you may have arterial venous compromise because of stretching or previous grafts or tightening of the compartments because of rotation, so think about that. Muscle and tendons with lengthening can result in joint contractions, particularly if you're using um, a large correction. And also the skin, acute correction can cause uh, blistering of the skin, but like a burn um, and skin necrosis if you're doing a very large correction. And the bumps you produce, depending on the osteotomy type, may also impinge on the skin. For example, perineal nerve considerations, and we did perineal nerve decompression in the cadaver lab. If you're doing a pure opening wedge, you're going to be stretching that perineal nerve. But even if you're doing a closing wedge osteotomy, and a hinge point is on the convex surface closing wedge, anything lateral to that where the perineal nerve is will also open up to some degree. So you will still get some lengthening uh, even with a closing wedge osteotomy. We then think about combining that with any rotational correction. So angular correction and rotational correction will gain will increase the amount of stretch and pressure on either the nerves or the vessels. And also in the lower limb particular, it's like wringing out a cloth. Rotational con um, corrections will tighten up the muscle compartments. Example also, lengthening uh, either by angular correction or indeed lengthening as well, will also put pressure on your vascular structures. And if there's been a congenital case or there's been uh, post-traumatic scarring, infection or grafts in place, they need to consider, can I do acute correction this patient, or is this more amenable to a gradual correction or even a shortening procedure? So this patient you see on the left was coming in for a fairly significant femoral deformity correction, and we know post um, a fracture followed by infection, and we noticed this aneurysm, and we required to do a sort of very loose graft in place in order to then go ahead and do the correction we intended. So in your planning, you may have to consider ancillary soft tissue procedures like nerve decompressions, compartment releases, also the type of fibular osteotomy you may want to do, uh, and also tendon lengthening and joint releases in order to achieve the convenience of acute correction and internal fixation. What then about the osteotomy? We'll need to think about the bone, the biology of that bone and the osteotomy do, where's the apex of my deformity, and what, how is that going to affect the osteotomy rule? what type of osteotomy I'm going to do, we mentioned that earlier in the course, and then the correction order. So if we might be doing a femoral deformity correction and can we do a single osteotomy and still fix it with a nail and a diaphysis? Do we have to have plastic surgery to graft the skin and bring us a good vascular supply into that area prior to considering surgery? Or do we have a problem that's not going to be amenable with bone loss and, um, and significant inf infection? So you will do your balam, bal orientation test to select the apex of deformity, the plane of correction, and depending on where you hip, what your hinge point at the time of your surgery as to what type of osteotomy you get, or opening wedges, or indeed osteotomy reel two. And depending on that opening or closing wedge osteotomy will give you a bone configuration and an osteotomy configuration in terms of stability that will lead you to select one implant over another implant in terms of fixation. And often using osteotomy rule two is a good idea because what you're trying to create there is a very stable osteotomy construct which you then hold with your internal fixation to allow healing because we don't have the advantage of the biology of gradual distraction. Even in doing your osteotomy, we, main osteotomy we've talked about is the drill and corticotomy, but you can use a jiggly saw in the metaphysis when the foot is fairly useful because it gives you a nice clean cut in terms of the osteotomy. And therefore the shape of the osteotomy can also be important. If you're combining angulation, rotation, and indeed translation, then in straight cut osteotomies, are likely to be much more easier to maneuver and use. Oblique osteotomies will give you the combination of angulation and rotation, as you learned a few days ago. Then sometimes the more special osteotomies, for example, like this particular L osteotomy, where we're doing not only rotational correction, but we're also then translating and improving the patella tracking mechanism um, in, in this patient. With acute external fixate assisted to correct the rotation and the angulation, and then fixed with a locking plate. You've all practiced dome osteotomies, and these are very useful in the metaphyseal region. We have got a great surface area and good bone contact for stability. Also, it minimizes the uh, translation bump that you might get, because often you will be doing this away from your cora, therefore osteotomy will two, which means obligatory translation. It minimizes the little bump there. But you can also translate this osteotomy to some degree perpendicular to the angular correction. As mentioned, sometimes shortening is useful. So an excision wedge um, would be useful, or a trapezoidal wedge would be useful. If you've got joint contractures and scarring, to get alignment and correction, you may say, I need to shorten the bone in order to achieve that. But do be aware that your saw blades need to be very accurate. The saw cuts need to be very accurate. 
If slightly off in the one plane, you get an oblique cut on the one bone surface, which means when you put them together, you get a secondary deformity correction occurring. So if we do cut the bone and do acute correction, is there an order in which we do this correction in terms of the different uh, rotation, translation, angulation? And certainly with acute correction, um, this is a re the a reliable order to do it in because if you angulate, first of all, you tend to tighten up the soft tissues. That makes rotation and translation more difficult. So in general terms, we'd say let's rotate the osteotomy first of all. We will then translate the osteotomy and then finally perform our angular correction. So that is order correction for acute correction. Whereas as you saw with gradual correction, particularly the hexapods, which employ a virtual hinge, which is a spiral hinge, it can correct all six axes of deformity simultaneously. However, we also mentioned that perhaps you might want to correct some of the deformity first, for example, angulation and length, prior to then going on to correct your translation and rotation. And that's what we call phases of treatment or waypoints, depending on which fixator system you're using. In terms of the fixator that you use interoperatively, this can be fairly simple, just two pins, monolateral fixator, for example, like this. If it's a simple deformity, not a huge correction, purely angulation, that may be stable enough to achieve your correction while you then go ahead and plate it. If it's more complex, smaller piece of bone, bigger patient, you need more stability, you can use biplanar fixation. Again, just with four pins is often enough to, to achieve that. Or for the multi-apical deformities or multi-axis deformities, you can actually use a hexapod, in which case you can cut the bone, put the hexapod, do your correction using a hexapod correction, and then just add in your internal fixation uh, thereafter. But in doing this technique, accurate placement of the half pins of your external fixator assisting device is very important. It needs to be out of the way or out of the plane of the internal fixation device you're then going to use. And this is a technique of using a K-wire accurately an image intensifier control exactly where you want your pin to be while overlapping, for example, your implant, your nail or your plate so that that pin will not interfere with where you place your plate. Calculate a drill over top of that K-wire and then you could introduce your half pin so if you were nailing this proximal femur, that pin, the KY, will go into less trochanter, which you can then see on II in the lateral, place your path pin there, and won't interfere with the passage of that particular nail. Interoperative application of your um, preoperative plan is very important. You have to be able to accurately measure and see that you have achieved the correction you set out to do. So you can use a grid method, a grid underneath the table, the diathermy cord, you can use sterile goniometers, some very nice sterile goniometers that you saw in the one presentation uh, yesterday that are very useful for rotational correction. Also, because you preoperatively planned this, you know that at the osteotomy site in the AP view, I require five millimeters of medial translation of my distal segment. And in doing your osteotomy, you can actually measure that interoperatively and say, have I achieved that? And there's also a calibrated software on an image intensifier machine that will take out the parallax and allow you to assess your corrections. It's particularly useful, for example, for the complex pelvic osteotomies we, we do. So here's a case, of this femoral deformity here, this is the guy, the guy who had the graft and the aneurysm. And there in the background is our trauma CAD um, preoptive planning that we have up there in the operating theater so we can match that planning to what we're actually achieving um, in the patient. And then he's undergoing an, a flexible and an internally nailing to correct that. So the implant of choice can, for example, nails. These are particularly useful for your diaphyseal, angular, and or rotational corrections. The good thing is they do allow, to, for, with the reaming that takes place, to graft the site biologically. But in the metaphyseal region, you may have to consider using polar blocking screws to add stability, particularly if you have big deformity corrections. And you see in the diagram we have there that we've got quite a big translation, but you can still ream out part of the cortex near the osteotomy site to allow passage of a nail, but then you probably do need polar blocking screws. Locking plates are the other option. Um, the angular stable plates are useful in the metaphyseal region. Um, they're also stable and allow you to use them as an internal external fixator. So they don't have to be on the bone, don't have to conform to the bone surface, so they allow a greater range of um, geometry. But you also need to know, where do I put this plate? How do I apply this plate to the type of osteotomy I have? In other words, what is the stability of the osteotomy in the corrected position? So in the first picture there, you see an opening wedge osteotomy with a plate on the lateral side. So unless you put a structural graft into that big opening wedge there, there's going to be a lot of stress in that plate, and it's likely to fail before biological healing. If you put the plate on the medial side then, 
you have a bit of cortical contact on the lateral side, that's going to be more stable, a better place to put your plate, but you still may have stress through the screws and you have screw failure or shear of the screws without graft. So you may want to say, okay, fine, let's create a stable osteotomy configuration, there's osteotomy rule two, where you can put the spike of the proximal segment into distal segment, creating a stable construct even before you apply your plate. For example, in the picture there, the x-ray picture there, you see a blade plate of a various osteotomy, and you can see that the point of the proximal segment is actually sitting in the direct canal of the distal segment. So I have a stable osteotomy construct even before I fix it with internal fixation. And all this is designed to do this, is early rehabilitation of the patient, joint range of motion, um, and early return to social and working life. And we've talked about you know, getting the patient up and walking, and you had a lovely talk early on about dynamization, reverse dynamization, getting the bone to start taking load to stimulate that healing process. And Ilizarov achieved his amazing six weeks healing times for tibial fractures because of the extensive weight-bearing rehabilitation program he had. These patients were all resident in the hospital until they completed their physiotherapy. So the key points of this technique are careful patient selection, accurate planning of a deformity that's amendable to internal fixation, with soft tissues that will allow you to do the acute correction, meticulous intraoperative execution of your preoperative plan, stable fixation, and early rehabilitation. Thank you. So we'll take questions in a minute. There's also a question on the YouTube, so we'll just tackle with that at the same time. Uh, so I think it's quite important to have the basics because <clears throat> ultimately the aim is to heal the bone. And so the principles are extremely important because you're combining two techniques and you're trying to get the best out of the, of the two techniques. And, uh, and then next talk is just the extension of that where we uh, look at the what are the mechanical and biological factors which will help you decide what implant to choose. Because saying that I'll nail everything or I'll plate everything because it's easy, is probably may work in your hand, but sometimes it may also cause problems. So if you choose an implant according to what it actually needs and which is best for that patient would be an ideal situation. So Mr. Goodyear is going to tell us about that. So in the meantime, I can ask a question to uh, uh, Mikhail. Uh, there was a question on, uh, on YouTube saying that, do you have, would you do TA lengthening if you're doing an, uh, uh, if you're putting in a frame and stretching your tendon Achilles, do you have to do the lengthening of the TA at all? If you're doing a, uh, stretching of the tendo Achilles and correcting the Aquinas contracture, do you have to do TA lengthening? Yes. Uh, uh, typically, we always try to perform as much soft tissue release as possible to minimize the amount of gradual deformity correction. So it's most of the time it will be TAL, and in those cases what I show it will be Z plasty, not uh, percutaneous, and also a plantar fascia release. And then we can correct acutely in the surgery, put the frame on, and then gradually start doing this. The key there that when you do your Achille tendon um, lengthening, uh, it's become wobble. So you have enough uh, non-tension time to start your deformity correction with the frame. So the time when the Achille start stretching in again, it will be almost three weeks, so that's enough time to heal, and then you can start stretching the tendon with remaining uh, uh, contracture correction. Okay. So, uh, so that's quite an important point that you don't have to wait, there's no lag time after the tear lengthening, you can uh, uh, slowly stretch it as soon as it uh, 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 post-surgery-like routine and start your corrections, and then the, with time uh, it will stretch. And actually, it, uh, soft tissue release is a part of any uh, deformity uh, correction, and it's actually a very important part.
Good afternoon. Firstly, I wanted to apologise for not being there in person. I had to disappear off very rapidly. Uh, yesterday afternoon, uh, we had a flood at our house in London, so I had to disappear. Uh, particular apologies to the guys off from Table 10 who have not been able to help and for dumping one of my colleagues with a workshop. Uh, I'm actually going to deliver my talk pre-recorded that was planned to be given on Friday. Uh, and it's on the bi biological and mechanical considerations in choosing implants. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm David Goodyear from the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital in Stanmore. Uh, first thing I would say, declaration of interest, I have previously been a paid shill for Smith & Nephew talking about many of their new smart TSF. Uh, and the other declaration of interest is I have no idea actually what Hemant wants me to talk about in this talk. Uh, in non-union and deformity correction surgery, often the biological and the mechanical considerations are intimately linked. Uh, and this was all looked at many years ago, the basic biology of distraction osteogenesis. It was looked at many years ago by Ilizarov himself in the Siberian Institute in Kurgan. Uh, this is when I went. This is myself. I think that's uh, Mark McNally, Chris Andrews, Gavin the Kiebert, Simon Royston, Bob Handley, uh, Oh, I've forgotten who that is, uh, Mark Churchill, uh, one of the American guys. And this here is the late, great Jim Binsky, who's been a great uh, friend and supporter of all of us here in the BLRS. I just want to put this slide up to acknowledge him. Uh, the one person not there is the chap who was my SPR at the time, who's now my consultant colleague for the last dozen years at the Royal National P Hospital, Pete Calder. Uh, unfortunately, I sent him when it was winter rather than nice summer. 30 below. Uh, these are the classic papers of Ilizarov, the tension stress effect on the genesis and growth of bone, uh, growth of tissues, parts one and two, and then a paper on clinical applications for leg lengthening. This is Ilizarov with his great hat, and these are the uh, papers he published. And he said this, gradual traction on living tissues creates stresses that can stimulate and maintain the regeneration active growth of certain tissue structures and basically this is what we do in trying to get to new bone but we don't only get new bone we get new nerve tissue new skin new muscle so it's the growth and regeneration of tissues rather than just bone we must consider so Elizaroff who was a person the Elizaroff frame is a circular frame apparatus the Elizaroff method is a tension stress effect on the growth and regeneration of tissues and Elizaroff applications are how the frame and method can be applied. The Elizaroff frame itself, well, initially it was only fine wires, rings, and hinges, and it has been heavily adapted since. But nevertheless, this was Kurgan in 2001, I think, uh, and they were still using components that had been around since the 1950s and constantly re-sterilized and reused. Uh, it's been adapted since. There's a lot more use of half pins in the Western world. We now have hexapod constructs, uh, spatial type frames, and there are many, many manufacturers all with their own little bells and whistles on it. Uh, as you can see, they heavily reuse this in Kurgan. Uh, in our practice in the UK, we are single use disposable in the overall majority of centers, but around the world, most people reuse their components. And the problem with this is there's lots of anecdote, but actually very little science to hang your hat on. What do we do from science? Well, olives actually significantly improve bending, torsion, and stiffness by minimal trans minimizing translation. So if you're worried about translation along a wire and you can't get your wires at 90 degrees to prevent that, then the use of wires with stoppers or olive wires, as we call them, is quite useful. Uh, we've looked at tensioning uh, and the actual degree of tensioning necessary. And actually, this is uh, requires about 20 Newton meters. Uh, of torque, the torque spanners on the a lot of the sets go to 10, which is enough, but 20 is better. And slotted bolts make, maintain the baseline tension best due to increased surface area. Uh, more modern bolts, uh, bolts used in some of the systems, such as the TL hex, actually have grooves on the bottom of their slotted fixation bolts to increase the uh, binding force between the wire and the, uh, wire and the ring. Uh, the new Smith and Nephew uh, Smart TSF system also has these so there's been changes in the way wires are mounted and in terms of half pins well this was originally done by Stuart Green in, back in 1992 who described this use of special hexagonal blocks the rancho cubes 
Uh, and the idea was to improve implant tolerance because there was less skewering of muscle and therefore better muscle function. And he knew that the Italians had been doing this since the early 80s, but just developed an easier mounting system, the Rancho Cube. But again, he was using divergent pins near and far. Uh, and although it wasn't scientifically proven, there was evidence given in that, which is largely anecdotal, of less frame time and less pin site infections. Again, half pins have evolved. Now we have hydroxyapatite coated shanz pins. Uh, and we've looked at these in actual probable scientific studies and showed no clinical or radiological signs of pin loosening or infection in the HA group, whereas in the control group, there was loosening in about 13% in infection in 20 pens, which is a slightly lesser percentage. So HA has been proven to loosen, uh, reduce the rate of loosening and infection. So how do we attach those rancher cues? We can either use these uh, rusty nuts, as they're often referred to, with an Allen key, or just an ordinary uh, bolt. And we actually did a survey on this at Stanmore and showed that the... Uh, the standard bolt actually works better than the uh, than the grub screw, so we no longer use grub screws. Plus, you can never find an Allen key to take a frame off when you want one. Uh, fine wires versus half pins. Well, it's been shown by Mike Sarley many years ago that in cancellous bone, the more even distribution of pressure along a wire and the beam loading is probably better off in cancellous bone than half pins. I did model studies on that way back in 2007. Well, it was published in 2007, the work was done before that. And we know this is all true because we know that inadequate stability leads to pain, more pain, reduced joint function, less weight bearing, relative osteoporosis, more loosening, inadequate stability. You get this vicious circle. When you start adding infections to that, infection causes further loosening by bone resorption. It's a really sort of spiraling the drain case. So the better you can get your initial stability, the better bone wire or bone pin interface you have, the better you'll do. Uh, some movement though is beneficial. We all know about rattle in uh, certain types of frames on the market. Uh, but some axial micro motion is quite useful. This has been shown in diaphyseal fractures using an orthofix with a compression device that allows a little bit of movement. And they show you can shorten your time to frame stiffness, uh, frame well, fracture site stiffness and frame removal by allowing a little bit of axial micro movement. They also did some studies on the amount of lateral bending force that would be a definition of healing of a fracture. Uh, and they saw the micro motion group was actually enhanced. Uh, this has been shown as well by uh, muscle activity, also being critical to uh, standard activity. And ankle motion can produce cycle displacement the same order as magnitude seen when weight bearing. So actually full ranging ankle movements actively probably puts the same loads through the joint as full weight bearing. Uh, so therapeutic exercise can be used as stimulus for bone formation. And this comes as absolutely no surprise to anyone who's been to Kurgan because it was Elizaroff who pointed out that secure fixation limits translational micro movement between bone fragments and the movement that is translational inhibits union. And he pointed out that with stable fixation, weight bearing active muscle function enhances local circulation, shortens the period of osseous callus formation and remodeling. So again, this comes as no surprise to us. So having talked about frame fixation, I'm now gonna to talk to you a little bit about the method. What do we know about the method? Well, we know unfortunately most of it from uh, the animal labs in Kurgan again, where there was an awful lot of local dogs were subjected to treatment and euthanized, 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 in order to uh, assess their osteotomy techniques. And they did a variety of osteotomy techniques, including an open transverse osteotomy, uh, a jiggly saw type osteotomy, and various degrees of fixation from fairly minimalist fixation to more rigid fixation, and looked at it. So the experimental evidence, they showed that the stability of the bone fragment fixation was important. Having near far biomechanical constructs helped the degree of damage at the osteotomy to the bone marrow. So the more open your osteotomy and the more bone marrow, it's, it's a bad thing. The rate of distraction is very important. And they did show that if you do daily distraction, it's not as good as doing four times a day, which in turn is not as good as doing a motorized 60 times a day distraction. So uh, the rate of a millimeter a day is probably better than one and a half and better than that. The rhythm, as I say, is up to 60 times a day on a motorized machine showed a lot better. So most people these days distract three or four times a day in the femur. 
which seems to be a reasonable rhythm, but actually higher frequencies of smaller distractions may actually be more beneficial. But that requires motorized units. This is Elizabeth's classic corticotomy where he tries to leave the medullary blood supply intact by going down both sides with an osteotome, then rotating it to crack the posterior cortex, and then doing this two-point thing and hoping you don't get a spike up the back. De Bastiani modified this with multiple drill holes and osteotomes going all the way across. And of course, there's jiggly sore osteotomies, which can be quite terrifying until you've got used to them, which you'll all have done in the Kodaba labs. Uh, which produced the best bone? Well, again, at Stanmore, we had a look at these different types of osteotomy, comparing the classic de Bastiani with uh, the jiggly sore. And we actually showed there was no real difference, but they were both most deficient over the anterior cortex, the tibia, which is no surprise because we tend to make the small incision there, thus devascularizing the very anterior thickest bit of cortical bone. So we may work on altering our technique. What about applications of the Lizard method? We can use it for fracture management, deformity correction, limb lengthening, treatment of infection, management of bone defects, and treatment of non-union. And these are the bread and butter indications for we at the BLRS, who, let's face it, are often known as frame surgeons and circular frame surgeons at that. But actually, fracture management, well, this would be the classic bread and butter of an Elizorov surgeon, and most of my colleagues will be bouncing them down and talking about sticking a couple of rings there, a couple of rings there, coordinating it with the plastics. But actually, more modern management with anterolateral fly fl thigh flaps and immediate intermedullary nailing, the evidence out there is that this is a worthy technique with less patient dissatisfaction, less infections, better outcome for knee and ankle joints. So we may be dinosaurs if we insist on putting frames on all open fractures and refusing to look at the benefits of what are often described as filthy shin rods. Deformity correction, well, that's the basic principles of deformity correction course that Hemant Sharma has been running. And of course, you take this sort of thing. This is a hypertrophic non-union, which is ununited with two planes of deformity. So we know this is an oblique plane with oblique plane translation and shortening and possibly infection, who knows? And the classic thing to do is what happened to this patient, i.e., we pull on that hypertrophic non-union until it becomes straight. The soft tissue in the gap becomes so rigid that it calcifies, leading to bone, and you can remove the frame without any internal treatment whatsoever. So again, this is this is classic Ilizarov treatment of deformities. But there are other ways of treating deformities. This is a post-fracture deformity with significant shortening and valsagous angulation following a road traffic accident. Uh, and what you can do these days is you can correct the easy to correct all the parameters of that deformity with redo intramedullary nailing, except the shortening. So why not do both? Correct the parameters of deformity using an interoperative hexapodal frame, and then correct the length postoperatively using an intramedullary lengthening implant such as the precise nail. And that's exactly what happened here. As all the other parameters of deformity corrected, a retrograde nail, obviously going retrograde gives us more scope for correction of angulation. And then you correct the length subsequently, and the patient goes away happy, united, and the correct length and the correct alignment. So you don't need an Elizarov frame to apply Elizarov deformity analysis and the Elizarov method of tension stress effects and the growth and regeneration of tissues. They are separate things. What about bone defects? Well, this is where it gets pretty wild. Uh, this is a broken old K nail. Is it okay now? Is that an old Gross Kempf? No, it's, yeah, it's Gross Kempf original. Uh, and what you can do is this sort of ridiculous thing where you take the old nail out, has a retrograde nail sticking up from the knee. We compress at the non-union site and distract here. Now, the problem is when you start distracting, you're going to pull the nail in, pull the nail down until it gets too close to the fracture site. So what you do is use extra length of nail such that it sticks up into the, into the muscles above the hip by several centimeters, then as you distract, it comes and lengthens down whilst this is being actively compressed. If you look at the pin spread here, you'll notice these pins are becoming divergent as there is compression here. And these ones are being pulled apart as you compress the fracture site until you get out to the correct length. Then you just lock your frame off and leave it to consolidate without a frame on. This is what we call a nail and rail technique. Uh, and we published this in, uh, the BJJ a few years ago.
Hospital, Alex Vriss and team, uh, co-author Johnny Wright, who's one of our colleagues at Stanmore, who started doing some really ridiculous things with twin plates and using a segmental transport technique by transporting a segment of bone from here all the way down, getting rid of this cement block and reconstructing a femur using a precise nail within an envelope of two plates. And they wrote up the first three that they did, all of whom have been successful. So basically the purpose of this was to talk about the Elizaroff method in terms of the biological thing and note how it can actually be adapted to using different types of hardware. But there is very little high quality research about clinical outcomes. And the Elizaroff method is indeed very powerful, but it doesn't always need a circular frame. So I'll stop there and I'll hand you back to Hemant and apologies again for not being there. Thank you so much. Um, any questions? Right, so, so a couple of things. Uh, we'll be breaking for lunch and uh, uh, for the internet uh, uh, people who logged in YouTube and Facebook, uh, our lunch starts at 12.30 to 1.30, but we hopefully be able to back a little bit early. So please keep, uh, uh, stay logged in. And uh, uh, for our the de delegates here, we're going to go out for lunch in a minute. Yes. So, so we should start to try, start to, try to start at 1 o'clock, maybe a little bit early if possible. Yeah? Lunch is not ready, but it will be coming soon. <laughs> in the meantime, can you fill your evaluation?
Is it on? Normally my voice is, oh, there we are. Now I'm definitely on. So yes, come forward, make it, take advantage of being here in the room and engage with the speakers. Otherwise you might as well be pretending you're dialing in from, on your journey home. Okay. session. Um, our first talk this afternoon is from D Dorai Nyagam, who has got great experience with medial submuscular plating. Those of us who are on the course, hopefully you had opportunity to at least see today in the cadaver lab. It's also on the video and it's Dorai who filmed that because he's got a you know, so fabulous experience and understanding of, of plating in this area. Thank you, Dorai. Everyone okay? So, um, as an introduction to uh, the whole symposium of external fixator-assisted uh, procedures, um, we need to just take a little step back in history to realize that the Elizroff method, the Elizroff fixator, really came into the West as a consequence of the Italians visiting, uh, visiting the uh, Siberian unit. And it was really in the early 80s uh, that the, the actual technique came over. And the method and the fixator has coexisted with many evolutions of techniques that have occurred since the 1980s. So the Italians, uh, much to the consternation of the original Elizarov people, started to add half pins to the fixator and term it, termed it as advanced Elizarov. It's just another form of fixation. And then subsequently, we obviously had the Americans introducing the hexapod as an alternative to building hinges and motors. And more recently, we've seen uh, internal fixation implants featuring more and more in deformity correction. Uh, custom uh, devices like lengthening nails, and there have been many evolutions of lengthening nails. Uh, and as this afternoon's symposium will uh, reveal to you, the use of internal fixation implants in conjunction with external fixators to achieve deformity correction. Now I'm going to present uh, on medial submuscular plating, which is a technique need. Uh, one of the presentations I will give later is about plating after lengthening, and I discovered during the evolution of my experience in plating regenerate after lengthening in the femur, it was that the, the plate uh, would occasionally fail when applied on the standard lateral surface of the femur. So it was a little research into looking at why did the plate fail when I used the plate on the lateral side that led me to understand that in those situations, it's the medial side that is advantageous for the plate. So my first slide really is to uh, explain why plating the medial side of the femur, which in your standard trauma training tells you it's the wrong side because it's the compression side, and your anatomical training will tell you horrifically you shouldn't be there because there are some big vessels uh, on that medial side. So let's just look at some simple plate biomechanics. Let's just take a femur that has a transverse fracture in the mid shaft. And we know that you can summate the effective forces on weight bearing by using the mechanical axis as the resultant force that goes through the femur on weight bearing. And we all know from the last few days that there is a difference between the anatomical and the mechanical axis. And the mechanical axis represents that sum of forces that go through. So as a consequence of that, if we have a transverse fracture and we weight bear that unsupported transverse fracture, we have a bending moment created because of that obliquity of that mechanical axis. Right, that bending moment creates tensile forces on the lateral surface, 
and correspondingly compression forces on the medial surface. So that's something that takes us back to early biomechanics. So if we apply a plate under compression on the tension side, we create a tension band. And what does that tension band simply does is applied on weight bearing on the lateral surface. Because of that compressive plate, it alters the forces across that fracture site to compression. Okay, so that's the tension band principle, and that's why we're taught by the uh, trauma courses, including the AO, about compression sur uh, tensile surfaces and compression plates. You need to remember some historical context to this. Compression plating was very much used when primary bone healing was the objective of internal fixation. And now primary bone healing has been relegated to even smaller and smaller areas in fracture healing. It, doesn't, it hasn't disappeared completely, but it's, it's relegated to a smaller role. So let's leave that for a moment and see what happens if we were to apply a compressive plate on the compression side. What would happen? Well, as you know, the oblique mechanical axis would subject this plate to compression. And as a consequence, you don't have that compressive effect across the fracture side. And that is why you're taught the right place to put a plate across the femur, if you have a transverse fracture, is on the tension side. If, however, you apply a plate on the medial side under compression, and because of the same effect, you get gapping on the lateral surface. So that is why, in a transverse fracture, it's the wrong side to put the plate on the medial side. Now, I'm going to ask you to leave this and consider what happens when you have a defect. It's totally different if you have a defect or you have a medial cortex that is unsupported, a gap on the medial cortex. If you have the same mechanical axis, the same bending moments applied across that plate on the lateral surface, you cannot achieve that tension band principle. That tension band principle only works if there is contact across that side. So if you have a defect, that compression is not created across the regenerate. If, however, you place in a defect the plate on the compression side, what you benefit from is that you have resistance to the plate on the lateral side failing as a consequence of being exposed to bending stresses. Do you follow me? When you have bending stresses as a consequence of that, the plate on the lateral side will be subject to bending forces because there is no contact unlike that transverse fracture. So that plate will be subject to failure. Whereas if the plate is placed on the medial side in a defect, that doesn't happen because that plate is virtually in line with the mechanical axis and it, it is not subject to bending forces. So, in situations of a defect, in situations of high comminution, where you cannot get the contact, there is a biomechanical advantage of placing the plate on the medial side. And this study that I've uh, referenced was published in the 1980s and almost forgotten plates were failing under, after lengthening when placed on the lateral side of the femur that I discovered this reference. And if you're interested, please have a read. Uh, they actually verified that the plate is on the lateral side. Is your surface landmarks are to use the origin of sartorius, the anterior inferior ilex spine, and the medial edge of the patella. That gives you an approximate line of the medial edge of rectus femoris. So 
draw that line out. To identify the two incisions, you can sometimes use an x-ray to delineate where the lesser trochanter is and about 10 centimeters distal to that lesser trochanter would be your first incision and your second incision will be on the medial side of the femur over the femoral condyles. So you can also use surface markings of two finger breaths from the anterior inferior alex spine. Right. You can see here that I have wrapped the fixator in a uh, sterile swab that's usually soaked in some alcoholic chlorhexidine to, so that I can create not an aseptic feel but at least uh, an antiseptic feel in terms of the fixator and so that the operative feel is clapped away from the external fixator. When you've made the first incision, you need to recognize that you will have neurovascular structures. But the neurovascular structures you will encounter are not the femoral artery or the femoral vein, but branches of the lateral circumflex femoral artery. And I'll show that to you in a little while. Here you are. That is the structure that you need to be aware of, you need to identify, and you need to mobilize. The descending branch of the lateral femoral circumflex is often accompanied by some branches of the femoral nerve feeding the vastus muscles. You will see them and you need to dissect them and move them apart. Now, in a dissection of a neurovascular bundle to, dissect, to move it away safely, that's your approach to the humerus. So that skill should be within your grasp to do in the femur. If you do a posterior approach to the humerus, you would need to identify a nerve and a vessel and mobilize it out of the way. Same here. So there are three branches of the lateral femoral circumflex, the descending, the transverse, and the ascending. You will only see the descending. You may see the transverse if you want to reach the lesser trochanter or even more proximal, but generally you'll only see the descending. Right, so before you start the procedure and make your incision, the one thing you must do is under x-ray control, back off your external fixator pins so that they are no more than flush with the medial cortex because you're planning to slide a plate along the medial surface of the femur. And so if these external fixator pins are still protruding beyond the medial cortex, they will interfere with the sliding of your plate. So before you start, just back them off a little bit so that they are just flush with the medial cortex. So here is the incision. Skin incision through fascia reflect the fascia keep the skin edges viable. You will see, you will look for the interval between rectus femoris and sartorius. How do you identify this interval? Simply by flexing the knee and see which muscle tightens up. Rectus will tighten, sartorius won't tighten. So that's one way. The other way is to look at the direction of the fibers. One is oblique, and one is straight vertical. So there are two ways to identify that interval. Rectus femoris is often covered by its own envelope of fascia. The next step of the procedure is not to go down the interval between the two, but to identify the two muscles and then to open that separate envelope of rectus fascia, because that allows you to get into that envelope and retract the rectus muscle laterally, very safely. So you're well away from the neurovascular bundle. And that is the next step of the procedure. Open the fascia of rectus femoris, find the medial edge of rectus femoris and retract rectus femoris laterally. Now, when you retract rectus femoris laterally, you will see the undersurface of the fascia because you've opened the fascia from the superior surface and you're now on the undersurface of the fascia. And through that fascia, you will see some nerves and a vessel. 
and that is the descending branch of the lateral femoral circumflex and some femoral nerve branches to the vasti. This step is where you need to, and this is a picture showing it a little bit more clearly, you can see some vessels descending with some nerves, so you open that fascial layer longitud longitudinally, I would palpate and identify where the femur is. So you can see that I've, uh, oh it hasn't appeared yet, uh, sorry. There should be, yes, I think there is a superimposed shadow of the femur on the image. So palpate where the femur is because that can guide you which way to mobilize the artery and the vessels. If you find the anterior surface is a little bit more medial, then you would mobilize the descending branch and the nerves laterally. If you find the anterior surface of the femur is a little more lateral, then you would mobilize the artery and the, ves the nerves medially. So feel where the femur is, because you want to head to the top of the femur, the center of the femur. So by taking the vessels to one side, underneath the vessels will be vastus intermedius. Just split vastus intermedius and you get to the anterior surface of the femur. That allows you to enter the safe extra periosteal, develop that plane medially, and now you are on the medial surface of the femur. So this approach is an approach to the anterior surface so that you enter the correct plane and then you develop the plane medially to get to the medial side. This then allows you to slide some scissors gradually along the medial surface, walk it along the medial surface and create a track following the line of the femur down probably to the distal two-thirds of the femur. Obviously you can't get all the way to the bottom. And that's where you leave this approach and then go on to the distal side. So the surface markings, for those of you with me the other day on the dissecting room, are the width of the condyles and the mid-shaft of the femur. So the middle of the width of the condyles to the mid-shaft of the femur distally, you make an oblique incision. And that oblique incision will allow you to enter uh, underneath the superficial fascia, the muscles beneath, which is vastus medialis. Distally, you need to identify the free edge of vastus medialis. That's a key uh, point in the dissection. When you identify the free edge of vastus medialis, sharply dissect that free edge and lift the vastus medialis anteriorly. That will expose the fibers of the vastus medialis coming from the medial intermuscular septum. Just keep separating the fibers as they come from the medial intermuscular septum, and that should allow you very nicely to get to the entire medial surface of the femur. You can use this same for applying a plate on the medial side of the femur. From this, you create a tremor incision. Thank you very much, Dry. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions, but we'll take them in a, a group at the end of the session. So um, we're going to set up now for a talk on indications for plating. Um, we kind of pride ourselves, really. We know that a lot of the workhorse of what we do uh, is frame fixation, but we're, we're open-minded, and uh, we, we do feel that there are many ways, and patients will often prefer plating or nails, um, or a, as uh, Daria has described, a combination to reduce your time in frame. We'll just get everything set up now. Right, so I'm Hemant Sharma, and I think I've met m most of you during the course. And what I'm going to talk about is about the surgical technique for the uh, plates uh, after the, you have corrected the deformity with the fixator in the femur and tibia. Now, this is the downside that following Durai, that he always does his thing so well, 
So I can promise you my talk will not be as good as his, right? But hopefully I'll be able to give you some salient, uh, uh, some salient features. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some steps as, as I do it, and that doesn't mean that is the only way. There are a number of ways people do it differently. You, everybody finds their own technique. And in my technique, I do it this way, and I feel it uh, comfortable. And uh, any problems, tips, and tricks we'll be discussing later on in the end of the talk. So therefore, I will not be talking about them in, the, in this talk. So let's start with the position. A very simple thing. Uh, patient needs to be supine, obviously, because we're doing uh, generally all the things we need to do, we will do it, uh, which is uh, all the approaches are easier than supine. We need to put a sandbag. Now, we need to be sure that sandbag means the idea is that patient's knees facing forward. So when you're putting on any device, although you can control the rotation by the fixator, but still, patella facing forward gives you the alignment how we are used to see a leg and how we fix the leg. So just be careful because if the sandbag is too big, then patient can tilt. And if it tilts, that's fine with that. But you need to put a support on the other side so patient doesn't slide off the, off the sandbag. So, so that is important. You should have a, either a pelvic table, which is totally radiolucent, or if you're going to put a st standard table, then the longer end should be at the bottom. And make sure before you scrub, that the radiographer is there and they can check the hip under x-ray. Because sometimes what happens is that you can't see the hip and then your long leg alignment is not possible and you struggle. And sometimes if you really get stuck, then what you can do, can do is you can tilt the angle a little bit. It, it's not good for, for a lot of things, but for alignment it's fine because once you tilt, your table is finishing here, you tilt it and then you can move a little bit more. So that way you can get the alignment just in case we get stuck, but this should be checked well before uh, you scrub. You should put the intensifier in a way so the lateral comes under the table, right? So it's easier, otherwise if it comes on the top of the table, it's always been your way, right? So do that so image intensifiers should come under the table. And before you do anything, we are just to, is there, to remind you that osteotomy rules are critical here because we often don't do the osteotomy at the desired site or the cora or the apex of the deformity, which basically means that you will end up some obligatory translation. And therefore, it is very important that we uh, remember the osteotomy rules and pre-plan it. How do you do it? It's actually quite simple few steps. You put a ring or fixator whatever you're, you, you're using, align it to each respective segments, right? Take your time, because this is the critical bit. Align the each ring to its respective segment, and while you're doing that, you will also know where you're going to do your chorus, where you're going to do osteotomy. So mark that, and once you have aligned your frame, that's the most critical bit, because then you know, excuse me, that what you are, uh, uh, the how it will correct. Once you have done that, finish the osteotomy, check the alignment, do a temporary stabilization, means put in a plate or a nail, and check your alignment again, and then re, uh, recheck the alignment, and then finish your fixation. Because there's a tendency sometimes, and that too because I have done it, I put in a plate, finish the plate, and then realize I've slightly undercorrected it. And then you have to take the screws out and redo it. That's not, so if you're putting in a plate, put one screw on each side, Check the alignment again, then complete the fixation. If you're putting a pin and a wire or a half pin, put it opposite side of the plate and put proximal to it. In certain situations, you can do within the range, but stay away from the implant. So whatever implant you have decided to choose doesn't come in your way of your external and internal fixation. Right? And this is just an example from the top that how you align the fragment and if you see each ring there is your hinge there's a cora uh, and there's a hinges there this is aligned to the distal segment this is aligned to proximal now you may align it to anatomical axis in femur or mechanical axis doesn't matter but what you correct has to be the mechanical axis 
So if you're doing anatomical, you will end up some translation. You have to overcorrect it because the axis, what you're looking for is the mechanical axis correction. And there's the same view from the side. And what you have done is, I've left this space for putting in a plate. So two-third ring distally, two-third proximally will give you enough space to put your plate, whichever side you're going to do in, medial or lateral, whichever side plate you put in. So how I do it, so, so this is the leg, and I start marking things. This is my joint line. This is my distal end of plate, which I've decided which I'm going to go under X-ray control. Then this is the, my osteotomy site. It may, may not be at the Cora. Is, osteotomy site is where I have enough segment to put in uh, enough screws or fixation to stabilize the distal segment. So it may, may not be at the apex of the deformity. And then I've decided that I'm going to go, have a six hole plate, but just in case if I get things wrong, I've also marked the eight hole plate so that I have a bit of a, a leeway in my fixation. Then you put two two third rings and you put it in a way because the medial side you don't want to impinge, so this goes proximally, and this you want to leave the space on the lateral side to put your plate on because this is a varus deformity. Then what you need to do is, uh, to, 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 you need to plan it in a way, check it on the, uh, on the leg before you go ahead. So put it on, check it under intensifier, and one of the things about fixator-assisted internal fixation is that don't rush because you only get one chance to do it. Once the patient comes out, post-operative, the first time. So, so, so let me run through this example of, of a 17-year-old or 19-year-old when he was young. And he had type uh, four injury of the distal femur, and he ended up with some deformity, and this is a result of, previous, of the previous fixation. So this is the planning, now this is my hinge, this is I planned it, I marked my uh, plate where it's going to go, I marked my joint, I marked my plate, and or, so everything what you plan, now the, uh, on the medial side, pins are on the medial side because I'm going to put the plate on the laterally, so you plan it accordingly and then get it, uh, so you have clear space and full access to what you want to do. And the, the, this is not from this patient, this is a different patient. So again, just to, uh, just to remind you that, uh, sorry, it's gone, yeah. So this is the picture, so this is, you see, this is, an, uh, uh, this is the valgus deformity, and you only need the hinge. Now, if you put the hinge, it will automatically translate and get you what you get what you want. You do not have to translate it uh, manually. So, as I showed you before, to mark the axis of the each segment, each ring should be put, put, put perpendicular to each segment. Now, here what I've decided, I'm going to put the hinge at the convex side. So it's important you decide whether you're going to do a, a neutral hinge or opening wedge. Because if you're not doing an opening wedge, you might need some length, otherwise it will impinge. So putting your hinge at the convex side is very useful because what it does is it gives you, uh, it opens it up and with under intensifier control again to make sure that it is, your hinge is at the, at the right place. Then you put in the axis, this is a diathermy method. So you put your center of the hip to the center of the ankle, should pass from the center of the knee where you wanted it. You might put in the center of the knee, you might overcorrect it depending on the age, you might want to do HTO type of deformity correction if somebody is young. So there are many ways of doing it, but all has to be people has to be pre-planned. And this is the pre-op, this is the post-op, and oops. And so if you see, we have corrected the lateral axis to the center as we want it. So this is, so as long as we take our time, we do it, it's, it's quite, uh, it's reasonably straightforward, it's a bit fiddly, but the steps are important and consistently a plan is important. Now, I also use a navigation with it. Now, there is no separate platform available for it. All knee, all knee replacement companies make a platform for high tibial osteotomy, but uh, may, may not, but definitely they make it for a navigated knee replacement. You can use the same software. I use Bbron because that's in my hospital. No other reason for that. And here, what I've done is, is a patient where 
if you see, these are the, these are the markers for the navigation. And if you see, the pins are uh, on the medial side, uh, sorry, proximally, and on the medial side. And the medial side, there's a marker. So one marker, so one tracker is in distal segment. One tracker is the proximal segment. Now, what it does is it gives you an additional uh, uh, way to identify your access, uh, sorry, your mechanical access or your alignment and just helps you further. So this is a patient where we started with a, with a bit of virus and it says pre-cut mechanical access, so you know when it's pre and post. Uh, and you can check it actually on table, and then when you do that, you say, I'm going to put in slight valgus because I want to put the access not on the medial tibial spine, but in the center of the knee. So, or maybe slightly lateral. So it gives you an additional advantage and additional way to identify your access and, uh, and correct the deformity. And there's the same patient, we corrected it, and there's a, once you remove the fixator, it looks much cleaner and nicer. Right? So this is the final one. Now, I'm going to also introduce a unico assisted deformity correction. It's a unico is a unilateral, unicortical pin. And the advantage of that is that you can do nail and plate while it's on, because, it, sorry, nail, because it doesn't come in the way. So you don't, so you, you have slight more leeway. Now what it does is these angles are fixed, but you can change it to an extent. And I think, Dora, you tested it biomechanically, isn't it? Uh, initially when it was launched. And so there are, it all comes, the two types of uh, pin has got a cortical and a, and a cancellous thread. And this is something really nice, it's a torque limiter. So you can drill it, you cannot over drill it. It will only go that far and it, it will change the sound when you stop. The only caution is that in the cancellous bone, and when the bone is soft, it sometimes goes too much, and then you have to bring it back to the marker. So just a caution, but otherwise, it's, it's a lovely fixator. And, and in fact, we tested it uh, a while ago, and I think uh, me and Ross were operating, and it took us about between 12 to 15 minutes to put on the entire fixator. Because you don't have to mark the hinge, you don't have to place the hinge where you want, so it's an advantage because you could put the fixator very quickly, so it saves you a lot of time uh, if you ha have at your disposal. And this is what comes in everything pre-packed, single use, right? And everything, so it's, it's actually one of the other way to, easy way to use it. The advantage, as I said, you can, uh, you can ream it, you can nail it, anything with the fixator on. If you have a hip replacement, long stem, doesn't matter, because you put it on top of it and it's still be fine. It, it, it doesn't do that. Now, the only thing with the, as I said, that when the bone is soft, uh, you got to be careful, and because occasionally it can go in, so you have to pull it back. The second thing is, and this is absolutely crucial, we all have a tendency, we put in a pin and we do this, this looks good. Don't do that, it's a unicortical. If you do it, it will become loose. You have to reinsert the pin at a different place. So it's quite important, trust the fixator, put the four pins, lock it, and, and, and believe me, it stays. You can lift the leg with it, and it's quite stable. If you don't trust me, ask Mr. Nayagam, he has tested it bi biomechanically. So, 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 so this is a patient. Again, an example is a valgus deformity, as you can see. And the idea would be to, uh, uh, to fix it as an internal fixation. This is a planning that this is going to do. And uh, so again, as usual, I mark every leg to see how I'm going to do it. Uh, this is the pin for the dome. And, and I've created the, my holes, and I left it as such. And then once I've done that, I think we, we, we did it in, in our group in the, uh, yesterday. So, so you put in a fixator, so you do this, take the pin out, and then put in your fixator. This is an example how to do the dome. And once you have done that, you put a fixator, then complete the osteotomy, because then it will be stable and you can control it much better. I'm, I'm sorry about this picture. Only I realized when I projected it that I should have cleaned the leg. So my apologies for that. But, <laughs> But as you can see, I put in a fixator, and once I put in a fixator, I've checked the alignment with the, uh, with the diatomy. I still also have a navigation here. here. So the trackers for navigation, so I check with both. And then once I've got it straight, what you do is you can lock it. And how to check it? Put again, center of the knee, center of the 
ankle and should pass from the center of the knee where you intended to correct it. If you translate it, you have to do it manually because there is no mechanism as in hinges to, to do it. So you have to manually translate it. So, uh, the, uh, so, the, so this is the finished product in the sense that once you, have, uh, once you have finished it, all you have to do is put this rod and just, uh, uh, just tighten it, it will hold. The difference is hinge is a constraint uh, correction as, uh, um, uh, as Mikhail explained this morning and Unico is unconstrained correction, so you need to be slightly careful with it because it can do a little bit more than you intended. So just be slightly careful about it. Once you've done it, you check your axis, put in a plate, and this is the pre-op, it comes the post-op there, and there's your axis, and this is the final pictures. So it's a, another way for you to another device in your ornamentarium to, to do this if you're touching the stem. So it's a, it's, a, it's a lovely device uh, from that point of view. And again, as I showed, you, you can nail it through the, when the fixator is on. So just a quick word about the T-bill plating, and then I'm, I'm finished. So T-bill plating, so this is an example. I, we, uh, we did actually, actually two weeks ago, actually, because I thought I should have some example properly uh, do it. I don't have the, the, that good pictures. So, if you plan it, so if you see your axis is, if you plan it from the tibia, your, your, your apex of the deformity is there. It's about five degrees of virus. But since he's young, I really want to correct it to the lateral tibial spine. So I'm going to correct the deformity plus doing H2 at the same time. So when you plan it that way, suddenly you, your deformity increases to 10 and your apex of the deformity is actually moved up. So, when you correct the leg, your bone segment is important, but whole leg is important actually as well. So you need to plan it so your axis is corrected that way. So, so like we, the, the issue is the hinge is 60 millimeter proximal from your osteotomy site. We, we, we have measured it and we decided that. So what you do is you have to shift the hinge proximally that far so your hinges at the apex of the deformity, and it will automatically translate. So you do that, plan the hinge, and then all you have to do is uh, put on the fixator, and once you put on the fixator, you can just align each ring to, to its rest, and, and, and once you have done that, you can, you, you, you can finish your osteotomy and correct it. So I didn't use the navigation, so this is it might hinge back and I might lose a bit of my correction because there's a tendency for sometimes for uh, a, a little bit of uh, uh, rebound because the, if you don't have a plate stiff enough and you use a standard uh, locking plates from any company, the way they the designed, they're very good for fractures. But when there is a muscle forces, they can be a little bit difficult and there's a slight tendency of rebound in them. So you've got to be slightly careful in those. And this is the uh, picture, we two plates in there, and this is the pre-op picture, and this is the post-op, and this is the axis. And, and this is what we planned, and this is what we achieved. Maybe a couple of millimeters or less translation that I intended, and that is because I probably didn't put my hinge properly. If I put my hinge properly, it would have done that much. And I'm probably a couple of millimeters less than I originally intended. So that's, so that's the importance that you need to put your hinge properly. And on, in theater, it looked fine, so we left it. But we, we, actually, we did try to manipulate it in, uh, and with, with extra support. So steps would be, so your pre-op checklist is you need to plan. And planning you need to do is you need to look at where you're going to correct it, where your osteotomy is, and how much translation you're going to get. And from, and from there, you need to look at it, that where will the fragments go, what implant you're going to use, all that is pre-planning. Then you look at it, what I'm going to use my nail or a plate, and how big is the jig, where I'm going to put my external fixator, will it come in each other's way? If, and if you're not sure, then take a saw bone and plan it and play with it and then do it. Because some, uh, 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 some j j jigs are compatible in the sense they don't come in each other's way and others do. 
When you start with surgery, any translation, then perhaps it's a good idea. Where you do it is a bit different. A lot of people do it distally, although it's, uh, it's if you do proximally at the, uh, not far away from the osteotomy, translation becomes a little bit easier. Uh, then pre osteotomy, apply your x -fix, complete the osteotomy, and then put on your plate. Put in your plate, put two screws, one on each, each segment, recheck your alignment, and if it's still fine, complete your fixation. If you're in the, there's a slight tendency of, of rebound at times. To summarize, uh, what I would say is that principles what you learned in the last three days is critical. The idea of the last three days is that so you be in a position to assess all this and you do not create a secondary deformity. That's the principal aim of, of the course. Pre-planning is absolutely crucial in terms of your implant, in terms of where you're going to do it, the translation, the neurovascular structures, how much acuity you're going to correct it, you're going to release the nerves. There's a lot of things, all the things that Gavin told this morning are, are, are very, very critical. And if you don't get it right, that's it. There's no second bite at the cherry. Thank you so much. And just to speak to your orthofix wrap nicely, I'm sure they'll help you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, I hope you're all keeping your questions in your head because I've got too many to keep in mind already. Um, I think one th point that I really want to emphasize is the putting your plan on the theatre wall because these cases of us have had that thing before. They've seen the... And everyone's, what? Oh, I thought we'd finished. Um, so I think if people know in advance the steps, and we'll hopefully remind you if you miss any out, the classic is the fibular osteotomy. Do that at the beginning, because getting to the end and trying to do a fibular osteotomy through a frame is challenging. OK, now we've got Paul Harwood, who's going to talk to us about uh, fixator-assisted nailing. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think the nice thing about this, or the, the nasty thing, is that pretty much everything I'm about to say has already been said, which is at least it sort of confirms to me that maybe I'm doing the right thing. But um, I'm going to talk about um, operative technique for a fi uh, fixator assisted nailing for deformity correction. Um, the focus is really going to be on operative technique. It's my experience, and as, as Hemant said, it's my technique and it, it's general principles. But I'm very much going to illustrate what I do with a case. So I'll run through a case and, and show you what I did and why. Um, I've got a couple of further case examples, which are much briefer if we've got time, but if we don't get to them, it's not, it's not a problem. There is no science in my talk. Uh, there is no evidence. It's just my anecdote and what I've been taught by my um, educators over the years. <clears throat> there are some applied mathematics, but you've already learned the mathematics that go with it, I think, as this was the course. So we'll start with the case. This um, is a patient that was referred to me a couple of years ago when... Um, well, you'll see why in a minute. But she'd had a um, very, very difficult time as a young uh, lady in her sort of late teenage years. She'd had a very uh, horrific road traffic accident, multiply injured. She's got a sciatic nerve injury actually on the other side than the one in question. She's got bilateral femoral fractures. She had burns on one side. So she'd had a really, really tough time of things. And she was now in her sort of early 30s. And um, she'd had this injury in her femur uh, on the right-hand side. And the, one of the surgeons who'd been caring for her in a, in a unit nearby to us decided for reasons that are not quite clear still to remove this femoral nail due to um, concerns that she might need a hip replacement in later life. But anyway, it, it wasn't really clear why it happened. And unfortunately, during that procedure, this happened. So it, they had a somewhat bad day at the office. Again, I've not quite got to the bottom of how that happened. I think they maybe didn't remove one of the locking bolts when they were trying to remove the nail, but for whatever reason, she suffered this sort of comminuted distal femoral fracture intraoperatively, and it was stable. To do so seems reasonable. I'm not sure it's an implant I would have chosen for that. Um, and following this, she was kept, despite that, this was the outcome. Yeah, so you can see it's, the fixation has failed. There's, loss of gross loss of position of this fragment tilting the fragment into valgus yeah and this is where she was left so she was referred to me at this point um these are standing alignment views and we have some 
clinical photographs that she's, um, she's aware we're using. She provided the pictures. Um, so she's got pretty significant valgus, and we'll come on to look at that in more detail in a minute. She had knee pain, she's got leg pain. At this point, she had a non-union, I think, at that level. But her um, operative management was somewhat delayed due to her becoming pregnant and not wanting surgery while she was carrying a child, and then COVID. So actually, you'll see that by the time we treated her, it had actually partially united. Um, so this is where we started from. So I'm going to run through some of the pretty talk about and so on and so forth. I'm really going to talk about the principles of the surgery and, and what we did. The first thing I'd say is I think the most important thing um, when using, when correcting any deformity, but particularly when one is using internal fixation, is to do all of the things that we've learned in the course this week. And so it's, it's absolutely critical to define the deformity. And I would say that deformity planning is, is probably just as important, but I would say it's probably even more important when using internal fixation. I, I have to say, one could, if uh, you're of this mindset, come into theatre, put a hexapod on without checking the deformity and probably correct it. I wouldn't recommend it because you'll miss deformities and you may create um, unintended problems for the patient, but you can't do that when you're using internal fixation. You have to have, a, in my mind, a very clear plan of what you're going to do at each step. So I'll go ahead and talk about this. So here is something that hopefully you'll be familiar with. So we define who they're projecting. And then we do our standard deformity planning, as you've learned. Reveals a deformity in her distal femur. And then we move on and look at that in more detail. So I won't bore you with talking about how to draw the lines, because hopefully you've seen that. So we looked, we felt there was probably a um, significant deformity in her distal femur with the cora just proximal to the new fracture, measured 17 degrees. But actually, at that point, we noted She's got a pre-existing deformity at a slightly more proximal level from her original injury. And so I think the deformity is probably better uh, characterized by a third line. And you should hopefully be familiar with those things from what we've done. So we think that probably is a reasonable estimation of the deformity for this patient. Yeah. Any, everybody happy with that? Yeah. So we've done that lots of times already, haven't we, this week? So just as you would with a, a correction using an external fixation, but again, I think there's, a, there's more nuance and detail perhaps to it when you're going to use internal fixation. So go on and plan very carefully how we're going to do the correction and how we're going to stabilize the, the corticotomy when we've done it. So you see here I've used some deformity planning software to define the deformity and plan the correction. So this was actually slightly cheekily probably using the hex ray software which is very good, um, with no intention of ever putting a hex pod on it, but we allow you to draw the lines that's designed for that method. But you can see this is the correction that um, was defined by the software with the planning that I had done. The pink line which I've added, which you can see here, is actually a mechanical axis that just cut the bottom of her foot off on the screen that I grabbed it from. I didn't have a big enough screen on my laptop that it had let me show the whole thing while I captured it in both planes or actually in three dimensions. So this is where I felt her correction should be to correct her axis, looking at the deformity as I had defined it. One thing that was important at this point was that um, we discussed this at some length and she was really keen to avoid an external fixator and we were planning to manage this using an instrument delivery device and we've actually, so what we've done is we've defined an a single osteotomy at that original resolution cora, but we'll come back to that. So that may have implications for how we can manage things later if we're going to use internal fixation. It has less implications if we were going to manage this with external fixation, but we haven't forgotten about the second level of deformity, but that's why we've planned it with a single osteotomy here. Then it's important to go on and plan the fixation, think about how we're going to stabilize the um, bone once we've corrected the um, deformity. And we need to think really carefully about how those implants are going to work, not only um, in terms of them biomechanics, as we've heard a lot about already, but also about how you're actually going to get them into the bone, if that makes sense, and get them to sit in the correct place, and what effect they may have on the operation that you're doing. So here we can see again, come back to the plan that you've already seen. 
And I'd like to put an intermediary device retrograde from the knee. I'd like to put a long device in. I don't want to put a short nail in because of the problem she's already faced. But this, you can see, may well cause us a problem. So we can already see that probably partially because of the translation and partially because of that second deformity, it may be that we can't introduce the nail. So that, that was something we were very aware of. I played around with the software a little bit, and by translating the osteotomy a little bit laterally, I thought there was a possibility that we'd be able to introduce the nail and get an acceptable position. And when we replanned and redrew a mechanical axis with that slightly, it will result in a slight undercorrection, it still appeared reasonable. It's important to note she does ha actually have some valgus on the other side from her other injury. And I also was keen to avoid creating a sort of windswept appearance. So I wasn't too worried if I undercorrected her a little bit at this point. We do have to be mindful, though, that in theatre, if we can't achieve the correction that we wish and treat this through a single corticotomy with an intermediary device, and she'd been warned of this, we may have to do a second osteotomy somewhere around the other level of deformity to accommodate the passage of the nail. Yeah? Make sense? And, of course, we're thinking about it in more than one plane. Yeah? So I didn't really foresee any particular problems in the sagittal plane. I think when I'm selecting implants for these sorts of procedures, it's, it's really important to consider their stability. When you're correcting deformities with implants, as um, the previous speakers have already said, you're asking bigger questions or different questions of those implants, really, than what they were probably designed for, which is fracture fixation. There are likely to be large deforming forces on the uh, bone when you correct the deformity acutely, particularly in uh, chronic or, or um, a sort of congenital conditions rather than an acute correction. It may also be, particularly if you're using a nail, that your fixation is less stable than usual. So if you think about our current situation, there is already a retrograde femoral nail in place, and that device will have damaged the bone. And when we remove that device, it wouldn't be there if you were nailing a fresh fracture. And that in itself will create instability to your construct. And it's very important to consider that. So I think you should try and select wherever you can if you're using a nail, implants with multiple uh, locking options. And some of these, we, we've had a device that gives you more confidence in getting the patient to weight bear earlier. Also have to really think hard about using adjuncts, and I'm going to talk briefly about polar blocking screws, which you hopefully will have familiarity with already, but also that's the way I think about it. Does that make and it, And the bone can drift across the nail on the locking bolts. What you've done is this, isn't it? And it blocks the, uh, the fixation moving. Here's a very quick example of something I did in clinical practice. Blocking screws top and bottom. So the other thing that we'd planned with this case is probably a blocking screw, maybe even an additional plate. Finally, think about how we're going to achieve and maintain the correction. We've seen this done yesterday, so our plan... And you can see that that plan looks quite like the plan which we had from our original deformity planning software, yeah? So only at that point do I come on to the operation. <laughs> so here we can see this is the young lady's leg. She's prepped and draped on the table, radiolucent table plan up on the wall, exactly as uh, people have said. I think it's really important you write the steps down. It's easy to forget things. This is us selecting the entry points for our um, uh, pins for the correction to lay out with the path of the um, new device we're going to put in. We actually chose to lose, leave the nail in place while we did this so that we knew that uh, we would leave a space for the trajectory of the new implant. Here you can see we've put those um, fixator pins in that will afford our correction. And here you can see the leg, clinical photograph of the leg. We've actually, uh, at this point, removed the um, device, hence the incision on the knee. Yeah? Here you can see what we've used here is a rotation block. So that actually lies at 10 degrees to the axis, which we will apply. I, I do this simply because I find it easier to put a pin in parallel to the joint than at 10 degrees. It saves me having to put a what marker wire in. You can do it immediately, partially united the two blocks of fixation onto the rail. And you can see that that's lying at that 10 degrees to give you a 
hopefully, correction into the anatomic axis. Yeah? And then, as uh, Hamant said before me, check your alignment. So here you can see we've used a diathermy cable, placed it on the hip, placed it at the center of the ankle, checking it's passing roughly through the center of the knee where we would wish our correction to be. We've, we've applied a little bit of translation on those pins as we've planned. Looks to be acceptable to our preoperative plan. Here we're looking, again, this is a slightly different thing. I'm running the wire along the anatomic axis to see whether I think I'm going to be able to put the, the, the retrograde femoral nail in as planned or whether we may have to do the second corticotomy. But I was pretty hopeful at this stage that actually this looked like it would accommodate a straight rod. Polar blocking screw being placed as planned. Guide wire has been passed beyond the, um, and we were quite pleased it did pass beyond. We quite carefully placed those sham screws, but it's, it's more difficult to tell at the proximal end. It's more difficult to get a lateral radiograph, but it passed fairly easily beyond there. But we were a bit concerned when we passed the large reamers up that they may clash with the pins, and so we backed them out so they became unicortical at that point, and it retained sufficient stability. Here we complete the fixation. I've actually, because it was quite a large opening wedge, don't really know if this is necessary. Because I, I'm concerned when we've got a big open approach like this, you won't get the autograph from the reamings. I've done a couple of these now where I've used a rear um, reamer simply to, to ream for the nail, but then you collect the graft and place it manually into the gap. So we've done that. So you can see that bone healing magic in the gap there. And as again, as we said, we've checked that fixation. It's maybe slightly lateralized from the actual mechanical axis. But we were fairly happy with that. We'll just come on to the post-operative. So these are the very relatively recent um, procedure. You see, she's delighted with the outcome. I beat myself up slightly that it wasn't quite as good as I wanted it to be, but she's very pleased. Um, she's only recently post-op, so I can't tell you whether it's going to go on and heal. I'll tell you next time. And you can see that our final result is very similar to the operation which we planned. So just to summarize those points, these are very generic um, messages to take away. Deformity assessment is absolutely critical in any of these cases, particularly when you're using internal fixation. Plan your correction, but also plan your fixation. Consider the stability of whatever construct you're going to use and consider that the demands placed upon it are likely to be greater than those or different to those in fracture management. Plan how you're going to achieve and hold the reduction. There's lots of different ways to do that. You've seen it done with a hexapod. You've seen it done with a hinge. But there's lots and lots of different ways to do it. And then execute the plan. And I think, I think it was Liz that said it. It's so important to have the plan in theatre and have the pictures up in theatre. And I write a list on the wall of the steps because it's really easy to forget something or miss something, forget to break the fibula and you're doing it inside the frame, forget to do some part of the operation and go back and check at each stage because there's lots and lots and lots of steps to it, particularly under the pressure of other things going on. It's very easy to miss them. Um, that is time, so I can stop there. There's some fairly boring typical examples, but I think that's the, the message. Well, well, we'll take some questions, and maybe we'll leave your examples with the questions you have the earlier speakers as well. We'll take some questions. So there was one which, uh, it's always nice when somebody puts a question that I'd already planned to ask, do I? Um, the plate removal, tell us about the challenges of plate removal from the medial femur. So, um, the approach is exactly the same as putting the plate in. Uh, the only difference is when you create the blunt track uh, that you do when you initially put the plate in, you actually recreate the blunt track over the surface of the plate. So you do the same approach and the, you extract the screws after you've recreated the blunt track. And quite simply, you insert a blunt osteotome or a, a very broad lever under the plate and tap it along the surface of the plate in the plate and the medial surface of the femur and you tap that from proximal to distal and from distal to proximal so you've loosened the plate from the outer surface and on the inner surface the final step is distally you lift the plate off the bone 
you take a bone punch and aim it into one of the screw holes and you just tap the plate out. That's how you take out uh, submuscular plates. Anyone, any uh, more questions? Thank you. I have a question to uh, Prof Sharma. Uh, the case that you showed the uh, tibial opening wedge, uh, why did you expect a translation at the osteotomy side? Was it away from the cora or uh, it was at the cora itself? Uh, this is something ongoing. Uh, one of my uh, very uh, pet r r research projects, because I'm a, I'm a great believer that angulation alone, because mechanical axis comes straight, angulation alone will have a compensatory effect. So in HTOs, or what all the knee surgeons do, you have a straight leg, you have done an HTO, you have created a deformity. Your leg, you nobody walks like that. Your mechanical axis comes straight. So when you do that, it has to compensate somewhere. And normally it's hind foot where it compensates. But because the foot and ankle specialty is different from a knee specialty, they see separately, nobody's actually see the whole leg. My strong belief is that in some HTOs it's fine angulation alone, but a lot of them should be done with the translation. Because if you translate, you can shift the access to the lateral tibial spine without compensating the hind foot or the ankle. Now, if hind foot may have a problem, arthritis, previous deformity, fractures, you may unmask the problem. So all my HTOs, I will translate because I firmly believe in this principle that uh, angulation in water, whenever you create an angulation which is not there, it has to have a compensatory effect. So that's because haven't you overcorrected? Yes. So that's the point. So because he's overcorrecting, um, rather than um, overangulating, this is right. Yes. There, angulate, uh, angular correction until the bone is straight to maintain ankle and foot mechanics, and then translate to achieve the overcorrection. Yes. So he's, he's translating it on purpose, if that makes sense. Even if it's as before. Yeah. Uh, so he's choosing because if you think about it, the, the correction will only put it straight, won't it? So your cora, your correction, you want to overcorrect. Yeah. You have to overangulate. Yeah. Yeah? yeah? And so if you come back to where the mechanical axis would be simply restoring the anatomy, but you don't want to do that, you want to go further, yeah. rather than overangulating, yeah. which will create a problem further down the limb, you translate to get that extra bit of correction, yeah? And the overcorrection always is, happens, as Paul pointed out, is because you look at that, there are two components of the, the deformity, static in the bone, what you can see, and is the dynamic, which is the wear in the medial compartment. If you take a non-weight-bearing x-ray to a weight-bearing x-ray, you have about two or three degrees of JLCA, which means that is a dynamic component, the deformity, only be obvious when you're weight-bearing. If you want to weight-bearing overcorrect and shift the axis, you will have to significantly overcorrect at times, not always, at times, to reach the lateral tibial spine or Fujisawa point. And therefore, translation is a, is a better way, in my view. Great question. Any more questions? No, I, I had a question about, both of you talked a lot about accidental unacute correction, it being a downfall, and I definitely I've experienced that. Do you routinely release fascia? Uh, this is something I've learned r recently f from Liz, and I think from all my future corrections, I will release the f future uh, fascia lat. Up till now, I wasn't releasing, actually. Now that they've both I said, I will from now on. <laughs> I've, got, I've got it recorded. <laughs> yeah, I think um, it, the, those tight, soft tissues really do fight. And I've definitely had it that I thought I had a brilliant correction and then the post-op just is not as satisfying. I think it's one of the things you have to warn your patients about pre-op. You know, we, we, can, we can do this many ways, you know, that whole informed consent. You can wear this big thing on your leg and it will take a long time, but I can get it so much more accurate uh, versus we can do it all in one go. It might not be quite as perfect. Sorry, you look like you're gonna put your hands up. Yeah. Question. Um, 
what are your indications for a dome osteotomy as compared to a routine osteotomy? Do you have like a certain times when you think, I would probably prefer a dome? So dome osteotomy is my cho osteotomy of choice, if I can do it. So that, if I can do it, I'll do that. The reason being, uh, it is very stable, the bony contact is fantastic, and it heals much better. And stability-wise, because an opening wedge, there is a way, there's a risk of non-union, and the, so if you have the, we generally tend to plate, put the plate on the tension side and the open side, so which means there is a bit of that. And that actually can cause problems if it's a delayed union, plate might break. So therefore, if I have my choice, all osteotomy, I will do a dome osteotomy. Can, can I just add to the comment of uh, loss of reduction uh, over XFIX assisted corrections? Um, there are two points I've noticed that could possibly lead to, when I do cases, that lead to a, a lack of loss of reduction. The first is you must have an ability to measure the correction that you've got. Now, uh, we've heard about sterile goniometers, but many of you might not be aware that some of the C-arms in your hospitals will actually have a module that allows you to measure directly off the screen. So you can actually, uh, and even the radiographers do not know that module can be action. In our unit uh, in Liverpool, it's the Philips C-arm that has that module, and we just literally uh, change our gloves, go up to the screen, and we can measure as if we were measuring it off trauma CAD or bone ninja. So that module, because that ability to check that you've got the correct or desired correction is important. The second mistake that I've made is when you're doing submuscular plating and you've got the X fix holding the correction, the temptation is to put the first two screws as non-locking to bring the plate down to the bone. When you do that, and if the plate is not perfectly contoured to the shape of the bone post osteotomy, and then you fill the locking screws in, when you take the fixator off, it will bounce back to the shape of the plate and you'll lose the reduction. So if you're doing uh, XFIX assisted correction with plating, and you find that when you apply the plate, it's not fitting exactly to the bone, just use all locking screws. So that's an internal fixator. No, I agree. I think this is one of the points I did not mention. It's very crucial that your first two screws on each side should be non-locking because they will hold the plate. Otherwise, you'll pull the plate and you will lose the translation which you have created. Yes, definitely. Just to carry on, to carry on from that point, it is an internal external fixator, so it doesn't have to be on the bone, which is why we specifically use the term internal external fixator. This is not plate fixation. Also about in terms of the osteotomy, you refer to the dome osteotomy. It's not really a dome. A dome is spherical in multiple planes. It's a barrel osteotomy, which is why you can only angulate in the plane of the dome that you're creating. But therein also, it gives stability to your angular correction. You can translate perpendicular, but you can't multi-angular it. Any more questions? No, I was just checking there's um, no more on the YouTube, but it's just people agreeing, so that's great. <laughs> Always good. Okay, so our next talk now derives back on to reinforce indications for and reasons for plating after lengthening. Techniques that you've heard so far have been largely the use of internal fixation in conjunction with external fixation, and this is another example. Um, the combination of using an internal fixation device with an external fixator that has been the driver for the lengthening process. Now, there have been other methods that have been described to facilitate this. Uh, you've lengthening then nail, and in some pieces of literature, plate after lengthening is referred to as lengthening then plate or LTP. I prefer the acronym PAL because it's actually patient friendly. 
These strategies are nothing more than strategies initially with the first objective to reduce external fixated time, but the second objective, which is probably more important, is it can all the transfixing structures that uh, occur when you use an external fixator, and if used for the appropriate cases, on the appropriate patients, it is actually a much more uh, cost-effective uh, alternative to using the much more expensive internal lengthening devices. The internal lengthening devices are great, but they have a cost prohibitive uh, issue in condo resources are, are important. Okay, so the concerns about uh, lengthening over nail and lengthening than nail have been really highlights that if there has been a previous infection then it is probably a high-risk procedure. And one of the difficulties that you have with lengthening over a nail is that the, both the entry cortex and the exit cortex of the external fixation to uh, improve of this is to try and use lengthening then nail so that you can extract some of the key, uh, some of the unnecessary external fixator pins and then insert a brand new clean nail uh, down into the canal. And it appears that that might have a smaller deep infection uh, issue, but there's a significant hardware pain related issue. So there are pluses and minuses to lengthening over nail versus lengthening then nail. So here is the alternative that I offer some of my patients, and I will explain where the indications are for using, offering this as an alternative to the patients. The key message I want to share with you is, yes, plating after lengthening also carries an infection risk, but you can modulate and alter that infection risk by positioning the plate as far away as you can from the entry cortex of your half pins, simply because your entry cortex of your half pins is probably your most contaminated part of the external fixator pin at the bone interface. And many of you have seen external fixator pin sites when it becomes an early acute osteomyelitis. It's usually the near cortex that gets affected first before the far cortex gets involved. So what is this technique uh, good for? Well, it's good for those cases where um, you have problems with the soft tissues coping with the lengthening process, or you've got problems with the bone forming well. So, for instance, in congenital longitudinal deficiencies, whether you do that in adults, sometimes they present as adults, but more often in children, in the femur, you, you have major soft tissue issues. So uh, as a consequence, by doing plate after lengthening, you get rid of the transfixing wires or half pins and allow the freedom to rehabilitate fully uh, without an external fixator being present. I mentioned about slow bone formers, classically polio, Turner syndrome, those cases when you're performing lengthening, you may want to consider substitution to internal fixation sooner. And there are also other indications you might want to consider these combination techniques. Uh, you might want to consider these techniques where you have a major long lengthening in an individual, something like seven centimeters or so, and that would take a long time for the regenerate to harden, and that could facilitate recovery if that was done as a plate after lengthening procedure. When I was practicing in the children's hospital, some children had to undergo lengthening at different stages, sometimes three times throughout their childhood. This would be a good way to lessen the impact of external fixator lengthening at each of those stages because most often the fixator stays on for about 10 to 12 weeks. Let me show you some clinical examples to highlight where we use plate after lengthening. So let's just start with the cross section of the tibia and look at the usual positions of half pins in the tibia. Anterior, anteromedial. And Obviously, a lateral submuscular plate will avoid being close to the entry portals of these half pins, and that is why 
it is my chosen position to use the plate on the lateral side rather than the medial side of the tibia. If, however, you're using wires, it's a bit more difficult because you've got medial face wires and you've got your transverse wires. So the strategy here would be to try to plate between two ring levels at the extreme proximal end of the tibia and at the extreme distal end of the tibia to have the plate inside the two fixation uh, points. This will allow you to avoid mixing the previous wire site with the plate as much as possible. Obviously, uh, in the tibia, to do this, you would then have to do your osteotomy in the mid-diaphysis and lengthen a little more slowly. Rather than a millimeter a day, I might perhaps go at 0.75 millimeters a day. That's not an issue because as soon as the lengthening is over, you're going to substitute the plate. So it's not going to be a much longer treatment time in the external fixator. Right, so here's your lateral submuscular plate. So here's a clinical example. You can see on the left image, we are starting the lengthening. We're progressing with the lengthening as we go on. And you can see that I have two ring levels quite far apart from each other to allow the plate to subtend that area in between. How do I do it? Well, you start by uh, removing all the unnecessary wires that would get in the way and just leave the wires that will maintain the length of the limb. Remember the regenerate now is almost like soft plasticine. You can actually uh, mold that, that regenerate quite easily. You make uh, uh, an incision about a centimeter lateral to the crest of the tibia. You notice that the fixator rings, like the example I showed you earlier in the femur, are wrapped up uh, with large pieces of gore, sterile gauze that have been soaked in alcoholic chlorhexidine to try and create uh, an antiseptic field in that area and an aseptic field in between. Even the rods that are connecting the fixators uh, are wrapped up. That's the incision in the fascia, and obviously when you make that incision in the fascia, you get tibialis anterior exposed. Using uh, your scissors, very sharply separate the tibialis anterior from the lateral surface of the tibia. And that allows you then to see the lateral side of the tibia, and you would then uh, use a pair of scissors to develop the track down towards the distal end of the tibia. Now, key note here is do not, do not be an orthopedic surgeon, be a plastic surgeon. Don't insert the scissors and open it wide. Why is that? The reason, and I will tell you, is that distally, not proximally, but distally, the deep perineal nerve and the anterior tibial artery come close to the lateral surface of the tibia and just very rough handling of the scissors and wide opening of the scissors can stretch that deep perineal nerve. And you could find your patient wakes up with a palsy. Why am I telling you this? Because I've made that mistake myself. So all you need to do is insert the scissors and open enough to have the width of the plate. And if you know how big your plates are, that's not very wide at all. Uh, another tip, Never close the scissors inside when you're spreading. Spread and bring the scissors out open because if you close it inside, you don't know what. Work and dissect onto the medial side of that, pull the muscle and create, similarly, a distal, a retrograde <coughs> submuscular tract with your scissors. And then you can slide your plate in and just like before on the femur, put your screws in under direct vision. So here's an example. Here, rather than using a, a, a wire fixator, I've used an LRS fixator, but I've placed this fixator anteriorly so that my plate will be away from the entry holes of the fixator half pins. Uh, we have the lengthening, we have the lateral plate being slid in in theater, and then you have the plate holding the regenerant until it's healed. I can go through the femur quickly, now having shown you examples of plate after lengthening the femur and explaining why the femoral plate is placed on the medial side, but just again, the femur, the common place to insert the half pins are either a, lat a lateral insertion or 
anterolateral. So a lateral plate, never mind the biomechanical disadvantage, also has an infection risk disadvantage. Um, whereas on the uh, anterolateral, you might reduce that uh, infection risk disadvantage by an anterolateral half pin, but you still have the biomechanical disadvantage. So for that reason, uh, I use the medial side. So here's uh, very quickly, uh, this next slide is something I, I've already explained about in the previous presentation. Here's a clinical case of someone with a uh, various non-union in the proximal femur, this is a pediatric case, as well as shortening. And so the objective here was to create a valgus osteotomy and to perform lengthening as well. And so we do it with an external fixator. You can see the translation that would occur because the cora is proximal uh, to the um, site of the osteotomy. So this is a rule two. And you can also see that we've done a mid-shaft osteotomy to perform the lengthening. So as soon as the lengthening is over, we can perform the submuscular plating. But as you can imagine, this would be at around the three month stage and I'm not sure if my proximal osteotomy is fully consolidated, never mind united. So I make sure that I, my medial submuscular plate will actually bridge that osteotomy as well to allow freedom from that. Just a few more slides just to show you that approach again. You can see that interval between rectus and sartorius. The big muscle that's going obliquely is actually sartorius. This is a slightly different case. In congenital lengthenings, in congenital longitudinal deficiency of the femur, sartorius is actually abnormally large. So don't be mis misled and thinking, oh, that big muscle must be rectus. No, that's actually sartorius in congenital cases. So you look for that interval between the two muscles, which you can see there. You open the fascia of rectus femoris and you pull rectus femoris to one side, to the lateral side, and you can, can't quite make it, you can just about make out, I think, on the image, the neurovascular bundle coming down, which you have to mobilize after palpating the shaft of the femur so you know whether you're going to move it medially or laterally and then get to the shaft of the femur. Distally, you've seen that before. Create the track, slide your plate in and fix with open screw fixation. So just to summarize and conclude, I think it's a good alternative uh, to, to lengthening over a nail or lengthening and then nail. Uh, you can use this technique in children with open physis, so you don't have to transgress the physis. It carries the similar advantages to lengthening over nail and lengthening then nail. And I think for the at-risk groups that I mentioned earlier, uh, it is uh, a good technique with a good cost alternative. And these are the at-risk groups I mentioned earlier. Thank you for your attention. This is put a list on the table. And still, if there are too many procedures, a long list, then I do it because sometimes you can forget things. So it's always a good idea to make a stepwise plan. And as Gavin said initially, I always say, have a problem list. See the list, what you're going to follow, how you're going to tackle the problem, right? And the list, the problem list is, is actually twofold. One is, 
what problems the patient will you can problems and second for the procedure itself what can be likely problems how are you going to tackle them and what's your plan b this is a usual we should always have or if you can stick on a th theater table is brilliant so the most important thing is pre-planning you have to pre-plan for a number of things pre-planning to understand where you're going to put your osteotomy, how well it's going to translate, will I, will this take this implant? If you look at Paul's talk, if you look at it, he was planning the nail, but sometimes with the translation, it can be difficult. So you have to plan it and see, am I okay to ream one side of cortex by putting polar screws and this nail would be okay? Or do I need a different device? Will that device be biomechanically stable? Or what is the best biomechanical device? And how best that best biomechanical device which respects the biology is suitable and how I can put that. So there are a number of things you need to pre-plan. And is the simple thing is, if you have a, um, uh, any software, trauma CAD or bone ninja, plan on that, move your osteotomy up and down, see how much it moves, where it moves. If you don't have that, which I used to do when I didn't have trauma CAD, print the x-ray on a piece of paper from PowerPoint. Take a pair of scissors and some sticky tape, cut at various places, move around and see what fits well. It's, actually, it works equally well. The only thing is, is, it doesn't look very sexy because the colored lines and all that looks a bit tatty tapes taking all around, but it does exactly the same job. And I still got pictures when I used to do that because our hospital will not buy trauma care to us because it's a very expensive license. Now, this we talked about that constrained and unconstrained correct, correction. If you're doing a constrained correction with hinge, then your hinge has to be absolutely spot on. If you're unconstrained, then you have to manually move it. Now, the, the thing is that if you are doing a constrained correction, you should have a plan that if I put my hinge wrong, how else can I move it, right? And if you look at the, you've got two rings and then two hinges, long rods, it is slightly unstable in a way. So either you use LRS, which is quite stable, and that you're fine, and which you can uh, loosen the pins and move it up and down. Or what you can do is you should have a device something to hold, put an additional support bar after translating or moving so that it stays where it is. So you should have that plan or some backup with you uh, in the system. Now, osteotomy rule becomes very, very critical and that's the reason osteotomy rules are important because rule two is often used. Because if you see, most of our deformities are infection, trauma, uh, to children, growth plate. And CORA or apex of the deformity is very low, right? So post-trauma mid-shaft fractures are not as many. The more of the deformities are periarticular apex. And there you cannot do the osteotomy at the apex of the deformity because you will not have enough bone to, to fix it, to stabilize it. So you have to move it. Once you move it, you have to have obligatory translation and that becomes difficult because unless we plan it, we cannot put the, uh, put the uh, uh, right implant. If you have a Unico, you do manual and LRS actually that way works quite well. If you are good at LRS, I'm not very good at it, therefore I don't use it as often, but if you are good at LRS, you learn how to do it, then what you can do is translation becomes quite easy. You loosen the, I think we did it in one of the labs, you, you, you loosen the, uh, uh, the, the bolt and just move it up and down, and because LRS, the hinge is never at the, uh, well, uh, is uh, uh, not always, but most of the times it's not at the apex of the deformity. So there's a translation, you have to correct it. So that's quite easy and it's a quite strong and stable fixator. So if you're good at it, it's a very good, but there's a particular technique with it. The, the downside of LRS is you have, if you don't get it right, it's very little play because it's a very stiff construct. So you have to get it really spot on and that way. Hex supports, I do not use it because I think it's an expensive way of doing things. You, there's a lot of other things you can say I use a lot of money, but hex support I find is quite expensive and it comes in the way. And unless there is a very complex deformity, I don't think that is the normal uh, use. There are a couple of units in UK who use it, particularly Bristol who sort of uh, um, propagated and, and, brought, and brought the term chaos 
and we'll talk about it in a little bit later. So this is an example just to say that how pre-planning is helpful. So this is a lady, she, about 72 or 73, and she's got some very significant valgus. Knee surgeons are not happy to do it because there are a lot of deformities, and they say, so they were sort of very hesitant, and they, they send it to us that saying that, can you do something about the leg so we can put a knee replacement? So what you do is you pre-plan it. Now, if you see, when you pre-plan it, I want to shift it axis and a slight translation at the femur and, and significant translation at the tibia. So we need to know, we know that how we're going to do it, how much, what the plan is, how much is going to translate. So I use the Unico because you have more sort of easier with that. So that's the femur. And if you see that femur has translated as much as I want, that's the tibia. So we translated it, then put in a plate. And if you see the whole picture overall, the, the whole thing is translated and your axis comes quite straight as the medial tibia spine where it should be. Now she's pain free, like a lot of these patients are how long I don't know, but she's pain free for about four or five years now. So hopefully she will outlive, but we don't know. So idea of this is not to get the um, sort of, is there's not the treatment for arthritis, but by correct alignment and putting the bones in the right place and access, what you will find a lot of these patients become actually pain free. As I said, device compatibility is very important. You need to mark and everything. Your, it will be very difficult and uh, it looks really silly when your internal implant comes in the way of external or other way around. So you need to plan it and uh, you need to plan it in a way. If you're not happy, just do it on a saw bone. It's perfectly acceptable and quite good. Take the saw bone to the theater. A lot of people in complex deformities, they in fact had a 3D printed model where they put it the fixation and then take it to theater. So you can do that, that's not a problem. The other thing I want to look, I want to uh, bring your attention is the rotation. Now, if you see, when you have the hip anterior and knee anterior x-ray in, in presence of rotation, right? Then what happens is that your neck length gets less. So you're, sh you're actually the center of the head shifts. So it's quite simple. This is your length of the head. And if you have a retroversion, this distance will decrease. If you have antiversion, this distance will, increase, will, will decrease. So that will affect how you, now it's not a big difference, but it can be subtle and it can be difficult. So let's take this example, which I showed previous, uh, in my previous talk. So this is an example. So the, if you look at the preoperative deformity, if you look at it, the, if, I don't have the pictures, but if you rotate the head, it's ent anterior or retroversion, it will shift laterally, and which means if you take the center of the head, the amount of deformity is less. It will also affect postoperatively, because if you look at it, the deformity looks slightly undercorrected there, or they're slightly overcorrected there. And that is the effect of the rotation. So you need to be careful then. So what I would suggest is, thorough clinical examination is important. Do your rotational profile. Normally you will know it's quite obvious, but if not, then that a thorough clinical examination is very important to ensure there's no rotational deformity. And when you are checking your axis, make sure that the neck is in the profile where it normally it should be. And, and that will help you in that. If you still have a problem, then there are ways to pre-plan it, how to draw your mechanical axis uh, uh, to, to overcome that problem. If, if you have the problem, and so, 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 there are, so there are ways around it. Other, question, other problem is the length. And as I meant, is easily solvable in theater, but it can be a problem. So length works in two ways. So if you have a deformity like that, and you want to correct it, if you do that, it will impinge there. It will not correct in the transverse osteotomy. If it's a dome, it will correct, but if it's a transverse osteotomy, it will impinge. So what you do is, you first lengthen it a bit, and then you correct it. So what happens is that you get a bit of a clearance. Now this, you can do it in theater once you have done your osteotomy, lengthen it a bit, correct it, and then don't forget to compress it again. That's important. Do is you distract it, correct it, and then the things can move. So, so that's important. Then the thing is, uh, 
post, uh, so how you do it in theater actually. So, so one of the things which I have done in the past and, I, and I've regretted it is that I didn't leave that space on, the, on this rod. So it looks quite sleek when you put in a thing, it finishes at the end, but then you lose all your ability to, uh, to lengthen the bone on the table. So whenever you plan this, space on your, you lengthen the leg uh, to, to overcome that problem. The other thing which I learned from, uh, uh, from Dura is that if you, once you have, before the osteotomy, put in a bit of distraction. And if you do osteotomy in the tension, it actually comes quite easily and easy to know that you have completed the osteotomy. So that's another, another trick you can uh, use while doing, your, uh, while doing your osteotomy. If it's a dome, it actually rotates quite easily. And this is where you say you, you, you should not do leave no length. But if it is dome, it actually uh, rotates and often comes quite easily without any, without any lengthening. Other problem you will face is that from time to time is that bone quality. And if your segment is small, and what happens is that the stability becomes an issue. And what happens is that uh, it is particularly more relevant if you have a, a stiff soft tissue or means somebody had a previous surgeries, uh, then uh, there's a lot of scarring, so that doesn't help. So I'll give you this example. As I always say, I've done all the things which I'm, I'm talking to you. So this is a lady with a stress fracture, non-union, and she was clear she doesn't want a frame, and I thought at her age probably not a bad. And what a reason I wanted to correct the leg was that I was worried that this ankle replacement with an abnormal forces might loosen quickly. And then COVID came, and by the time she was waiting, she fell and she had another fracture there. So now it became a sort of imperative that we have to do it in a, in a case. It helps us because I, could, I can put her on the trauma list then. So it is helpful in a way. So this is the case. So this is your pre-correction. I put in the hinge and I thought I don't have to lengthen it because it will be kind of opening wedge and I'll be fine. And on the table actually it didn't look too bad. When I looked at it on the table, it came out nicely, came straight, but again came the same problem, and then I nailed it. Now, I, I realized when I finished nailing this, a slight under correction, because the leg, when I thought it looking straight, a slight varus, I thought we'll probably get away, and we look at it, it is actually a bit of a varus, and it is not a good, not a good correction. Her, but I left it because her t ankle was parallel to the ground. So the main purpose was that, and I thought it will heal. And it actually didn't, so that looks fine. I left it slightly proud because when we measured it, if I leave it slightly proud, I can put, put three screws at the top. So I thought that will hold, but actually it didn't because she was osteoporotic and she had a lot of other problems. Age was on her side, so ultimately in five months, this became more the procurvatum, it became loose, the nail became prominent, and she is complaining of terrible pain. So we have to take her back to theater and do it. Now, uh, it is a quite simple thing is that we could have done slightly differently. And there's another example in a young patient. Again, this is a lateral compartment osteoarthritis, all I wanted to correct. And on table, it looked fine. And I put the plate on the lateral side, some muscular, so that with the opening side it would be held. But again, the issue is that I use the plate, which is not designed for this purpose, is a usual trauma plate as a locking plate, but it is not as stiff. So when I corrected it, it looked fine where I wanted it, and when I finished, actually, it, it, it is undercorrected. And so these are the things. So what I should have done is what, 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 what you need to do. So what I should have done it, in this case, in the previous case, the elderly lady, I should have put in a small plate and then nailed it. That would have been held uh, it much better. The correction would have been held. Or uh, if, you, if you are in doubt, do the double plating because then it will hold it. And so these are some things you will see that you, you, will, re, you will realize that on, on table it's obvious. So that's the reason I always suggest take access number of times where until you are, you, you are really happy. Uh, I've talked about hinge, so I won't talk about it, but I'll give you the same example in the sense that uh, how it happened. And I think here, despite all the effort, I think my hinge was not spot on and this was probably a couple of millimeters. I don't think it will make a lot of difference in the long run, but I think it's slightly undercorrected. It, it could have been slightly better. The other thing is the nail entry point. 
So when you correct it, you need to pre-plan it because when you correct it and translate it, you'll find your nail entry point is not the standard nail entry points. And what happens is then, so once you're pre-planned, then you know where you're going to put your polar screws, as Paul has quite elegantly showed you. So you put, so put in so your reamer and your guide wires are in the, play, in, in the line where you want to do it. And, and this is an oblique plane deformity with translation deformity of the femur, which I did on the, which a, which a fixator assisted. So, so what happens is that, so I, uh, I've lost that picture somewhere, I don't know, couldn't find it, but there is a pre-planning picture, I promise you. I did pre-plan it. So it went there and I, I knew I had to start a bit laterally because of the, the, way, the way the leg is where, because it will not, I won't, don't, couldn't translate it too much because I have to put in the nail. And so I put in a polar screw and then everything I did on the lateral side. So it, it shifted my nail, sorry, my guide wire, my reamers and nail in the line where I wanted it to be. And so once you put in the fixer, you can pass in a nail and then when you see it, uh, sorry. So if you see it is, excess is right and, but everything is slightly lateral. And there's a polar screw which is, you don't have to use the polar screw. If you don't want to leave any implant behind, use a 3.2 DHS guide wire. The downside is if it breaks, you are in a lot more trouble than a screw, so you could be slightly careful, but the 3.2 guide wire, DHS guide wire is quite strong. You can, you can put it and use it and then take it out. But then if you show the x-rays, then it doesn't look as sexy because, uh, because you can't show you put in the polar screw. So whichever way you want to do it. So, uh, but the idea is that you need to ensure that your nail and your path is gone in the way where you intended it to go. Otherwise, you'll end up with the undercorrection. Where you put in the pins, and these are the pictures from Michael Laverick, I, when I was his fellow about long, long, long time ago. These are the p p pictures in his office. He put these pins to show everybody how to do it. And if you're putting in a nail, you put the high, your pins posteriorly, you can put the nail from here. And again, you put the pin anteriorly, you can put a wire anteriorly, you can do that. And otherwise you can put it distal enough uh, for, for them to the, for the length of the nail. If you're putting a plate, you put it on opposite side, right? So it's quite easy that way you can do it. And there's a picture of the plate, you can put it on the opposite side. If you're doing a nail in the femur, you put in them posteriorly. And then, so these are the two pins posteriorly and your canal entry point is quite clear. So you have enough space there to, 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 to put them posteriorly. The, but the ideal thing is normally, uh, rather than putting in posterior cortex, put it a bit proximal, so you have clear, and you don't want to use the uh, too long of a nail because otherwise when you correct it, the whole construct becomes slightly unstable. So you put long enough nail, uh, nail long enough, which will give, you enough, give enough stability. Uh, and then you put in a plate, then you put in the opposite side, so you can put the plate quite nicely, and you can put some muscular plate or, or, or the lateral plate. In LRS, the, there are challenges, which are that your, 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 your femur is curved, and your fixator is straight, so, so there's a sandwich clamp you can use. There are, there are devices which they, you, you need to use it, so you can do it quite nicely, but you need to be, be aware and be careful about it. <clears throat> Translation is, is quite easy. Actually, you, uh, you uh, undo the, 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 the clamp which is holding the pins, and you can hold the pins and translate it. And if there is an sagittal pin, there's another clamp which you can use to, uh, uh, to, to, to correct that. <clears throat> and this is, again, so when you compress the osteotomy, so this is important that when you compress the osteotomy, that there's a risk of losing the correction. So especially when the pins are c c convergent. So you, so you need to be careful about it, check it. Otherwise, you do, is, do slight overcorrection. So when you compress it, it comes to neutral where you want it. So to, to, so to, to, to summarize, the most important thing is that you need to be familiar with the system, what you're doing. You should be comfortable what you're doing. If you're not happy, do it on a saw bone. Practice it, see the implants, hold them, see the fixators, see the plates, so that when you are in theater, it's easier. And there are simple steps, but the pre-planning is absolutely crucial. And you can use it on a saw bone. And 
it is a sequence of the steps and attention to detail which will help you. And actually, most of them actually come quite all right where you want it. But you can't, so when you take informed consent, you always tell patient there's a risk that I may not be able to correct it fully and you have no chance. Though most of them will come, but there's still a, still a risk. Thank you so much. Questions there whilst we get set up with the next presentation. So, questions for Durai or Hemant on plating after lengthening and tips and tricks. I've got a question for you, Durai. I should have plated him, but I'll know he'll need. So the plates are usually removed at about a year um, in the children that I've treated. And um, if you want to, undertake the next lengthening at the same time or provide a lot. One of the reasons I do plate after lengthening is to enable some children who have staged lengthenings to reduce the impact of the lengthening. So yes, it is an indication for repeat stage lengthening. Um, the only thing I would suggest is that you'll be replating in scarred areas. So the second and the third plating is obviously technically uh, more challenging because of the scar tissue, but you're more experienced because it'll be your second and your third time. <laughs> Question for Mr. Nayagam. Uh, so in most of your cases, you were uh, uh, you did a diaphyseal corticotomy and lengthening. So would you do a leng lengthening and then plating when you're doing a metaphyseal lengthening? So the reason why we are brought up doing metaphyseal osteotomies for lengthening is because that's the best place to form bone regenerate. And that was developed and researched when lengthenings were done, processed, completed with an external fixator. But if you're doing external fixator assisted techniques or plate after lengthening, lengthening over a nail, the tooth, the whole process of regenerate formation, one third is the lengthening of the time is taken by lengthening, two thirds of the time is taken by the regenerate solidifying. So you're basically cutting 66% of the time out if you substitute internal fixation. So by doing a diaphyseal osteotomy, even though the regenerate formation is slower, it doesn't matter because you've already substituted the internal fixation. Just a point I want to make because <clears throat> um, a, a lot of patients who don't want HTO um, by the frame and, and a lot of them are are the working peop people who want to go back to the job quickly. So I tend to do a two-stage HTO where I translate, correct, and then put in a plate. But since it's been in metaphysis, I, it always worries me that they will get infection someday. And that's one way. So I, you try, I try to put pin as far away as possible, but still there is some contact at the end of the day when we change. So have you done anything on metaphysis as any tips for that? So uh, yes, we have plated uh, metaphyseal osteotomies for lengthening when there have been uh, reasons to do a correction at the metaphyseal level because that's determined by the cora and we use the same osteotomy for lengthening. So I've done lateral submuscular plating for those and there are two caveats. One, um, I'm very, very uh, confident that the quality of pin site monitoring at the children's hospital where I do this uh, is outstanding, also at the adult hospital. So the incidence of pin site osteomyelitis, not pin site infection, the majority of pin site infections are skin infections, but a minority of them become pin site osteomyelitis. If any of those pins develop a pin site osteomyelitis, that, and this is part of the preparation of the child and the parent, we would not go to substituting internal fixation. But if it's a pin site infection, and if it's a sensitive organism and it's control, then yes, I would do. So there is no black and white, always plate after lengthening, or if you get an infection, never plate after lengthening. It depends what type of infection and where it is. 
Thank you. What's the weight bearing status after the uh, after you put the uh, plate in? Yeah. What's the weight bearing status like uh, when the regenerator is still soft, and uh, and you put the submuscular plate in? So in children, I aim to get uh, three screws above, three screws below. In adolescents and older, four screws above, four screws below. That's in either femur or tibia. And as soon as the wounds are healed, so usually at a 10 days or whatever, it's partial weight bearing at 33%. And then usually by six weeks after that, uh, you see uh, uh, we would advance. Here's something that I've learned when I started to do plate after lengthening. It also reinforce the idea of reverse dynamization. You've heard about reverse dynamization in that the classic concept that you go from uh, less stable, uh, sorry, more stable to less stable during the evolution of healing and reverse dynamization is you go from uh, uh, more stable to less stable to, to, to even more stable. And I found that the regenerate quality, and this is purely anecdotal, seemed to harden when I substituted the plate. Now, obviously, with the plate, I've got much more fixation than with an external fixator. Any more questions, comments? Okay, while well, we're going on now to chaos or order, which uh, I fluctuate between the two, um, uh, that we've got a recorded presentation from Fergal Monsell, first of all, so uh, we'll listen to that and then move over for order. Computerized hexapod assisted orthopedic surgery and whether it's worth the hassle. And what I thought I'd do to defend this position is to explain to you what the technique entails and leave you to make up your own mind. I work at the Bristol Children's Hospital and Bristol Royal Infirmary Limb Reconstruction Units as part of a team of surgical consultants, each of whom have contributed to the work I'm about to present to you with the aim of reducing our use of external fixators associated with femoral deformity correction. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Santiana. And in the context of limb reconstruction, he reminds us of cases such as these. Conventionally, we would treat with multiple osteotomies, uh, external fixators. And that would be a fairly typical example of excellent rickets managed in this way. The results were improved, but not spectacular. And we'd repeat the process. And we found that there would be a high proportion of patients that would have residual deformity and would require subsequent osteotomies to achieve the result that was planned. This led us to think that there must be a better way of conducting surgery. It demonstrated to us that femoral fixators, they're large and they're bulky. And because of transfection of muscle groups, which is inevitable, causes knee stiffness and pin and wire infection. This makes it a very undesirable and unpleasant undertaking for a patient. And our plan was to use hexapod fixators to conduct perioperative deformity correction and subsequently fix this with a nail or a plate. So using the advantage of programmable fixators to obtain anatomical correction and then using anatomical implants to hold the correction. And this is independent of the variety of external fixator, nail or plate. The equipment we've used is by force of habit, but the purpose of this is to describe the principle and not the individual technique. And our view is that this is appropriate for whatever infantry you have at your disposal. You need to plan very carefully where you put your pin, wires and rings. You need to avoid the external fixator impeding the jig and you need to avoid the fixation impeding nail or plate passage. And this is an example I'd like to demonstrate the technique with. This is a single level apex lateral femoral deformity. It requires conventional deformity planning. And in this case, we've used anatomical axis planning to demonstrate that the proximal and the distal joint orientation lines are normal. 
and that the deformity is apex lateral measuring 17 degrees. The most important consideration is to ensure that wherever you put your distal fixation does not impede the jigging system that you use for the intramedullary nail. In our unit, we use dry bones to place our inventory to measure the optimum position of our fixator and to ensure that this didn't impede passage of the jig. I think this is probably the most important step. And for the equipment that we were using, we used a distal two thirds ring and we measured that provided that the ring was placed 90 millimeters proximal to the knee joint line, we could fix it with half pins on Rancho cubes and that this did not impede our retrograde nail jigging system. With the opening of the ring base posteriorly, this would still accommodate the jigging system that we wanted to use. And so that measured 90 millimeters from knee joint line. We also estimated the proximal extent of our intramedullary nail and measured that the proximal ring should be placed 10 centimeters distal to the greater trochanter tip. It's also important to ensure that the orientation of the half pins in the distal segment do not impede the passage of the nail. And if we were estimating using an 11.5 millimeter nail, we calculated the orientation of each pin to ensure that this would not impede either the reaming or passage of the nail. And this was what it looks like in clinical practice. That's the knee joint line, and that's measured 90 millimeters. And approximately the same considerations are relevant. And we used approximate two thirds ring and measured that this needed to be 10 centimeters distal to the greater trochanter fixed with two and three hole rancho cubes proximal to the ring with the opening base medially. And this would not impede the passage of our intramedullary nail. And when the rings are in place, the standard struts are inserted and this allows correction using standard programs. And this allows passage of a nail with distal and proximal locking. And in real life, and for this case, this was the final outcome. And it is a relatively straightforward case, and I absolutely understand the criticism may be that this is overcomplicating it. But in the early stages of the evolution of this technique, we wanted to be absolutely clear that it was both practical and safe. And when we were confident using it on relatively straightforward single plane deformities, we extended the use. And this is the clinical result. This is a more complex deformity, which is essentially a translation stroke rotation abnormality, leading to an overall medial mechanical axis deviation. And if you look at the components of the deformity, there is a very substantial and probably one diameter translation. And that is quite difficult to acutely correct without some form of surgical assistance. And if you look at the same modeling, It's possible with standard deformity planning and the additional planning that involves fixator placement to correct the deformity in all planes, re-establish the medullary canal and allow conventional nailing of this deformity. And in clinical practice, this is the result in two planes. And I would find it very difficult to accurately reconstruct the proximal and distal segments using an osteotomy unless had the additional assistance of a fixator system and the accuracy that's required in this case i think demands something that demands a programmable fixator and this is the final result and as we became more confident in the use of the device we extended the indications and this is a polyaxial deformity secondary to hyperphosphatemic rickets and it's to demonstrate the principle you separate the proximal and the distal segments ignoring for the time being the intercalary segment which will require multiple osteotomies so using conventional deformity analysis programmable fixator using standard mounting parameters to 
calculate the deformity of the proximal segment and the distal segment individually. And this allows correction of each. And effectively, we're correcting the proximal and distal segments, ignoring the intercalary segment. But we still need to deal with this. And once we've corrected the hip and the knee using a retrograde nailing system, we perform multiple osteotomies to achieve anatomical correction of the whole bone. This can then be locked proximally and distally, the fixator removed, and the patient can mobilize. And so from a cartoon, you correct this to this without the necessity to have a fixator worn in the post-operative period. This is an extreme example of another patient with hypophosphatemic rickets to, to illustrate the complexity that is possible once this technique has been understood. Again, it is separating the proximal and the distal segments, correcting those so that they anatomically align, and then dealing with the intercalary segment with multiple osteotomies. It's also possible to use this technique for periarticular deformities, particularly in the distal femur, when the osteotomy would prevent the use of conventional nailing. And this is much better conducted using a locking plate. And the approach is very straightforward. A standard submuscular approach to place an anatomically contoured plate. The same rules apply in that we needed to model the position of our fixator, the position of our fixation to ensure that this did not impede either the surgical approach or the subsequent passage of the plate. And in clinical practice, and this is an example using a locking plate to correct a distal femoral deformity. It is not possible to correct axial deformity using this approach. But what it does do, particularly in those cases that have been corrected with an intermedullary nail, it provides a straight medullary canal which can be subsequently used with intermedullary lengthening devices. And so our treatment strategy for femoral deformity has evolved and when possible, we will wait till skeletal maturity. We will use hexapod assisted correction and then an intramedullary lengthening or a femoral shortening to correct any axial deformity. And we've published our results using this approach and these can be accessed in the following journals.
Okay, we can make a start uh, so that you can get away a little bit earlier than, uh, than usual. So it's my turn to present uh, my turn to present a slightly different uh, technique for achieving accurate acute corrections of deformity. And the acronym order I credit to a colleague of mine, Nick Peterson, and because we thought there was chaos, which was obviously uh, started sometime earlier than order. We hadn't really developed the technique of order fully, but we think we have now. And so we now have an alternative, and I want to show you what it's about, how to use it, and what are the pluses and minuses as well. So this really is a presentation giving you the scope of order. You know, what is it? When can I use the technique? What are the positives and negatives? And uh, perhaps, if I can persuade you, it's a technique that you can keep in your arsenal for solving problems. So essentially, you, it is a technique based on using a rail fixator. It, hasn't need, it doesn't need to be a specific make of rail fixator, but I will tell you the qualities of the rail fixator that are required to use the scope of order. The rail fixator is applied to facilitate the correction accurately to compress the osteotomy in a manner that is greater than can be achieved with a compression nail or a compression plate, and then to facilitate substitution without interference of an internal fixation device. That's simply what order is. And who is it for? Well, it's for any patient who you think would prefer not having an external fixator on their leg after deformity correction. It is also suitable for what I call fixator negative patients. We've all seen them. You've met them, you've met their families, and you think this patient will not cope with a fixator. So those are the fixator negative patients that this technique is suitable for. So the key things I want to credit about the technique as it evolves is we did not forsake the principles of the Elizaroff method. So keeping the biology, you doing the deformity analysis as you have been taught in the last four days, and importantly, uh, post-fixation, choosing the methods of stabilization that will allow early functional loading, not using a method, because one of the advantages of using an external fixator is that you can facilitate early functional loading. So if you're going to substitute internal fixation, you do not want to lose that important advantage. Now, I'm going to, this required some thinking because I asked myself, is it worth the hassle? Well, to explain how order works is that when I started training as an orthopedic surgeon, we were often encouraged to look at deformity as expressed in the two orthogonal views on x-ray. We see 20 degrees of angulation on this view, we see 30 degrees of angulation on this view, so we have two deformities. That's how I was taught. Then you go through the deformity analysis course and they say, that's all rubbish. You have to come back and think of one plane of deformity. It's in an oblique plane and that's why you see it in two magnitudes on two different views. And then when it starts to get a bit more complex, they say, oh, you better stop thinking about oblique planes, just rely on the hexapod to solve it for you because you can't think in virtual hinges. Order is going back to basics. Think about the deformity in every plane because you solve it bit by bit in every plane. So you're going back to the future. And it's really about encouraging you to think about how you used to think about so much deformity in the sagittal plane, so much deformity in the uh, coronal plane, so much deformity in the axial plane, and you can resolve all those deformities at one sitting. You have total control. Now, I'm just going to digress slightly and tell you why I use a rail. The reason I use a rail is because I find it much easier to leave a lot of space for uh, 
access for internal fixation because I don't have arches or rings in the way. And so that's a big positive, and I'm going to use internal fixation as the method. Also important is I can tweak the fixator interoperatively. Let's say I place my pins, as I view it, accurately. I do my osteotomy and I adjust my pins. Then I would measure on my C-arm the angle that I've achieved, and I'm four degrees out. I do not need to go back to a software and enter parameters to tweak another four, or do I need to go back to achieve a little bit of lengthening or a little bit more compression? I can tweak it simply as it is. And that is a big advantage, and it does speed up the process. Furthermore, I can actually do multiple levels of osteotomies on the same segment, or I can do multiple levels of osteotomies on two segments, femur and tibia, and position the rail so that you can have them all on at the same time. So that's also an advantage because you can control each level of osteotomy independently and adjust and tweak until the final result is what you want. So the qualities of the fixator. First of all, you need an ability to alter angulation in one plane. In the orthogonal plane, you need the ability to alter translation. Those are the two qualities. And finally, you need a system that allows you to measure rotational correction. If your rail system allows you to do that, you're ready to go. I've lost. Ah. Have I finished? Yes, I've done that. Here we go. I mentioned this earlier about having a C-arm uh, that allows you to measure angles. There are alternatives. If you don't have that luxury, you could always get the C-arm image to be printed out and get someone who's not scrubbed up to measure the angle for you. But it's obviously much easier if you can measure it using the module that comes packaged with the C-arm. Uh, so there are alternatives to, to measuring it. And these two images show you the measurements I have achieved. I'm not sure, oh, the resolution on the projector doesn't quite show you uh, the, the numbers, that, but the numbers and the angle uh, are shown at the sides here. And this particular one shows I've got it perfect, and this one shows that I'm about three degrees out. So I've got to tweak this one a little bit more. And you can see that we also perform a mechanical axis check, like uh, Professor Sharma showed you earlier. I tend to use a connected rod rather than a, a bovi cord or a, a diathermy cord wire. Right, so remember I said we're going back to the future. We're thinking about uh, the deformity in the separate orthogonal planes. And the reason is, is because if we did the workshop that we did earlier uh, yesterday. If you have an oblique plane, let's say you have a coronal plane deformity as seen on the uh, frontal view, and you place your half pins perpendicular to the anatomical axis proximal to the deformity, and you place them uh, perpendicular to the axis distal to the deformity, and let us then assume that you have a sagittal plane deformity as well and you place those pins in the clam parallel to the anatomical axis in the orthogonal view, you are dealing with that oblique plane deformity. That's exactly what you're doing. You're going back to what you uh, originally looked at, which is the dimensions and the characteristics of the deformity in the two views, and you're putting it together in the two ways. So when you actually uh, cut the bone and make the frontal plane pins parallel, and you make the lateral plane pins clamps par uh, in line, you resolve your oblique plane deformity. Does it work? Well, let's have a look. Here is one. This is an oblique plane deformity. It is almost similar to one of the previous cases shown that was treated uh, with an intramedullary nail and a hexapod. But using a different technique, you have your half pins perpendicular proximal, half pins perpendicular to the anatomical axis distal, and you would want to place your half pins parallel to the sagittal axis 
in the lateral view. And again, because I'm planning to use an intramedullary nail, I will position my pins posterior to the trajectory of the nail. So this is the intraoperative view with an intraoperative check of the final angle that you achieve. Once you've done that, you compress the osteotomy with the external fixator. That's a quality that rail fixators will allow you to do. Of course, you can do it with a hexapod too, but you'll have to program that uh, in, in, in the correction that you achieve. And whilst the correction, while that compression is being maintained, you perform your reaming and obviously the introduction of your intramedullary nail. Can I then tell you that this deformity in the oblique pane measured 42 degrees. This was an acute correction of 42 degrees of the distal femur with resolution of the deformity and union after intramedullary nailing. So I've shown you an example that oblique plane deformities can be corrected with a rail. What about rotation? And what about rotation and angulation? Can we do that or do we have to go back to a hexapod? Remember I said, think of the components. So let's say we have this lad who's had a malunited femoral fracture. He is 35 degrees malrotated. He's so rotated that his patella is sitting on the lateral edge of his femur. And this is as a consequence of a nailing. And the patella is subluxing, and that is purely because he has a malrotation as well as a coronal plane deformity. So do we have to use a hexapod? No. How do we solve this? You start first by using derotation templates. So that's one of the qualities of the rail system that you need to have. And having derotation arcs, you can dial in precisely the amount of derotation you want. And here we've dialed in 35 degrees of derotation. Notice that I'm placing the rail anteriorly. This rail is in the anterior position of the femur. I perform the osteotomy based on my preoperative planning as to where I want to achieve the correction of the angulation and derotation. I derotate first, solve that rotational abnormality, and now I put a second rail in the coronal plane away from the trajectory of a nail and I can now focus on the coronal plane or even oblique plane deformity like I did before. What's the caveat? When you achieve the correction, you take off the anterior rail because you've already achieved the derotation and just leave the coronal plane rail down and that allows you to achieve the correction over an intramedullary nail. And you'll notice because the rail is posterior to the intramedullary nail, you can lock proximally and distally while the rail fixator is still on. One of the common things that's often asked about acute correction, whether you do it by rail or hexapod, is about the nerves and the nerves at risk. And the most common place that you'd think of is in the proximal tibia. And there are three things in the proximal tibia, three corrections that would jeopardize the nerve to a neuropraxia. And these would be external rotation to internal rotation, valgus to varus, and flexion to extension, okay? If you have a flexion deformity and you suddenly extend the tibia, though that will stretch the nerve, similar with valgus to varus and external to internal rotation. So in these cases, I would suggest it's a mandatory to consider a common perineal nerve neurolysis. And you would have seen that in your cadaveric workshop, and there's a video on that as well. The reason is I do not know what is the safe limit to perform an acute correction in the proximal tibia for these deformities. Some people say it's 10 degrees, but I've seen palsies with even 10 degrees, and I've seen no palsies with 15 degrees. So the safest thing is to perform a neurolysis. So here is a clinical example of such a case. This particular patient, as you can see, has a valgus deformity with a cora that will lie in the proximal tibia. The left side's okay, the, left, the right side not. 
And here is the Cora position. So it's in the junction of the upper third of the tibia and the middle third of the tibia. Why not external fixation? This is an adolescent with autism. So this is a person who is fixator negative. So this would be a good indication to consider external fixator assisted correction. As I mentioned, it would be mandatory to consider a common paratoneal nerve neurolysis. And you've seen that there are two techniques. You've got the Paley technique, which is from proximal to distal. We've got the technique we've shown you here, where we try to find the nerve uh, distally first and then lift off the origin of perineus longus so you deroof that completely and trace the deep perineal nerve as it enters the anterior compartment. So here we have the series of C-arm views showing the correction. You have the uh, perpendicular pins proximally and you have the perpendicular pins distally. And you have that rancho cube helping me to dial in. And that's one of the great things I like about coming to these courses. I learn as much as I deliver and learning that I should be calling this a barrel instead of a dome, I'm gonna take that home. Because that's right, it's more of a barrel than a dome. It's never a dome. So this barrel osteotomy, correction and then compression, that makes the stability, the shared stability between the osteotomy and the implant such that you can use a standard trauma implant. That is, the compression makes a big difference to the shared stability between the implant and the osteotomy site. So here you have basically a proximal, lateral proximal tibial plate that's used. That's the correction and that's the healed and final result. Sorry, just to give you some evidence that the axis has actually improved. Um, now, I'm, again, to acknowledge the people who did the research, Nick Peterson and Ahmad Al Sheikh, uh, we've done over 100 cases using order. This is a small subset because the reason I've chosen this cohort is because I've got a comparative cohort that was published of another series. So these are uh, tibias that were treated using order, and the first 23, 21 in the tibia, uh, sorry, 21 by plates and two by intramedullary nails. And what I've chosen to compare, why I've picked this subset out from the 100 or so that we've done, is simply because the other group is treated with a hexapod gradually. Because the common criticism of acute correction is it's not as accurate as gradual correction. And if you look at the data that you can see in the tables, there is virtually no difference between what we've achieved and what the hexapod group have achieved with gradual correction. And the reason is very simple. When you do gradual correction by a hexapod, you have to take x-rays, whether they're standing or standard x-rays, and you as a clinician have to decide, that is it, I've got it corrected. You make that decision, I've got it corrected. That same process happens with order, but happens in theater. You tweak, you adjust, you remeasure until you say, that's it, I've got it corrected. And that is why there's no difference, because the final process of deciding it's good enough is you, not the hexapod, not the rail. So that's why there's no difference between the quality of correction either way. We have had some complications in this group, including one nerve palsy that recovered at six months. And the reason we had that was, as I said, I do a mandatory uh, neurolysis, and in this particular uh, case, I remembered quite clearly after having done the neurolysis, I said to my uh, registrar at the time, who was actually one of the co-authors, Nick Peterson, I said, this nerve is still tight. And normally when I do a neurolysis, I can actually see the nerve flop and, uh, as an, uh, quite clearly around the neck of the fibula, and I said, this nerve is still tight. And lo and behold, this uh, adolescent had a common perineal nerve palsy after the correction, which he recovered at six months. Uh, so it's interesting 
that might explain why in some individuals a correction as small as 10 degrees will still give you uh, a palsy because the nerve uh, as it progresses around the neck of the fibula through the muscle is tethered to various extents. Can you do it in the femur and tibia? Well that's one of the big advantages of using order. So as I mentioned we always check our angles and we check our axis and we use a, a, a threaded rod connected by sockets uh, to, to do that measurement. But let's look at this case. This is a, a patient with a congenital short femur that underwent lots of lengthening as a child, uh, so much so that this was in the early days when people didn't really understand the soft tissue problems of lengthening in a congenital short femur. So he had a dislocated hip as a teenager while lengthening, they tried to put it back. Uh, so he's got not only deformity from previous regenerate, but he's got a hip that's stiff and slightly sublux, although not painful, and he's a, actually a practicing uh, clinician. So he comes to me and says, he walks with a poor gait. He doesn't want any lengthening. Can you improve he, the ability of his walk? It, can you improve his gait? So let's analyze the deformity. And if we analyze the deformity, it says three osteotomies to try and neutralize and improve his mechanical axis. One in the proximal, one in the distal femur, one in the proximal tibia. Now, those who are very skilled with chaos and hexapods might be able to do this. I think it would be very difficult to do the top and bottom and just uh, allow the middle to sit down, but to do the tibia as well, you'd struggle to fit all the rings. You might be able to do one ring at a time, then the next set of rings, and then the next set of rings, three separate hexapods in sequence, and that's possible to do it. But one of the advantages of using rails is you can put them all at the same time and do all the osteotomies and stop there and check and tweak each level until your final mechanical axis is right. So you don't commit to any internal fixation until the three levels are correct and compressed. And only then you say, I'm good, Let's do the internal fixation. And that's exactly what we did here. And if you think ahead and position your rails, you don't obstruct your internal fixation. We put the rail anteriorly at the top because we were planning to use a lateral plate. We put the second fixator laterally because we're going to use a small medial plate and then once we take the rail off, put a second lateral plate. And similarly, in the tibia, we were planning to put a lateral plate. So this was the post-correction result with a neutral axis, all done at the same time using a series of rail fixators. So I'm going to leave you with some take-home uh, messages. It is an accurate way, as accurate as gradual corrections for the right cases to perform deformity work. Um, you can use standard trauma implants. The caveat, and I don't want to contradict Professor Sharma, the caveat is we are achieving high compression at the osteotomy. So there's shared stability between the standard implant and, a, uh, and the actual uh, osteotomy site. And finally, if you're going to take this on, you must preoperative plan and you must do simulation of your correction on your software before you undertake the procedure. So you can think ahead about where to place your rails, where to do your osteotomies, and how to insert your, your internal uh, fixation implants. Good planning is really necessary. And if you get it right, it's the perfect example of getting it right first time. Uh, and it's one technique to add into your arsenal for solving uh, deformities. So, in the whole thing uh, that you've seen in this course and the different techniques you've learned in this course, uh, you've got a choice. You've got a choice between chaos and you've got a choice with order. Thank you. Let's talk now. We're going to head into the future. Uh, I think it's much easier to head into the future if you have a private practice. 
Um, I think the NHS, we can be grateful it's not too bad, especially when we speak to some of our international colleagues who've been on the course. We, we have a reasonable amount of resources, but for example, I still can't access 3D printing. Um, we, we haven't got robots for our arthroplasty, but we have got navigation, so we're a bit of a middle ground. Um, but I think Frank can uh, have a better idea <laughs> of... Uh, <laughs> Um, what might be there for us in the future and what's a bit more within his grasp than ours. Hopefully it'll be inspiring. For those of us who work in resource poor environments, just be glad that you can sit back and watch everyone else make the mistakes before the innovations come to you. So there are, there are good reasons there. Hey everybody. I was asked to talk about artificial intelligence, robotics, navigation, and the future of limb reconstruction surgery, all in about 10 minutes at the end of a very long week and a very long day. So I'll start with this. Um, I think it's very clear that we are surrounded by artificial intelligence um, everywhere we go in life. And we are sometimes of the opinion that it's a new thing. It, it is not brand new. It has been with us for a very long time. And in fact, the Google algorithms that we use to search for things on the internet have been around for almost 25 years now. Um, so artificial intelligence in daily life is there, it has been there, and it is certainly expanding rapidly. And you just have to look at any of your LinkedIn feeds to see that every second person or company is jumping onto this bandwagon. So what I thought I would do is to just look at, firstly, artificial intelligence and give us a quick overview of what that means, and then look at potential applications of these new technologies in the field of limb reconstruction in an attempt to just create some uh, future looking um, uh, viewpoint, if you will. I found this article very useful, and it is a uh, fairly understandable review of artificial intelligence in orthopedic surgery specifically. AI, the term was coined by John McCarthy already in 1956. And essentially what he described was a con extremely good at pattern recognition with limited human input. So in other words, a computer that can recognize patterns without a human actually telling it what to look for. And that at its core is what artificial intelligence is. It relies greatly on the concept of big data and metrics. And we are surrounded on a daily basis by large amounts of data that get created, that get bandied about and metrics that get measured that we are almost um, swamped in at some points. If you just look at a simple thing like an ankle fracture repair in an operating, all the little variables that one can follow throughout that procedure. And it becomes very clear that once you start measuring those things, you're sitting with tremendous amounts of data. And what artificial intelligence is really good at is to mine that big data and try and find patterns and color correlations and try and create sense out of the chaos in a way. Um, it is also very good at cognitive unloading. So what it means is that we're not using human minds anymore to actually think of patterns, to look at patterns, to try and make sense of it all. We actually use a computer algorithm to do that for us. And this field at its core is really a convergence of computer science, maths, data science, and statistics. In a way, it is statistics on steroids using very sexy, cool algorithms. Right, let's make sense of it. If I look at this data set in front of me, it is maybe pretty, maybe not, but it is very clear that there's a scattering of shapes and colors across the screen. And if I start looking into it a little bit more in detail, I might notice some peculiarities. I might start noticing that every time that there is a red triangle, it is in close relationship to a green triangle. I might also see that all of those red green triangle combinations are in the upper part of the screen. 
And suddenly we've created a bit of pattern recognition on this otherwise random picture. And that is really what artificial intelligence is really good at doing. The algorithms recognize patterns that might be invisible to the naked eye and start creating correlations between those and then refining that pattern recognition up to the point where it becomes almost predictive, where you can almost predict because of this pattern, that is what's going to be the outcome. And at its core, that's what artificial intelligence is. It's just a very clever way of doing that without human intervention. So let's say we have x-rays um, in our clinics and we want to teach a computer um, how to recognize one of these two frames. So we would go about and we would tell the computer that, remember our little red and green triangles? That if we find a red triangle very close to a green triangle, in this case, the red triangle would be the side locking bolt on the TL hex strut, and the green triangle would be the spherical connector at the end of the strut. If we find these two things um, in close proximity to one another, it might mean that we're dealing with a TL hex device and not a TSF device. In addition, if these are attached to two rings, that means that it is a strut that we're dealing with. Mimicking in our previous example, the upper part of that graphic. So in other words, the three things we were looking at is the pattern was that we had a red triangle and a green triangle close together and they were in the upper half of the screen. So in this case, the upper half of the screen is we've got a longitudinal strut that attaches two rings. The green and the red triangles are the side locking bolt and the spherical connector. And if we say yes to all three of those parameters, we're probably looking at a TL hex device and not a TSF device. And we can actually teach a computer to, to learn this. How that all comes together and the process of that learning happens as follows. So we start with big data, which is essentially the big data set out there. We create from that a data set that we want to input into our AI engine. So in this instance, it would be all the x-rays uh, in our limb reconstruction clinic that pertain to hexapod fixators. This data set then gets fed into the AI engine and the AI engine runs an algorithm that actually takes the data set and it measures it against the parameters that we've given it. So we told it that if the strut is attaching between two rings and it has a side bolt and it has a spherical connector, it is probably a TL hex strut. So the computer will now use that known parameters and it will measure the patterns that it comes across it against those parameters, trying to find chaos or sorry, find, find, find order in the chaos. And it will then kick out a certain output. It will create an output. So it will tell us that I think that the following x-rays belong to the TL hex group. What we then do is we look at how accurate that computer was in that assumption, and we then refine the code or the algorithm to in fact become more accurate. Once we do that, we actually feed it back into the loop. And it's this loop that is known as machine learning. So you've come across this term, machine learning, that's what it means. So it's not really a learning process, it's actually a process of optimization of a algorithm. And that, that's all it is. Machine learning then serves the purpose of refining this whole algorithm or this whole process. And every time we run through one of these cycles, it is called an epoch. And for the majority of the machine learning uh, developments, we run through somewhere between 10 and 10,000 epochs in order to actually refine the system, um, depending on the application. Now, you can imagine that that becomes extremely uh, time and resource uh, intensive to do that so many times. So another concept is to actually get the computer to refine itself and to actually change the code at that point on its own. And it does that, and that is called deep learning. So you might have come across that 
term as well. So deep learning is really where the code uh, autocorrects itself to become more accurate. And that is called deep learning. And of course, that is a little bit of a black box because suddenly the computer codes itself. And it, it, it sort of makes most of us a little bit uncomfortable when it does that. Um, I think as long as it's got a power plug, I'm happy. But, uh, but yeah, so that's deep learning. And deep learning then also relies on really different layers of very interconnected um, relationships between parameters and data. And if you continue doing these little lines that I do here, you would start realizing that that looks like a retic reticular network of neurons, axons, and dendrites. And it, that is what is known as a neural network. So in other words, at some point, the hierarchy of the organization of this deep learning algorithm starts looking like a brain in a way. It's, it's got a, a neural network. And that, that's in a nutshell what that term also then means. Right, so the prerequisites to have a proper AI system is you need to have enough data and you have to have the data clean. You have to have processing power and you have to have lots of it. Um, we measure processing power in terms of flops and you, know, you need lots of those flops to actually make this work. And then you need a sound algorithm as, as a starting point, but the algorithm needs to be able to then be updated appropriately to feed back into this loop and create a new epoch. So common applications of AI in medicine and specifically in orthopedics are in these four fields. So firstly, in terms of diagnosis, AI is really good at pattern recognition and it has been proven to be as effective in recognizing fractures on x-rays as orthopedic surgeons. It is probably more effective than the average radiologist at looking at CT scans for metastases. So it is really good at doing that. The second thing is in terms of decision making. So with all the data that we can feed into an AI system, it can start seeing correlations that we might not be even aware that exist. And because of that, it becomes a very powerful way of predicting complications or outcomes, prognosticating our treatment algorithms. And in a way that is a very powerful application of this because suddenly it helps us in our decision-making based on what it knows is going to be the potentially bad outcome. The next term I call technique execution, and that's really where we go into an environment of delivering care. So in our context, that would be surgery. And where does or how AI then helps us to be more accurate, helps us to be better at doing what we do. And that is where the whole field of surgical robotics, surgical navigation falls into this topic. So it is a form of AI. It uses very advanced algorithms. It uses all kinds of fancy things. Uh, but it is at this level where that comes into play. Lastly, it also is valuable in administrative functions and research where we can start making sense of huge amounts of data and try and create some order in that big data set and trying to become predictive in what could and could not work. How do we bring it back to limb reconstruction surgery? Well, firstly, in terms of diagnosis, we know that the AI engines are really good at pattern recognition. We know that we can teach a computer what something looks like based on the pattern. And once it can start recognizing patterns, it should not be too difficult for it to automatically pick up where a deformity is, where the optimal place is for an osteotomy, and indeed where we should likely place our rings in an external fixator context. And a lot of people are working in this direction, but yeah, it's not very far away when we'll have a completely automated planning workflow uh, for complex three-dimensional plans. We already have some of that in the um, world of arthroplasty where the templating solutions are becoming really intelligent at positioning things on our x-rays. In terms of decision making, if we faced with this interesting difficult case, we could plug in the x-ray into an AI system in future and it would kick out the most appropriate types of procedures or care pathways that would be applicable to this patient with the predicted amount of complications. And that can become a very powerful way 
of navigating this difficult world of medical legal um, implications of what we do. In terms of technique execution, the concept of robotics and navigation, it's all around us. It's literally being pushed down our throats. Um, for those of us who do not do arthroplasty, we do not get a lot of time to play with these tools. But of course, this is not a big jump to jump from a um, making a, 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 a tibial cut using a robot to making an osteotomy using a robot or placing a wire using a robot. So the technology is there. It's just to create the correct algorithm uh, to apply that in limb reconstruction surgery. Tied into this is the whole field of augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, immersive reality, all these terms that we hear. Essentially, this is where we create a virtual reality that is superimposed on what we see around us, on actual reality. And that is what we call augmented reality. So um, something like a heads up display that would allow you to manipulate things in three dimensional space, but also to have those things link into real objects that the system could recognize. So you could have, for example, a situation where you are operating on a patient, but you would have your patient's preoperative plan superimposed on that limb already in three dimensions. And conceivably, an AI engine could then even help you to look at where you should place your osteotomy, where you should put your hand when you're drilling for a wire, and so forth. And this all relies on very complex software that exists in a computer that you wear on your head. It makes you look a bit ridiculous, but it works quite well. And there's a lot of us working in this field trying to bring solutions in this manner. In terms of administrative work, I think it goes without saying that we all need help with that. Um, I think the opportunity exists for AI to really unlock vast amounts of data for us to use for research purposes, for optimization of processes, and also for optimization of things like billing. You could get to a point where an AI engine could watch you operate and it could pre-fill all the codes and the surgical steps that you've done uh, into a document that becomes the surgical record or that becomes the billing template to send a, an account to the insurers. So these are just some of the interesting aspects of artificial intelligence that are currently being developed, that are currently available in some instances. And I want to leave you with this question. Um, you know, we are in a similar position as pilots are, um, you know, and when you fly back home after this course and you hear that the computer is flying itself and there's no pilot up front, would you be comfortable with that? The computer can probably do a better job than most pilots. Um, but I think as surgeons, we're in the same boat in that most people would still expect us to be involved in their care rather than just the computer. And long may that concept last. With that, I thank you. Okay, questions for our afternoon speakers. I think we've got Franz on WhatsApp, have we, as well, if anyone's got any questions for him, yes? Um, so, uh, regarding order, my understanding is that LRS is not as forgiving as a hexapod because you have to be very precise with your pin placement to get, get the right correction. So, does it have a steeper learning curve than putting a hexapod and getting your deformities corrected in the first instance? I think I failed then, because um, it's no different. When you apply a hexapod to do acute correction, you have to apply the hexapod with the pins out of the way of the intended trajectory of your implant. It's exactly the same with a rail, so it's no difference. Uh, there's no greater skill. So you all saw in the presentation by Fergal Monsell 
that the pins he applied, or I think it was uh, one of the earlier presentations, the pins had to be applied posteriorly in the femur. It's the same with the hexapod. So there's no difference. Did that answer your question? Did we understand it correctly? Great. Any more questions? So, so one of the questions I actually, uh, uh, friends, I wanted to ask you was that uh, how far are you developing with your um, simulation and uh, can we hold our breath to, for, for a sort of uh, AI learning in the near, near future for limb reconstruction? Good question. We are at a very advanced stage of development of a virtual reality, augmented reality solution, um, which would allow us to simulate limb reconstruction surgery and eventually deploy that preoperative plan in theater. So that should be relatively soon. Um, linking AI into that will take a little bit longer. And other thing is, do you think from the cost point of view, Will it be affordable for the people who need it most, or it will be more related to the, uh, to, to, the, to the rich nations? No, I think one of the big advantages of this type of technology is that it's actually, um, apart from the software, the hardware is actually a very low-tech solution um, in, in the sense that it doesn't take a big capital investment. Um, uh, HoloLens 2, which is the platform that we're building our solution on, uh, is in the region of $3,000. And that is a lot of money, but it is not prohibitive um, in terms of deployment in resource-constrained environments. And one of the beautiful concepts here is that I could wear a headset and I could dial into Jure's headset when he's doing one of his beautiful order procedures, and I can actually see exactly what he's seeing in first person, and I can get wonderful teaching in that first person view. And vice versa, he could dial into my headset when I'm operating in Johannesburg or in Ghana or wherever, and he could guide me through a procedure very accurately. And that part of the technology already exists. Um, and and that, is, that is a game changer. I mean, if we just think of medical education, sorry, I'm passionate, so I'm rambling, but if no, we no, just think carry of medical on, education, um, you know, that is a game changer. And that takes expertise to the place where it's needed most. And if that doesn't make the head on the back of your neck stand up, you shouldn't be in this room. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Any more questions? No, yeah. I certainly think one of the reasons most of us went into deformity correction surgery is because we like new toys. We, we like all the gadgets and extra bits. And uh, yeah, it certainly sounds really exciting time. So if there are no more questions, we'll conclude. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for staying today. I hope it's given you a flavor of how to apply all the principles that you've learned through the week. If you think there was anything that we missed out, anything that we could have put in today that you'd have liked to have known about or we haven't covered, then jot it down and we can think about that for next year. But the hope for this day is it's a day that you can come back to every year as kind of refreshing your principles and reminding you of new things and exciting advances and um, what, different ways of doing things because sometimes we just fall into habits of using what we're familiar with and not trying different things. So, so please do join us in future years for this day at least. But I must also say as faculty, I learn so much on the course every year because there's such great people involved. And it's been one of the real big disappointments for me this year of not being able to be here through the week has been my missed learning opportunities. So I, I hope that you've all um, got all that experience, even if I hadn't. And I'm so pleased it ran so well despite my absence. And I know there was a few other faculty who couldn't stay the course either. So thank you so much to all the faculty for picking up the slack.